Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Education. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time. Please silence all electronic devices. You may send your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We are ready to begin. Okay. Uh, Gavilan this way. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Committee on Education's first remote hearing on the aptly named title, uh, Remote Learning, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on our city schools. This year has turned education and the delivery of education services on its head. Within the span of a few short weeks, more than 1.1 million New York City students went from learning in a classroom each day to learning in their home. Home can mean an apartment, a house, a shelter, hotel, crowded dwelling, or some other accommodation other than a classroom. The impact has been immediate, stark, and strained on an already inequitable system even further. This administration, this council, this Department of Education, and quite frankly, the world have never faced anything like COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, has impacted every single person in the city, uh, but some have been impacted greatly more than others. It has impacted our students, their families, our educators, and our school leaders. While COVID-19 presents great challenges, uh, they are not insurmountable. This pandemic is forcing us to face and address the inequities in our education system. We have a responsibility to ensure that the social emotional support systems that, that this committee has been championing for so long continue. We have a responsibility to ensure that all students have the right uh, technological tools and skills at home to better uh, prepare themselves for the 21st century. We have a responsibility to examine curriculum assessments, class size, and a whole host of other issues to ensure that all students receive an equitable and high quality education. Today, we will hear from the administration on how the provision and delivery of remote learning has been going since March the challenges remote learning has posed, the solutions and lessons learned so remote learning moving forward leaves no student behind. I will be keeping my opening remarks limited uh, to provide space for the most important stakeholders in this pandemic, our students. Let us hear now from the most impacted. Jo Joshua Applewhite is a student at Liberation High School in Coney Island. I will let his words speak for themselves, and I'll ask the council now to play a video that Joshua has produced. I'm going to start. 
all that is really for me. It's not for me. And in general, with school, I always felt like it wasn't for me. Things that I learn and the things that I deal with in that environment just don't resonate. And I cannot be in an old classroom environment in which I felt like a robot. Coming to Liberation was a little different because it was more, it was more of a like a hands-on experience. It was more teachers. It was more energy. It was more people I could relate to. So I got things done a lot quicker, more efficient. But now being back in my own comfort, my own home, doing the work, the same work that I was doing, just without the interactiveness, I feel like a robot. And matter of fact, I feel like this whole situation is handled as if we're robots and we're not humans with different feelings and different circumstances and different situations, inner conflicts, outer conflicts. There's so many outliers and so many different things that will affect the way in which we get this stuff done. And I feel like we're handling an abnormal situation normally, which is not you know, very reasonable or rational. We have students that have gone through all types of different experiences, have live in all types of different environments, live with their own struggles. So to judge every student as if they meet the same criteria and have the same equal opportunity as well as the same life is not fair. There are some students that struggle with family problems. There are some students that aren't being fed enough right now. There are some people, families that are struggling financially. This whole pandemic has affected everybody, yes. But online remote learning is so, the way in which it's being executed is so flawed, especially with the grading system. I'm not saying to go and look at every student and see, because you can't look at every student, it's impossible. There's always gonna be those few students who can't necessarily satisfy everybody, but what I can say is you guys can be more reasonable and be more understanding and take more time to adjust instead of rushing things to try and return things to normal. That's what I feel like needs to be done. Because I feel like there was so much panic in order to get things to restore and to get things back to normal and make people feel as if school never stopped, that there was a lot of error and there was a lot of problems that were caused in the process. And I feel like right now, no one, it's, it's hard when you're stuck in a constant environment of just you in your own house amongst your family. And to be able to still do things and act as if nothing is going wrong when there's a lot going on. See, when it comes to financially, when it comes to certain things, I might not suffer as much as the next person. But that doesn't mean I don't deal with my own stuff. Someone that's suffering financially or doesn't have necessarily a stable environment to work on and work in, that doesn't mean they're suffering the same problems as me. But the, the point is, we both deal with stuff, whether it's internal or external. And to handle this situation of remote learning as if it's all fine and dandy, and that everyone has an op as if everyone has an equal opportunity to get the work done. It's just unfair. Because you can, yes, yeah, say, oh, if the student struggles or if the student doesn't understand the academic perspective of things, confront the teachers. What if it's not an academic problem? And what about the teachers too? You can't just look at the students and put the blame on the students. The teachers struggle with their own stuff too. Some of these teachers have to provide for their family while I was also focusing on the students that they have to focus on at school. There's so many different things that you have to take into account when doing things like this. Because if you're rushing things to try and maintain stability, you're actually doing the opposite and you're causing chaos. This whole situation in itself is already chaotic. We need to be together, we need to come together, and we need to talk and discuss things. We can't be so separate and trying to deal with everything. Because we're only one, we're one kind at the end of the day. We're all human. That's really all I have to say. So yeah.
there needs to be a lot of reformations and fixes within the remote learning things that are going on currently. And I feel like I want to thank uh, Joshua and I want to thank uh, Principal April Young of Liberation High School for sharing that video. And I think actually uh, some of the logistical issues with getting even things uh, sound, uh, sound right just kind of speaks to the whole uh, remote learning system. As a former teacher, I could tell you, you always had to have plan A, plan B, plan C, but this is the world that we're in now. But I think his story speaks volumes. Um, that this is a uh, an abnormal situation for many of our of our students, um, and Joshua explained that very clearly. That uh, many students are experiencing uh, things in very disproportionate ways. There are some kids still battling food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, and so I think we need to enter this hearing and enter this frame with that type of mindset. Um, I want to just acknowledge. Uh, my colleagues who are here, and then we'll hear of an opening statement from our public advocate. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, uh, Council Member Lander, Council Member Barron, Council Member Kalos, Council Member Holden, Council Member Miller, Council Member Ampre Samuel, Council Member Borelli, Council Member Brennan, Council Member Drum, Council Member Gordanchik, Council Member Levine, Council Member Lewis, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Salamanca, and the public advocate. And with that, I will now turn over to the public advocate for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and good morning. As you mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. I'd like to thank Chairman Mark Traeger and the members of the Education Committee for holding this oversight hearing on the impact of coronavirus on New York City's school system. I just want to take a moment to thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the leadership you've shown on this issue and in pushing this administration, even at times when it wasn't politically expedient or necessarily popular. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in doing that. And thank you for starting off this hearing uh, with the people who are most affected. I also wanna thank the educators, social workers, administrators, uh, food service workers who are all still working during this pandemic to ensure our students are getting the fundamental education they need to tomorrow's leaders and providing needed services like food to the greater community. When the mayor mandated for schools to close in March, the Department of Education implemented a remote learning system to ensure students could continue their education. I will be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that that closure came too late uh, after many folks, some on uh, this, uh, call, this hearing uh, pushed. However, uh, this distance learning program has presented great challenges for many of our educators, students, as well as their parents. It has also shed light on the inequities of technology access. The DA, DOE realized, I'm sorry, the DOE failed to realize early on that many students lack the devices necessary to participate in remote learning, something that they probably should have known. And while DOE has tried to fill this technology gap by providing remote learning devices through an online portal, there are still students who are disconnected. My office sent a letter to DOE earlier this month regarding reports of AACS investigations into families who had difficulty obtaining or using remote learning devices. It's my understanding from the response we received that DOE issued guidance instructing school staff to refer cases to ACS as a last resort. The failure to ensure that access of any technology needed for students to proceed with online learning is not necessarily a fault of parents, but this administration we should make every effort to make sure that it was not the fault of the parents before we open any kind of case. No parent should have to fear an ACS investigation simply because they may not have stable internet access, a computer, or any other device. That should be, and still is, very much a responsibility of the DOE to help work out. We need an update of how many cases an ACS has pursued of such families, and what other proactive approaches DOE has sought to ensure parents and students get the resources they need to complete the school year. I also strongly urge the administration to coordinate with the state, which manages the database, to expunge ACS cases that were, openly, were open simply as a result of remote learning 
difficulties. We have to move away from this punitive telling folks to shelter in place uh, when they have no shelter or wear a mask when they have no mask, opening up an ACS investigation when a person may not have access to the things they need to get to remote learning. My office has yet to receive clarity on how the DOE plans to better serve students with disabilities and special needs, as well as multilingual learners. Two weeks ago at the Education Committee, at the Education Committee budget hearing, the Chancellor said the DOE released a guidance on Teach Hub, where teachers and principals can access resources specifically created for teaching students with disabilities and working with MLL students. DOE has not determined if teachers are in fact using those resources nor has the agency incorporated the year-round special education services, which serves nearly 39,000 students into remote learning. Additionally, at last Thursday's public hearing, there were parents who were concerned about the lack of slots for children with special needs and pre-K classes. I look forward to hearing the DOE's plans to incorporate special education services into remote learning and offer accommodations in pre-K classes for children with special needs. As I mentioned during the budget hearing, I'm concerned about the mental well-being of our students educators and caregivers during this time. The city, should, the city should do more to support educators and students and expand professional development to better equip them to address the incorporate and incorporate social morning, social emotional learning remotely. The administration should partner with organizations to expand trauma-informed practices, social workers, mental health counselors, near peer student counselors, and guidance counselors to meet the growing need for community healing. I know the city is facing a public health crisis that has forced drastic changes to be made. Uh, I also want to just commend some, a lot of the work that has been done because I understand this is a Herculean effort uh, and that there is 1 million, 1.1 million students largest in the nation. Uh, but I also want to say that each one of those students have a right to deserve the best education that they have. Uh, and I'm no longer just speaking in theory as my stepdaughter is a member of that 1.1 million in public education. So we cannot sacrifice the education of our children in our effort to protect their physical health and well-being. I look forward to the hearing from the agency today on how they plan to ensure our city students receive a quality education during this pandemic. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you to the public advocate. And now we'll have the committee council uh, acknowledge and swear in our uh, the, the first panel. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I am Malcolm Butehorn, Counsel to the Education Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announce who the next panelist will be. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after the panel has completed their testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. For panelists, you will notice the letter P and the number next to your name. As my email to all of you last night stated, this will let you know what panel you are on and you will be able to see where you are in the queue throughout the hearing. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Dr. Linda Chen, Cheryl Watson Harris, LaShawn Robinson, Adrian Austin, Ursulina Ramirez, Nadia Chada, Emma Woods, and Gabriel Frankel. I will first read the oath. And after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. If you all could please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Chen? Yes. 
First Deputy Chancellor Watson Harris. Yes. Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Yes. Deputy Chancellor Austin. Yes. Ursulina Ramirez. Yes. Nadia Chada. Yes. Emma Woods. Yes. And Gabriel Frankel. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chen. You may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Traeger and all of the members of the Education Committee here today. I am Dr. Linda Chen and I serve as the Chief Academic Officer of the New York City Department of Education. Joining me this morning is Chief Operating Officer Ursulina Ramirez, First Deputy Chancellor Cheryl Watson-Harris, Deputy Chancellor of School Climate and Wellness, LaShawn Robinson, Acting Deputy Chancellor of Community Empowerment Partnerships and Communications, Adrian Austin, and Christina Fodi, Deputy Chief Academic Officer for the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support. Thank you for the opportunity for all of us to discuss the significant work of the DOE in response to the COVID crisis on behalf of the students and families we serve. Before I begin, I would first like to express our gratitude to Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and the entire City Council for all you have done and continue to do on behalf of the New York City schools and our historically underserved students. Your leadership throughout the COVID crisis is a testament to your commuted, committed advocacy on behalf of the city students in partnership with the DOE as we stood up learning at 1800 school communities. Today's testimony will provide a clear picture of the challenges this crisis posed to the DOE along with the accomplishments and new ground we have broken as the largest public school system in the country. My testimony will cover the distribution of internet enabled advices remote learning instruction, policy, and summer planning, the social and emotional support all students receive, and the extensive community engagement that the DOE has and continues to conduct with families, students, elected officials, and advocates throughout the five boroughs. This pandemic has had profound impact on the lives of New Yorkers, the nation, and the world over. Adjusting to this new reality has been arduous, disruptive, and painful, with 77 DOE staff members losing their lives. Our communities will never be the same, and we owe an immense debt to them and all of our staff. We are now more than two months into a health emergency that has changed the way we have been delivering learning since the closure of school buildings on March 16th. We knew from the beginning that the transition to remote learning would be extremely difficult but we are proud of the work we have done to make remote learning a reality across the city for every student. We are incredibly thankful to our staff and families who provided critical feedback, and we are continually working to adapt our practices to meet the needs of our students during these times. This has been a heavy lift, but essential lift across the divisions within the DOE, and we are committed to ensuring the needs of our students are met. First, I'd like to address device distribution. One of the biggest hurdles we are proud to have overcome was the digital divide. We knew that if students could not connect to the internet, remote learning would fail. We estimated needing about 300,000 internet enabled devices. So we contacted several companies to determine which would provide us with the scale of production we needed in order to meet our timeframe. Apple was the only company that could fulfill our requirements. To date, more than 290,000 internet enabled devices have been distributed across the city to students who now have access to remote learning, regardless of their Wi Fi capabilities at home. The Council's long standing and continuous investment in technology for our schools made it possible for the DOE to also distribute 175,000 school based laptops, tablets, and Chromebooks to students at the onset of this crisis. Prioritizing equity, we started distributing centrally purchased internet enabled devices, beginning with our most underserved students. 13,000 students living in shelter, followed by students in foster care, high school students, students with disabilities, and multilingual learners. Principals and teachers continue to work with students and families to ensure that they are aware of available devices and assist them in filling out the device request survey. We were one of the first districts in the entire country to provide remote learning 
and are proud of giving our students the tools they need to successfully participate. Chancellor Carranza has emphasized to students, staff, and families the importance of both flexibility and patience as we navigate this new reality. The shift to remote learning was sudden, but thanks to the incredible resilience of everyone in the DOE, we have continued to adapt our approaches and strengthen our practices while providing training and resources to support the process. At the start, we launched Teach Hub a new remote, remote learning portal for New York City educators. It provides standards aligned instructional resources for all grades in all subject areas, including resources for multilingual learners and students with disabilities, as well as social emotional learning. Those resources are created by DOE central staff, as well as third party vendors who generously donated content for use during this time. All of those resources are free and easily accessible by educators. We also trained thousands of teachers on how to use remote learning technology. We understood the range of experience and familiarity teachers had with this new way of teaching, and we have worked to meet teachers where they are. We also set up remote learning champions, which provides training and guidance on technical and pedagogical aspects of virtual teaching platforms from 150 citywide field-based personnel. During remote learning, teachers have used many approaches to ensure that students are engaged in instruction. With support and guidance from superintendents and principals, our teachers are working more tirelessly than ever on tailoring live teaching, recorded sessions, and other methods to meet the needs of their students. Recognizing that all schools approach remote learning with differing capabilities, DOE staff work to level the playing field by creating a DOE G Suite domain for schools that may not already have had one. This includes a Google Classroom platform for teachers, students, and families to connect remotely. We also have teachers utilizing tools like Zoom, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams to gather with students in real time to deliver instruction. To support teachers, we develop central Google fold folders organized by grade, unit, and day and templates that teachers can modify to customize lessons for their students. Teachers have also used tools like discussion boards to respond to student work and enable students to interact with one another. Our educators have convened office hours for students and their families to discuss the work and provide whatever support students may need. We have also partnered with New York City institutions to offer additional remote learning support. For example, the DOE and the WNET group have partnered on Let's Learn NYC, a new educational public television program featuring lessons for children in grades 3K through second grade. Let's Learn NYC is hosted by DOE instructional leaders and coaches with expertise in teaching young learners. It offers age appropriate curricular content that is aligned to standards and lessons for early childhood education and includes foundational reading skills, literacy, math, and science and social studies. In addition, all students can access tutoring services through one of the three public library systems across the city. Now I'd like to address our work with students with disabilities. This transition has prevented, presented additional challenges for our students with disabilities, including students in District 75. To ensure that their needs are met, schools developed a special education remote learning plan for each student with a disability, which communicates how services outlined in individualized education programs or IEPs will be provided in these new educational settings. Each school has been contacting families to enable them to provide meaningful input in discussing how special education programs and services can be provided. Throughout this time, we have strongly encouraged providing related services, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and counseling through teletherapy where appropriate, recognizing that some students may benefit from other and different approaches. When it is appropriate, students engage with their provider through video so that there is continuity of their services. Our teachers and providers with the support of our paraprofessionals are continuing to adapt and modify materials to ensure they are accessible and tailored to the individual needs of each student. Our IEP teams continue to thoughtfully plan for students who are referred for special education evaluations to ensure that appropriate services can be delivered without delay. 
Now I'd like to move on to discussing our multilingual learners. Similarly, every school created and submitted remote learning plans to ensure that multilingual learners and former English language learners receive targeted instruction in English with appropriate supports in their home language. Our division of multilingual learners has also initiated weekly meetings with advocates, parent leaders, and community partners to collect information and receive input on the remote learning experience for multilingual learners and families on an ongoing basis. In addition, we have been hosting multilingual Mondays on a series of workshops aimed at helping students and families engage in the college search process. As with everything we are doing, we are constantly seeking feedback, reflecting on best practices, and adapting to make sure we are serving our students effectively. Additionally, the DOE has partnered with the Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs to familiarize school staff on programs and services available to immigrant families, leveraging these resources to best support families. I'd like to now turn to wellness for all students. We know that remote learning remains an immense challenge given the stress and trauma facing our students and families during the pandemic. We know also that when students are healthy and feel safe, they are better learners. Ensuring that we have social emotional supports in place to help our students and address the trauma has been a priority since day one of this crisis. And we again thank City Council and especially Chair Traeger for being key partners in this ongoing work of addressing the needs of the whole child. Through our wellness DOE work, we share guidance with schools on how to conduct wellness checks. Principals lead school staff in identifying students who are less engaged to make sure they are contacted and properly supported. We particularly focus on our students in temporary housing and are providing extensive guidance to our Bridging the Gap social workers who continue to provide teletherapy to these students. We also conduct multiple services uh, surveys of these students to gain a comprehensive understanding of their mental health and remote learning needs and challenges. We also continue to focus on social emotional learning, restorative justice, and mental health clinical support. We have created resources to promote SEL practices through remote learning, and we have provided direct clinical supports to students since the day remote learning began. Every school has a crisis team who are all receiving training on how to serve their students and communities during these troubling times. Additionally, we are supporting our LGBTQ students by providing resources and support to them. Gender and Sexuality Alliance or GSA clubs continue to thrive and in fact, teachers are attending trainings at an all time high, recognizing that students need support now more than ever. In turning to family support and community engagement, during this time, we have asked our families to step up in so many new ways, and we are grateful for their patience and resilience. Since starting remote learning, we have proactively engaged with families, offered support lines to respond to their questions, and provided training for families, schools, and community partners. Through Learn at Home on our website, parents can find everything from our latest messages on pertinent issues, to technical tools, to resources on curated learning activities and guides for daily study schedules. At the school and district level, borough offices have conducted translated webinar trainings for parents on topics that include successful remote learning at home, parent-student activism, and mental health and wellness. Parents can contact their schools to ask for technical support as there is a designated staff member responsible for assisting them and for our Tech Ambassadors Program in partnership with New York CARES is sourcing volunteers with, who speak the languages of our families to provide one-to-one -one technical support in their home language. Additionally, all DOE family-facing staff, including parent coordinators and central-based family engagement staff, have been trained in technical assistance to provide support to parents using Google Classroom, Wellness, Meal Hub, and language access resources for families. Earlier this month, we mailed a postcard, English and translated, to all New York City public school households 
to ensure that families are aware of the supports and resources that the DOE is providing during remote learning. We have also been holding weekly briefing calls with elected officials, advocates, and student leaders. The Family and Community Empowerment Team is supporting family leaders with weekly updates, virtual meetings, and training sessions. DOE is actively engaging student voice on remote learning, supports for remote college and career advising, graduation, summer school, and admissions policy. On May 14th, we hosted a live event moderated by students in the discussion with the chancellor and cabinet members in which they asked questions that touched on grading, emotional well-being, and planning for post-COVID schooling. We also created a remote learning survey to collect information from our families and students in grades six through 12 about their remote learning experiences. As of May 22nd, we had over 164,000 family responses and over 125,000 student responses. The survey is still open and we will be using this information to continue to improve upon remote learning. Now I will turn to summer school. As the school year enters its final month, we are focused on ending strong and getting students the support they need to return in the fall on track to succeed. We are going to be providing academic support to approximately 177,000 students with summer learning remotely. Our remote summer learning model offers education and services to students with disabilities while providing academic support and additional time to the students not yet mastering grade level standards. Synchronous or live instruction will be part of a student's day during summer learning. There will also be social emotional components embedded into the day. Our remote learning approach is aimed at keeping our students on track and ready to hit the ground running come September. To conclude, this pandemic has tested our systems and New Yorkers in so many ways, transforming every aspect of what we do to rise to the challenges of this moment has been a testament to the determination of our incredible staff, students, and families. The shift to remote learning has been astounding given the difficult, unforeseen circumstances of this crisis which has shown a spotlight on opportunity gaps we know have existed for decades. Our focus remains on equitably serving our students and striving to close the gaps. We are taking the lessons we learn every day to adapt and improve the delivery of education to the students of New York City. On behalf of my colleagues, I thank you for your time and we will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, I will get uh, right to questions. Um, not only was it a mandate uh, from the governor, but providing access to Rex, uh, firstly, uh, to children of essential workers was the right move as it helped ensure that our first responders and other essential workers can do their jobs during this pandemic. However, the DOE initially said it expected to serve up to 57,000 students at Rex. In subsequent DOE briefings, it was clear that actual numbers being served was far less. With capacity seemingly not an issue, why have Rex not been available to students in temporary housing, especially those in shelters? Uh, thank you, Chair Chager. Uh, this is Ursulina Ramirez, Chief Operating Officer for the DOE. Um, I First and foremost, I want to thank you for grounding us today in the conversation with uh, Joshua leading this. I think that that was great. Um, and really, the student's perspective is at the forefront of our mind. I also want to thank uh, Public Advocate uh, uh, Jumani Williams for, for his uh, insight and his feedback on the process. Um, in terms of your question around the regional enrichment centers, as you noted, uh, our original capacity was in the 50 to 70,000 uh, range. Um, and we subsequently closed handful of our enrichment centers to make sure um, that we were only keeping sites open that had a sufficient amount of students. Um, to your point, yes, we do have additional capacity in these, in these buildings. 
Um, I would say right now the executive order is around essential workers and making sure that we are providing childcare for those essential workers. If and it doesn't really include uh, additional uh, populations. I t we totally understand the concerns around our students in temporary housing and our students in foster care, and that's why we prioritized iPad delivery for those student populations. But as of right now, we are following the executive order that was issued by the governor that allows for essential workers only. Uh, and w would you agree with me that a shelter is no place for any child to meaningfully learn? I would say that I think that it's, I want to make sure our students have a location to learn that is helpful and suitable for them and their families. I think that a lot of our families, in, and not just our students in temporary housing, um, are in, you know, unfortunate circumstances at home and make it really hard to focus. So I, I agree with that statement, that it is difficult to learn in either crowded spaces and or congregate spaces. I do agree with that statement. And has there been any conversation with the governor's office or with the state about allowing children who are in shelters to have access to RECs? We have not had direct conversations, I should say, I have not had direct conversations with the state around this population. Um, we have really focused on the essential workers and making sure as the state is reopening that we have the capacity to serve those uh, new families who might uh, be interested in sending their children to child care to one of our child care centers. All right. Uh, how did the DOE arrive at the number 300,000 for the number of iPads to order? Uh, thank you for that. So this was a projection that we developed uh, with the city's uh, chief technology officer around the digital divide in the city as well as principals. It is not a hard and fast rule that we know that there are 300,000 families that, uh, and students who do not have devices. It was our best, uh, our best guess um, before the pandemic, or I should say before we closed schools. Um, we understand that DOE sent out surveys to families regarding access to technology before schools were closed. Is that true? We did ask our principals to check in with their students to see um, what devices that they had. And so that was the beginning, I would say the beginning phases of us trying to understand the breadth and scope of our need. Um, just to kind of reiterate, so there was that survey that we did with principals to see the devices that were needed prior to closing schools. Then we did a survey for uh, students who needed devices or did not have Wi-Fi. And then subsequently, we had a, a third survey that was around, I would say, the substance of remote learning and how it's working for them um, and how families are engaging with their remote learning. And, and how many responses to the initial survey did you receive, the one that principals gave to their school communities prior to school closure? I do not have that number offhand, and I can get it to you um, as soon as possible. I, I would appreciate that. Um, we'd also like to, to know the, the breakdown of that number by school district as well. Um, and sorry, just to note that, that with that survey, um, what, what principals used that for was to hand out devices at their school level. So prior to us even delivering the 300,000 iPads, um, we handed out 175,000 devices and that was school-based devices based on that survey. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the remote learning uh, surveys that were distributed after the iPads were, were distributed, um, what, what common themes did DOE so far see in the results? How many people took the surveys online? How many called 311 or completed the survey by, by phone? Uh, thank you so much for that question. I'm going to ask uh, our chief academic officer, Linda Chen, to speak more about the remote learning survey that we conducted. Can we unmute Linda? Well, okay. sorry. I'm Thank sorry, you go ahead. Thank you for the question. Was your question regarding the survey for devices? 
Right. Uh, these were the surveys that were distributed after iPads were distributed. Uh, what common themes did DOE see in the results, right? Yes. So um, I, I also want to thank you for the testimony that Joshua opened up with. I think that's so important to put our students at the center. And in terms of our remote learning survey, um, we did quite get quite a bit of a response. And some of the trends are that the students uh, express some of the things that uh, Joshua expressed, the, the, the need and want to be connected. Um, and they also expressed um, the importance of being connected with their teachers um, and families also expressed that importance. We are continuing to improve to make sure that we can take some of the lessons learned from that to create better um, enhancements. Some of what we are doing is to make sure that um, teachers are have greater facility with the technology. I have to say our teachers have done uh, a really Herculean task being able to do and transform all of the way uh, students learn. And that in-home and connection is hugely important in addition to access to academic opportunities within remote learning. Uh, Dr. Chen, how many uh, teachers took part in the in-person remote learning uh, PD, uh, which was immediately during when the mayor announced that schools would close, teachers had to come in that week for PD. How many teachers actually came in and received the in-person PD? Um, I, we can try to get numbers to you, but we know that it's in the realm of thousands of teachers. What we did was during that following week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, teachers came in. We had communicated with principals prior to that and getting a sense of the types of needs that they had, uh, whether schools already had an online platform and what resources they had. And then we developed modules and units for schools to use based on their particular needs. I want to really acknowledge uh, the work of our school leaders who acted very quickly to be able to make sure um, that they would be able to select the types of training that their students, uh, their teachers needed. I would also like to say, in addition to those three days, our principals and school leaders have been working with teachers to provide additional just-in-time supports for teachers as well. So can you just be clear, uh, for those teachers, well, for first, I'd like to know the number of how many did, did were able to, to come in. Uh, understanding the gravity of the situation would be helpful to know because it leads me to my next question. Those that were not able to come in in person, um, what kind of training did they receive? They, uh, the, the modules were online. So part of the training was being able to help teachers access these modules uh, online. So if a teacher was not able to physically come in, that material and the information was still available to them. And Dr. Chen, would you agree that from your years of experience in schools that there is a significant number of educators who need support and how to use technology in the first place? I think, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chair. Uh, and as a former teacher, I, it's very astute to ask that question. I think that what we have really understood and experienced during this, this period is the variety and the, the variation to which um, we have capacities. And as, as you know well, with professional learning more than ever, the need for differentiation is huge. And so um, our school leaders have done an amazing job trying to make sure they themselves have a varied experiences and expertise and their teachers have, and they have really um, stepped up to the plate to learn. Uh, we also have trained our, um, we've repurposed about 150 staff in the field offices to be these remote learning champions. So they are also connecting directly with schools and school leaders to make sure that they get the differentiated supports they need in terms of technology support and instructional pedagogical support with this new environment. I, I, am, I just wanna note that I am concerned that uh, a number of educators still need a lot of support on how to uh, make all of this work as 
as we as we know that they're also dealing with enormous challenges and loss and pain in their own families and their own personal lives. Um, I, I speak to many of them still to this day. They want to be able to better support their students. And I do commend educators for uh, you know, doing extraordinary work. I, I, I noted in previous uh, commentary that it would take me summer to plan ahead for the school year ahead. And educators really put together something in a matter of a week or two uh, in, in this unprecedented time. But I, I would just like to just make sure that we are providing all the support that we can to help them cope with this uh, because some of the concerns that w w which we've heard about, which we'll get to is the number of teachers who are providing live instruction versus not live instruction. I just wanna point out to folks that there are some educators that just really need help with this entire setting um, who also uh, are facing challenges in their own home setting too. Some of them are primary caretakers for, for sick loved ones. And so uh, it will be helpful for us to know uh, the full scope of support op options and services we have for our teachers. Chair, Chair, can I just add in one thing yeah, there um, to add to Linda's comment? So uh, in terms of the modules that we uh, did that week of 316, um, we know that roughly 39,000 teachers engaged with those models. Um, in addition to that, and I just want to note, and we have the first deputy chancellor, Cheryl Watson Harris here, all of our, our field support offices are prepared to support teachers and obviously our IT team uh, on the technical side. And, and if you know of any teachers, please let us know, or, or schools that are struggling on the technical side, we can definitely provide them supports. I'm gonna actually ask if First Deputy Chancellor Cheryl Watson-Harris wants to add anything um, on what the, the borough team is doing to support schools right now. Yes, thank you so much, Ursulina, and, and thank you, Chair Traeger, uh, for the opportunity to be in community with you today. Um, thank you, I just echo my colleagues' um, sentiments uh, around having Joshua uh, enter our space today and, and really center the conversation. Um, as you know, I have two children in the school system um, and also uh, responding to this crisis as the first deputy chancellor, but also as a, a mother. Um, so I, I sincerely appreciate um, having Joshua's voice. Um, as you know, this uh, crisis has really put a spotlight on um, the opportunity gap, um, and we remain uh, laser-like focused on supporting our CSI, uh, uh, our PSI schools, our CSI schools, as well as our receivership schools um, and our Bronx Plan schools. Um, and in partnership with our executive superintendents and superintendents, we are monitoring uh, the daily practices uh, throughout all schools and ensuring that the borough center offices are providing the right and targeted support. Um, as you know, one of the things that uh, I do and, and our chancellor believes this uh, and, and teaches us that uh, a chancellor in the field um, is, uh, or a chancellor uh, in the field is worth uh, two, I, I'm getting the expression wrong, but basically that we should be out um, in the field. Um, and one of our practices is really around field day. Um, and today I actually uh, was in, spent the morning in, in Queens North, um, visiting classrooms alongside uh, our superintendents in Queens North, as well as our executive superintendents and debriefing with principals um, and the borough center offices around the right and targeted supports uh, needed. So again, in addition to the 39,000 um, teachers who participated in that initial training, that was just to get us started. Um, we know that we have to provide ongoing support uh, to teachers and principals um, as we continue to learn more and do more um, for our students. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor. Um, I'd like to learn, uh, can the DOE please provide us a breakdown by district and school of student attendance, uh, which on the May 4th elected officials briefing call, DOE shared average 85 to 88% on any given day. Um, and where is this information uh, posted publicly? Uh, we'd like to know a, a, a district and uh, uh, breakdown, school breakdown. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so as you know, and as you noted, we've, we, our engagement rate is roughly 86% in comparison to uh, in-person schooling is roughly around 93%. So we're still seeing a fairly high engagement rate. 
Um, to go through the specifics, I'm actually going to hand this off to um, my colleague, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, who's going to talk through um, kind of what makes up the engagement policy and some of the numbers that you're requesting. Thank you so much, Ursulina. Um, it's a pleasure to be before council today. Um, thank you, Chair Traeger. Um, also to our public advocate, Williams, and especially to our scholar, Joshua, who opened us up um, today. Um, I know Liberation Diploma Plus well. Um, it's a transfer school. I'm a former transfer school principal and also served as transfer school superintendent. Um, so um, Joshua, I hope that you are listening. Um, you know, we think about you and your needs and the needs of your school community as we engage in this work. Um, an important part of engaging in this work as we transitioned um, to remote learning was ensuring that we maintain contact with our students um, and our families in a very structured manner. Um, as you all know, we transition quickly um, to remote learning. And um, in that transition, we also had to transition to new systems to support the work. So the attendance system that we utilized um, during the school year um, was the ATS system or automate the schools. Um, the transition to remote learning um, made us really have to change and build an entirely new system through STARS Classroom. Um, the goals of monitoring student interaction um, during remote learning is to, as I shared, maintain daily contact um, with students and families, but also to have a mechanism in place to monitor student um, general well-being to ensure that you know, we are delivering the right supports at the right time for the right children. Um, and we took that framing and built out the system through STARS Classroom. Um, monitoring interaction um, or to account for attendance can be defined as um, student submission of an assignment um, is an example, um, student completion of an online assessment, um, student participation in an online forum like a chat or a discussion thread, um, a family initiated communication like an email or a phone call for our younger learners, especially our learners in um, pre-K, kindergarten, first grade. A lot of that interaction may happen between a family member and the teacher. So we also accounted for that as well. When we first shifted and uh, started with remote learning and utilizing STARS Classroom, our initial um, attendance was roughly about uh, a little over 84%. We continued to make steady gains over time. As was shared, um, our most recent um, percentage is about 88.5%. So we are making gains, um, we're making meaningful contacts with our young people, um, utilizing um, the mechanism through the STARS classroom and ensuring that we are providing real supports in real time. Um, Chair Traeger, we can certainly provide um, a district uh, breakdown for you um, as soon as possible at following this hearing. Deputy Chancellor, I, I would appreciate that data, and, and I would, uh, that's very important. And does anyone uh, from the panel have uh, the number? How many students have never logged on once uh, since uh, March 16th? How many students in our school system have never logged on once? So I'm going to ask, um, first and foremost, I'm going to ask Deputy Chancellor uh, LaShawn Robinson to start that, and then I and also Deputy Chancellor Cheryl Watson Harris, because I would say that all of our schools are making contact um, or trying to make contact with students every single day. Um, and and as as uh, LaShawn mentioned, uh, doing a heroic effort to make sure that students are engaged. LaShawn, do you want to uh, add anything there? And then Cheryl. Absolutely. Um, First, I'd like to um, share that the quick transition to remote learning um, took into account that we had to be flexible 
to meet the um, needs of various school communities and schools who selected various modalities for remote learning. So we have some schools that, you know, transition to um, virtual platforms um, such as Google Classrooms, while we have some schools that continue to provide um, instructional materials and utilize um, telephone contacts as the primary means of communication um, with families and with students. So I um, don't want to speak to um, never logging on once because we have some schools that did not transition um, in that manner um, virtually. So we knew that we would have schools in various places along the continuum, all seeking to meet the needs of um, their learners in different ways. So we embraced um, patience and flexibility during this process, um, fully recognizing that, you know, the task that we were asking um, our teachers and school leaders to engage in was really a Herculean task. And um, I just want to make that distinction about logging on. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll clarify. So recently I was at a food distribution uh, in my district and in NYCHA development and a service provider shared with me that uh, she noticing that a significant number of, of immigrant families are coming to her asking for help and assistance in obtaining uh, a device but they are fearful of filling out the survey and filling out the request form, forgive me, uh, because they don't want the, any information on that form to compromise or hurt their immigration status. And I could tell you as a former teacher, I remember this occurring with the learning surveys when many families were nervous about returning those forms. So when I speak about students not being able to log on, these are, the ki these are kids uh, historically really kind of marginalized, vulnerable for many reasons um, that would like to learn and participate, but the process to get the device was a problem and it remains a problem. And it is now nearing the end of May and they have not received a device and they have not logged on. Um, and so have you heard of these types of situations and how are we reaching those students that did not submit a request form? Yes. Um, as I was with you before, uh, Chair Traeger, uh, we have uh, encouraged all principals to do wellness calls to 100% of their students. Um, and this is something that we've been doing on a regular basis. In addition to that, individual superintendents supported by their executive superintendents and borough center offices have put in place additional outreach strategies. And I could just lift up some specific examples. Um, in uh, PS 134 in, in District 1, uh, under the leadership of, of Carrie Chang um, and Principal Perales, uh, during the first week of remote learning, 35 uh, families had requested a device. Um, after uh, five weeks, we had a total of 114 families that had requested a device that didn't do it initially. But as a result of the outreach and the calls to the families, um, they submitted uh, the devices. Uh, just another quick example um, in District 2. Um, at the start of uh, this uh, remote learning, uh, the school um, uh, the school 033 had distributed 25% um, of the devices that they had at schools, uh, eventually in, uh, leading up to 100% of the school-based devices. Um, to date, that, that left about only 75% um, of the students still without a device. Um, as of today, we have all but one student um, has a device uh, in hand, and we're working very hard to secure um, an additional device for that student. The last thing I would like to say in terms of our students, uh, our vulnerable populations, uh, specifically students um, in temporary housing, we have schools doing innovative things like uh, something I was able to uh, share in and be a part of today called uh, the Lions Zen, where we have uh, teachers, bilingual teachers that are creating uh, online uh, communities for parents that are in um, uh, shelters to work on their own personal 
social emotional health um, and uh, equip parents to uh, best meet the needs of their students. So we have a citywide strategy um, and then each executive superintendent with their borough center office is also pushing in to support individual schools with additional outreach efforts. And this is a daily act to ensure that all students have both the devices, um, supplemental materials. Today we talked and un uncovered a group of students that didn't have calculators that we wanted to get in hand um, so that they could better engage with their mathematics um, as well as the social emotional um, supports for both students and families. And Deputy Chancellor, just to be clear, is there anything in the state order that prohibits children in temporary housing from being admitted into the RECs? Is there anything that legally prohibits the DOE from allowing them to have access to RECs if families are requesting that? I mean, if there is a student who is in shelter, um, whose family is an essential worker, they have access to the enrichment centers as of right now. But if their parent is not an, uh, an essential worker, you're saying that the state prohibits access for them? Um, I. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a social worker, so I won't, I won't uh, ponder what the law says and I'll confirm with our lawyers later, but our understanding is that, uh, that the executive order is solely for essential workers um, and, and that's it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a lawyer either, so I, I will start off by saying that, but I, I am not, I don't think it prohibits, uh, I don't think it prohibits children in temporary housing and I'd like to follow up with the DUE. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, further on that. How many wellness calls have been made uh, to students? Do we have that data? T total number of wellness calls made. So as Deputy Chancellor uh, Cheryl Watson-Harris just said, she th that all schools were required to do wellness calls. Um, and so, and that was at, the, at her instruction to really make sure that students are both engaging in remote learning, but just to make sure that they're okay. As you, you know, as Joshua said, this is incredibly difficult time for our students and for our families um, and so it was really important that we were not just checking in on students to say are you doing your work but are you doing okay emotionally I mean, we know that our students have had family members who uh, who have passed um, and, and staff members so um, we would say all of our students or I should say all of our schools have been are told to have wellness checks so Selena, I, I, we were just getting some uh, additional information and yep. it's our understanding in the council, and the committee council, who is a lawyer, yes. <laughs> uh, his, inter his interpretation, which I value very much, is that the state executive order does not prohibit the DOE from adding uh, children in temporary housing to have access to rec sites. They set the floor, they don't set the ceiling. So it's, with, it's within the city's discretion. And since you acknowledge that there is capacity and room uh, at these rec sites, is this something that the DOE can reconsider? I will definitely take this up with our health officials. I mean, I, I love the the live legal updates um, from your, from your team. I appreciate that. Um, I do want to consult with the Department of Health. You know, I and as as I mentioned before, uh, Chairman, I want to make sure that we're serving our media students um, in person if that is possible. It is, I think, the interest of the entire agency to make sure. Um, that our students have access and somewhere safe to be. I think the, the conundrum I would say that we've been in um, is making the choices of who gets to be in person, if that is the, if that is the case that some sets of students can be, um, and who needs it most. Um, and so I think that that's just something, while I agree that students in temporary housing do need it, I would also, we've also been asked by advocates and by parents directly, what about my student who has a severe disability? What about my, uh, my multilingual learner who really uh, values in-person learning? So I think that that's just, as you know, we're just grappling with all of these various needs and trying to make a decision on what is best for students and also what is the safest for students. So I will confer with our lawyers and our Department of Health to see what they think, but I appreciate, I appreciate the, the, your legal team and their guidance. I, I, I appreciate that and we'll definitely follow up further. And just to be clear, I, I heard that the expectation is that every school conducts uh, wellness calls. Correct. Uh, are, are you saying that the DOE is not actually tracking how many calls have been made? Um, and I will, I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Chancellor Cheryl Watson-Harris to talk about uh, th this work, but I would say that the superintendents and the executive superintendents um, are engaging with principals directly on this. Mm -hmm. um, if, are you asking if there is a direct tally of, of every single engagement? I would say that at the system level, that's why we have 
our engagement tracker, and that's what LaShawn was referring to earlier with the 86% engagement. Um, Cheryl, do you want to add anything there? I think that you really hit on it, um, Ursulina. Um, just a reminder that that is the work of the executive superintendents. That is our school uh, support and supervision structure. Um, the executive superintendents and superintendents are monitoring those calls. Um, uh, and, and that is their responsibility. But as we visit schools virtually, um, and that's still our work, we're in schools every day in classrooms, um, meeting with principals. Um, last week, I, I visited uh, schools on Staten Island uh, and had the opportunity to sit uh, virtually with uh, Principal Christine Zapata. Um, and she showed me her tracker, how she's monitoring that, how um, they're reaching out, as our COO said, to check on the wellness of both the students and the families um, with notations of specifically how they need to follow up with the family um, to address uh, any issues that they have. So I do not have a tally centrally. Uh, that is the role of the executive superintendent and superintendent to monitor um, and ensure that that work is happening. And we are seeing evidence of that during our field visits. So Deputy Chancellor, and I, and I appreciate that feedback. I, I, as we've noted in previous calls that we've had, there were cases where some uh, a school did not conduct wellness calls until early May. Um, and uh, I, I am just asking the DOE, is it, is, it is it possible that we have students in our system that have not logged on once since March 16th and have not received one wellness call from our school system since March 16th? Is that entirely possible? I think that it is possible that there have been students who have not uh, logged on. I would also say that it is impossible that somebody has not reached out to them. We have an entire structure that is around supporting students. And I know that our principals, um, if there is a student who's not logging on, that that is their, that's their probably their main concern to understand what's happening with those students. So I trust the, our principals that are doing that and I trust that our teachers are doing that. And I would also say we've got social workers, guidance counselors, parent coordinators, and a whole host of people who are engaging with families. Um, so I do believe that there, there are definitely efforts uh, made by family or by our, the, the staff to contact families. Um, and I'm sure that there are some students who have not uh, logged on. Well, just to point out to you, the immigrant families I was speaking about earlier about that went to a nonprofit service provider, they went to a community-based organization. What they shared with the provider was that they actually did not get contacted and they went to the CBO um, to get help and assistance to see if they can get a device. So I'm just concerned about those kids in those school communities that have, are, you know, historically have been very vulnerable and marginalized. And right now, uh, they're just not being seen. They're just not being heard. Um, and so I would appreciate a, 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 an overall tally of how many connections we've made with families and have it by a school district uh, breakdown as well uh, to make sure that those who are certainly hardest hit are, are, are getting the type of access and, and outreach and support which, which they need, which leads me to my next question. Does the DOE have data on how many students in our school system are receiving live instruction? So I would say that live instruction is, I, I will say first and foremost that, you know, when we, when we started this on March 25th, um, it was a matter of, you know, getting our, our system up and running and making sure that our teachers, you know, had uh, professional development to do this kind of work. And I'll have Linda talk uh, in more detail, but I think it's been an ongoing effort to make sure that we are having live instruction for our students. Um, we've heard direct feedback from both families um, and educators themselves around, around this work. So Linda, do you want us to talk to that in more detail? Sure. Uh, well, we don't have uh, exact data in terms of how many students are receiving it for how long um, those aspects uh, chair. I think I uh, appreciate the question. It's an important one, especially given uh, the comments that Joshua made, uh, the, the, the human connection when we're in such isolation um, is so incredibly important. And um, just like if we were in a physical environment, teachers are doing things um, that, that are similar to the physical environment. Uh, there are, um, I was able to visit a classroom one day and the teacher who was very new to all of this 
So I think this gets to the important question you raised earlier about just the technical capacity. This teacher had never done any Google anything. And this was a month ago. She actually posts a morning video to welcome her first graders every morning. And so she does that real live time as well. So it went from being able to learn how to record and post to also being able to do it live. And so uh, that there's those kinds of things, just like we would have a morning meeting in a classroom, there's a greeting for that. Uh, teachers are also able to um, work with students in smaller groups uh, and arranging sort of coordinating schedules with families so that they are available during certain times and to be able to differentiate. I think also feedback that we've been getting is also students enjoy not only the interaction with the teacher, but also with each other. And so if you think about the capacity of technological skills, um, it goes from anywhere from having a whole group class where I really appreciated a, a, a story that was shared with me from a, 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 a teacher, which was, you know, they learned how to unmute everybody. And that just made a world of difference now in terms of the classroom management and the sort of the virtual state. Now, Dr. Chen, this is an issue to me, I think that speaks to, to inequity in our system and I'll explain. You, uh, we, heard, we heard before from the DOE that uh, before many students received their tablets because there were shipment delays and issues with, with Apple and FedEx and UPS, uh, those schools that had technology available in their school buildings immediately distributed that technology to, to their students, is that correct? Chair, yes. Uh, teach, the principals mobilized very quickly to look at what was available so that students would have, would have devices right away. So, now, and, and, and that is not the case for every school community, because not every school community has all the laptops and tablets to immediately distribute to, to kids. So there are certain school communities and school, uh, you know, in certain areas of New York City that were more familiar with this technology, were more familiar with, uh, you know, remote learning than you know, communities that do not have you know, multi-million dollar you know, PTA or private fundraising sources that could supplement technology and supplement uh, you know, all these uh, apps and Zoom and Google Meet. Um, and that's why I know that because when this was kind of all starting, there were certain folks that were very angry about the DOE not letting them use Zoom and that caused a whole stir within some communities. And in Coney Island, we were trying to make sure kids still had access to laptops and technology. And, and, and that was the case in many of my colleagues' districts in the South Bronx and Central Brooklyn and other parts of the city where the stories were, where is my tablet, as opposed to why can't I use Zoom? So some, some communities have had a head start on remote learning. Some communities, and what that means is that they're, they, they might be more able to receive live instruction than those communities that still need to adjust to just getting a tablet and knowing how to use it and making sure teachers are getting the adequate support. Um, and so I, I really think that this is an issue that just speaks to kind of built in inequities already uh, within the school, uh, school uh, system because certain communities were already working on remote learning before the pandemic whilst, while many others are just learning on the fly. But I would like to get that number of how many uh, kids are getting live instruction and a, a breakdown by school district. Where is that happening? Where is it not happening? Just uh, to move on because interest of time for my colleagues as well. How many social worker connections have been made with students? Uh, I know the DOE uh, has, uh, you know, uh, social workers, both school-based and central. Just curious to know the number of social worker, can, and that can be whether it, it could be an, an email, it could be a phone call, it could be a, a virtual uh, teletherapy. How many connections uh, have social workers made with students in our, in our system? Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson to speak to that. Thank you so much for um, that question, Chair Traeger. And I would first like to um, thank the council for um, providing us with the supports to increase the number of um, social workers that we have our school system. This, of course, was um, done pre-COVID, but it really um, positioned us to be able to provide critical support 
um, during this important time. So we've been able to increase the number of school response clinicians, high need social workers, bridging the gap um, social workers. And at this point, um, virtually all schools have access to a guidance counselor or social worker. We shared this information in our most recent um, council report. Um, social workers have transitioned also through remote learning. Um, they're providing um, teletherapy, uh, virtual care. They're also participating um, in wellness checks, especially our Bridging the, the Gap social workers. Um, and they've been on hand um, as, you know, staff members in schools that have been able to reach out to students and families um, for our uh, wellness checks with our students and temporary housing. Um, we've been tracking the Bridging the Gap um, social worker interactions with our young people. Um, the last... Uh, count for our students in shelter. Um, this was about a week and a half or two weeks ago, was over 14,000 um, connections with our Bridging the Gap social workers and our um, staff members that support our students in shelter. We can certainly um, provide you with an updated um, number uh, post this hearing, of course. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor. And I would definitely appreciate, you know, and I appreciate your focus on children and temporary housing and uh, would like an overall broader picture of how many overall connections uh, our, our schools uh, have made using their counselors, social workers. I think it would be very helpful for us to have a broader picture. Um, last uh, final questions, then turning over to my colleagues for, for their questions. Um, uh, summer school programming, if, if, if a student has fallen behind uh, because no fault of their own, because of uh, this pandemic and their, the challenges in adapting to this remote setting, how will support be different and better uh, in summer? And particularly, I think about students in District 75, uh, children um, who, who require school services 12 months of the year I think about students with IEPs that certain services right now cannot be met because of the pandemic. How will summer be different for those kids who are falling behind no fault of, of their own? Uh, thanks, Chair uh, Traeger. Um, I'll start and then I'll have Linda uh, add in. So we are increasing our capacity for summer programs this year to, to accommodate 177,000 students. Uh, 27,000 of that being uh, students with 12-month IEPs. Um, we recognize that it was, uh, it's was it been a very challenging semester for our students. And I would also say we've learned a lot of lessons in remote learning for this semester. Um, and I think that we're taking those lessons learned and trying to adjust for the summer to make sure that it is um, something that is engaging for our students and also for our staff. So I'm going to hand it over to Linda to talk in more detail about how we're going to engage our families and students uh, to make sure that they're ready to move on to the next grade. Thank you for that question, Chair Traeger. Uh, as, as Ursula said, um, we have learned a lot of lessons so far from the last couple of months. So the summer experience, we plan exactly for that. How will it be different when the mode is still remote? So um, we worked with our labor partners and we looked very closely at uh, curricular programs that were available, uh, especially through a learning management system. And so uh, the vast majority of our students will be able to engage in this learning management system so that um, it will provide um, uh, the ability to push out the same content and curriculum, but also be able to um, uh, be, we also be able to track the kinds of things that you're asking so that we know um, what parts of the system the students are using and it's much more responsive and robust. And we will have training specifically for teachers around how to deliver uh, live instruction. And we are working on that particularly, and I'm glad you asked for our students with 12 month IEPs because they will need more and differentiated types of uh, live instruction. Just because I, I don't know if I heard a full answer earlier from Ursulina. We heard, uh, and forgive me if, if it wasn't clear, uh, I, I heard the number of 177,000 students planned uh, are planning to receive services in the summer. 
Um, how many social workers are budgeted to work in the summer? I have to get back to you on the number budgeted for social workers in particular. I know that we are budgeting for roughly 6,000 teachers. Um, so I'll get back to you right away on that. But we are hiring social workers as we speak um, for the summer. And I'm sorry, as a reminder, hiring meaning that they would get per session work throughout the summer. But I'll get back to you on the numbers on, on social workers. I, I would appreciate that number, Ursulina. And, you know, just to kind of remind the DOE that according to research, uh, the adequate ratio for social worker students is one social worker for every 250 students. I think that's already universally understood. Um, if, we're, if we're having 177,000 students, many of which need added support, um, it makes the ratio that much more important uh, to make sure that that support is reaching the, these kids and these students. So I really believe that, you know, the, the biggest challenge a school system is facing, in addition to obviously the health and well-being of our kids and our staff, is how do you help kids catch up? How do you make up for the, uh, you know, months of lost instruction, which they'll never get back? How do you help kids find baseline, even though for many kids, baseline was still inadequate, because they were shortchanged before the pandemic. So I think that this is where we really need to press the mayor's office and the administration to double down on more support for social workers, counselors, school psychologists, more than ever uh, for, for, for this summer. Uh, I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, my uh, colleagues for, for, for their questions and I'll turn to, to uh, the committee council to begin to call them up. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions and answers to three minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. We will be calling on the first few will be council member Lander, Barron and Kalos. We'll start with council member Lander. Council member, your time will start now. Thank you very much. And I want to start, first of all, I, I want to just join the chair and everyone else in like appreciation for what our teachers are doing, what our students are doing, what our families are doing, uh, and what all of you are doing. Like this is impossibly hard. Um, and I know all of you really care about it and the questions we ask about how to make sure we're doing it as well as we possibly can and paying attention to issues of, of equity are, are motivated by a goal that I know is, is shared. Um, so um, following on the set of questions that the, that the Chair Traeger was asking at the end, I want to ask, I mean, around these issues of social and emotional supports, um, which I think we're always behind on, um, but now are even more necessary because like every one of us is disordered right now, like the level of trauma is just through the roof. Um, and then so much more difficult to deliver. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you are tracking it how you are making sure schools are doing their best to deliver it? Like what information are you collecting to keep an eye on whether schools are doing it to levels of your satisfaction? And what are you reporting to us? And what do you think you should be reporting to us so we can do our job of making sure that the system as a whole is showing up for our students' social and emotional needs at this, at this moment? Thank you, Council Member Lander. And I appreciate your comment. I do think that, um, you know, as you noted, I think we're all, you know, learning as we go here to a certain degree and understanding the traumas our students are facing and our staff are facing and how to kind of adjust ourselves and our work to that. And I do appreciate, you know, you all holding us accountable to serve the students because that's what we're here to do. Um, I'm going to actually hand it over to my colleague, LaShawn Robinson, who oversees this portfolio and can talk in more depth about what we're doing around social emotional learning. All right. And just because I'm going to make the clock's going to run out while you're oh, yeah. Answer. I'm going <laughs> to add slightly to that question because yeah. I, really, yeah. I guess two things. One, I, I don't want to hear another here's what we're doing because uh, you said what you're doing and I appreciate that. Yeah. So I, it's not that I don't think you're doing it. I want to know how are you measuring it? Yep. What, what are you looking at that helps you evaluate it? And what are you giving us or what might you commit to give us so we can evaluate it? Because it's good stuff you're doing, but we need the ability to look at where it's being provided, see where it's not being provided um, and follow up with resources. And I guess if you could just include in that answer the work with the contracted restorative justice groups as well as, because I asked the chancellor about this and he said, yes, we're continuing it, but but we don't know where to look to really see it. And, and we need to, get enough information to be able to drill down. 
So I'll stop there yep. um, and just take your answer. Thank you, LaShawn. Yes, thank you so much for that very important question. Um, I had the um, responsibility of serving as a school principal in a transfer high school. I'm also a former social worker. So Time when I think fun. about um, having an opportunity to um, come to the work with both of those lenses, I often think about um, my own school social worker and how we um, work to provide clinical support for students to ensure their overall general um, well-being and success in school and working with them on the ability to meet their goals. So it's a very individualized plan when you're working with a young person as a clinician. Um, sometimes their goals can be related to um, overcoming um, some type of trauma. Sometimes the goal is related to getting back on track um, academically. So clinicians um, you know, work with young people to establish and meet those goals. Through the school response clinicians um, that were provided through support with Thrive and the Safe Resilient NYC package where we were able to bolster supports um, through um, you know, a lot of what was afforded to us by council. Thank you so much for um, your continued support. We have started um, this school year uh, tracking metrics um, I have actually some of the metrics that we um, utilize for our school response clinicians. We continue to collect um, this kind of data even during um, COVID. So we can certainly share that data, but we track um, data such as um, unique students served by our school response clinicians. Um, we also track um, response time. So how soon um, do we have our school response clinicians um, responding on going support? So is this um, something that's going to require ongoing clinical care? That's data um, that we collect. So we have um, metrics that we utilize and I would be happy to share those updated metrics um, with council. We'd be eager to get them. So I know- Absolutely. Well, so thank you. Absolutely. Can I also add a note, um, and this somewhat gets to your point, uh, Councilmember Lander, but also to Chair Traeger's question earlier, which is um, we are hiring roughly uh, 2,800 social workers in the summer. Um, so that's about a one to six three three ratio. And, you know, that is a metric that we're using to, to Chair Traeger's point. We understand that uh, caseloads are very large on a, in a normal uh, school setting. So making sure that we are uh, be, we're able to support our students during the summer is really important. So I just wanted to make sure I got that number to both of you. Thank you very much. And um, I hope to be around when Marlon and William and the unscreened school students uh, testify to support their advocacy. But if, I, if I'm if i not, please know that, I, <laughs> that you have my support. All right, thank you, Chair. Sure, and, and before we turn it over uh, to uh, colleagues, uh, I wanna just make one clear clarification for folks that when we talk about school buildings being closed, technically over 440 are, are still open. This past Memorial Day, when many folks were able to uh, be home, uh, our extraordinary school food workers, our school cleaners, school safety, crossing guards, uh, were all working, uh, providing vital life and death food, meals and assistance, masks and support. Uh, to our families in need. So I just want to give an extraordinary heartfelt thank you and acknowledgement for our amazing school staff that are still working, putting their lives on the line for, for our city and for New Yorkers. So I just want to acknowledge that. We were also uh, joined by, I just want to acknowledge them, that uh, their presence, uh, council members, uh, Ulrich, Yeager, and Powers. And with that, I'll turn to the community council to call on the next member for their questions. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Barron, followed by Council Members Kalos, Holden, and Miller. Councilmember Barron. Councilmember, your time will start now. Thank you. I want to thank the chair and I want to thank the panel for being here. And I also want to add my comments of thanks to all of the school personnel who are working so tirelessly to uh, help to educate our children during this very trying time. Uh, we know that the COVID virus has exposed a lot of the institutional racism and inequity that exists in our system. 
Uh, people are saying, oh, we're all in the same storm, the same boat, but we don't all have the same kind of boat. Some of us are in ocean liners and some of us are in rowboats. And we want to be sure that when this crisis comes to an end, whatever that is, that we don't go back to the same ports that we were in when we got in our boats to come to an end. So this is an opportunity now for the Department of Education to take some drastic moves to make sure that black and brown communities are, are not sent back to the same level of underfunding and understaffing and under equipment that we had at the beginning. So I have a couple of questions. First of all, I'm very troubled to know that you don't have an exact number of children who have not yet received the device. That's very troubling to me because we know that every child count, we can't have one child fall between a crack. So that's very troubling that you don't have an exact number as to how many children still don't have their own individual device, because I've been told that other children were sharing. So that's very troubling. And I also want to know how you are explaining to parents the partnership that you referenced with, uh, I think it was WNET and with libraries. And additionally, I want to, I'm sorry, additionally, I want to know in terms of planning for the reopening of schools in September, how are you justifying going forward with co-locations of charter schools, which are going to take space from the existing schools where we now know children have to be at least six feet apart. And we are talking about, well, in order to get the space, we may have to go to a staggered instructional day. I don't understand how you can justify moving forward with that plan of bringing in new co-locations for charter schools. I also wanna ask you, have you gotten any numbers about any increases in teacher retirement, which would again impact on the ratio of teacher to student classroom size and um, how are we going to make sure that we have ongoing, is there a requirement for, for, for professional development on an ongoing basis that teachers have to participate in? And is the Department of Education gonna to fight to continue to have college access for all because it's my belief that all children are entitled to free education from 3K through post-secondary education for at least two years. So that's a lot of questions. I hope Time's you get down. Thank you. That was a lot of questions that I'm going to try to see if I or try to jot them down. Um, and I Thank apologize you. if I forgot any of them. So really quickly on college access for all, um, I do you know note that we did uh, receive a budget cut when it comes to college access for all doesn't mean the entire budget was depleted. We still have an anticipation that we should be supporting uh, that program and elements of it. So I just want to note that uh, for the record. Um, in terms of PD, it is 100% our, 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 both our vision and what we do in the normal school year is to provide uh, ongoing professional development. And we will be, you know, more, more of that is forthcoming. We're uh, thinking through both of our PD planning for the summer, but also for the end of this school year, thinking about next school year. Um, to your question around devices. So I, I will say this, uh, Council Member Barron, uh, this, this COVID-19, there were inequities before COVID-19 to your yeah. point. Right. And they, this has highlighted it in even, even more so, in, uh, especially within uh, black and brown communities. Right. And I think we are all aware of that and working every single day to address it. Um, in terms of devices, every single principal has a list of the, their students and has an understanding if that student has a device or not. We are working through that list. And from my understanding, we have delivered, or I should say we have shipped out over 300,000 devices to date, in addition to the 175,000 devices that went out before we handed out iPads. Obviously devices break. We learn about new issues coming up every single day. We are working urgently to get those kids devices. If you know of somebody who does not have a device, we need to know that right away. Um, because we're working at rapid speed to get them there. Just and just, I I know that folks are you know concerned about how we don't know every single individual student. I have high expectations, and I believe everybody does that our principals and teachers actually know this information, and they escalate this up to us at the central level to make sure that we get those iPads in hand. So I, um, but I do expect more needs to be coming down the line. Uh, I don't get me wrong, and so we are thinking through our game plan for if there are broken devices, if students. Um, you know, no, lost it, whatever it may be, to make sure that we can supply those both now and in the summer and in the fall. Um, your other question around co-locations and kind of mm -hmm. planning for the fall, 
I will say, you know, our, we're planning through the fall right now. It is incredibly complicated, as, as you all know and are aware, not only for the space issues um, in our co-located schools, but just in some of our larger um, comprehensive high schools. Um, you know, I, I'm, Brooklyn Tech is obviously an outlier with how many students it has, but, you know, thinking through six feet of distancing with, you know, 4,500 staff, 4,500 students plus staff is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, it's very complicated and you'll hear more from us on that uh, for, you know, in, in the coming weeks. Around your questions around co-locations, um, you know, that we do a heavy amount of community engagement around our co-locations. And obviously there is a state law that either says that we need to provide space or we have to pay for it. Um, and that is, um, you know, that is the law as it is right now. Um, right. And obviously if there's any feedback on that or thoughts on that moving forward, that would be great uh, from your I perspective. Have so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, so I, but I will say, you know, we have to think through not only our, the policies for fall that impact our individual schools, but also the charter schools and non-pubs who look to us for guidance as well. So um, you'll hear uh, in more detail in the coming weeks, kind of what some of the things that we're thinking through in terms of scenarios. Thank I'm you. Sure I missed a question. Any, any indications of increases in teacher retirement? Oh, teacher retirement. I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, okay. I, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Kalos, followed by Council Members Holden, Miller, and Drum. Council Member Kalos. Council member, your time will start now. Uh, thank you to Chair Traeger for your exhaustive uh, questioning on our mutual issue of the iPads. I've only got three minutes, unlike the chair. So um, I'm hoping we can get through a lot of questions. If you can please avoid running the clock and just answer the questions I'm asking directly. Uh, I've invested over $5 million in laptops for my district. Uh, what is the inventory or just plainly stated, how many laptops does DOE have? Um, I don't have that specific number at the top of my head. I'd have to get back to you. And you're talking about both schools and central, correct? Yes. But as I in don't... like laptops you can hand to students or use in a classroom. Yeah. So right now, I just want you to know, we've been going through an inventory of all devices at the school level, both laptops, Chromebooks, iPads, think through every single device that we have. We're going through that inventory as we speak. Um, I just don't have the number and I know my team does, but I can get back to you on that. Is it? How hard would it be to get to 1.1 million devices and replace all the, I, next question, do you believe as a value statement that it is more equitable for every child to have a keyboard and not just the, the children who can afford laptops and that if you're a low income child on the wrong side of the digital divide, likely in a black and brown community like my colleague Inez Barron has mentioned, that you should have to just uh, poke away at your screen to type out a 500 word essay? Is it equitable for everyone to have a keyboard? I think it is in the, I, I, I would like all of our students to have a keyboard, yes. Great. Um, can we get to 1.1 million devices or just making sure every single kid has that keyboard in September? So there, when I mentioned the inventory that we're doing currently, part of that is to say how many devices, do we have enough uh, to the one-to-one -one ratio, do we have enough devices in the system as we speak to actually do that? Also, we have funding coming down from the state um, with the Smart Schools Bond Act. How do we use those resources to make sure that that is also contributing to the one-to-one -one ratio? Um, Amazing. But that is our ne intention. Next, next piece, we're currently burning uh, $3 million a month for these, uh, eight, uh, it's, AT it's Sprint or at and LTE cards. LTE is five megabits. Mm -hmm. So it's fast for a cell phone, but it's not actually considered broadband. Broadband, according to the FCC, is... 30 megabits, and in fact, anyone who has less than 100 megabits is going to be pretty unhappy. Uh, Spectrum, I, I reached out to them. They are now offering free, as in beer, free internet for 60 days. They've now extended it to 120 days to any family that doesn't have it. I let DOE know. My daughter says hi. Um, and uh, what do you call it? So I think that... Um, hundred the twelve million dollars we've already spent or are planning to spend is more than free uh, and now as we go into September and the possibility of a second wave we might have less so uh, would the city be open to a lower cost option that offers more broadband Time's expired working with folks to, to do that I think the last piece is just and if the chair would indulge me when I asked the, the chancellor about this during the budget hearing he indicated there were 20,000 left iPads that haven't been distributed yet at a cost of $700 plus each, which is almost twice market 
their opportunity to say, Apple, you can keep those 20,000 devices. We're going to take those $14 million. We're going to use it to pay for SYEP, Summer Sonic, after school, just anything else other than these very expensive devices. So uh, thank you for that. So I'll be quick on my answer. So one, uh, we, we went through LTE enabled because not everybody has access to, to broadband, um, as, as you are aware. Obviously, if there are cheaper options that actually get to an equitable system where everybody has access to internet, I'm, I'm all ears and open to that. We're working with T-Mobile to lower, to, to lower some of the pricing um, on the LTE enabled uh, devices. In terms of your question on the iPads, we've actually now distributed over three or sh shipped out over 300,000 uh, iPads to date. Um, and to your questions on costs, yes, the costs you know, are high. And to me, that was just the price you had to pay to, to be able to get students the devices that they need at the speed in which we delivered them. And I know that it's, you know, when we weighed all of our all the, the kind of considerations and the vendors and what people had available, uh, Apple was the only folks who had 300,000, you know, devices that I could quickly deliver. And we, in five and a half weeks, we delivered 265,000 devices, uh, roughly 265,000 devices. And that's bigger than most school districts combined. So I, I just want to note that I understand the costs and it is, you know, as somebody who oversees the financial arm and the IT arm, um, it's a big decision, but it was the right thing to do for our kids. I, I, I agree. And I think that you were in a tough spot. I think the goal is just if we're heading into September, planning for the best and, and also worried about the worst. Yes. We have three months now to not be stuck with one with the only vendor on the planet who could help us. So I think Absolutely. you were in a very tough position with a specific goal in mind. My goal is to work with you on inventory the, I, the, the laptops and get people the broadband deployment so that we're not stuck locked into one vendor and one LTE connection. So thank you. Thank you to the chair for his indulgence. Next, Thanks, we Council will Member. hear from Councilmember Holden, followed by Councilmembers Miller, Drom, and Rose. Councilmember Holden. Council member, your time will start now. Thank you, Tra uh, Chair Traeger, for this great, great hearing. Um, uh, can, uh, uh, can you explain what updates Zoom made that caused the DOE to reconsider its use um, uh, early on? Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we were really concerned about their end-to-end -end encryption, um, and this was uh, early on, and that was really the thing that was able to have people doing Zoom bombs, um, for lack of a better term. Um, so they have addressed that. And then secondarily, we created a login that is managed by us uh, at, at the DOE um, so that and we're giving out that login to schools so that they can log in directly. And that, that way, it's also a cost savings to the school level because they were using their own resources to sign up for the, what we call the Zoom Pro. Um, and now they don't have to do that. But we worked really closely with Zoom. Um, to make through these changes, and they did it at a speed that I'm very grateful for because we knew that our schools and our students really enjoyed using Zoom. So, so they did something for DOE that they didn't do for anybody else around the nation? I will say, you know, I, I don't know what they were doing around the nation. I just know that what we worked on uh, with them. And I know that the AG's office had been working with them as well. So I believe that they made larger changes to their platform. Yeah, because we heard from many principals, teachers, and parents that they were frustrated with the alternatives to Zoom during the period uh, it was not in use, we, and with many opting out of remote learning and using packets instead. Uh, some of the concerns were that the software, Microsoft, for instance, of uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Meets, uh, Adobe Connect, were too clunky, um, not user friendly, and posed problems. So, what did DOE do during that the time that Zoom was not uh, being used for, to promote uh, remote learning and fix whatever issues educators and students were having? So we offered, uh, we provided training on the IT side for Microsoft Teams and Google Hangs and Meets, um, and that's what we were doing at the time. Um, and then obviously we were subsequently working really hard with Zoom to make sure that we can get them uh, back on one of our platforms as soon as possible, because we did hear a lot of feedback from teachers um, and from principals around their usage of Zoom and how important it was for them to their work. So, um, you know, I, we were doing our best to provide PD uh, on those other platforms and understand that some people took, uh, took it up and some did not. Uh, and, uh, you know, one common complaint I've heard is that students are staying up late and often did not wake up and show up to remote classes. 
Um, do you think that changing the grading policy contributed to the lack of incentives for waking up and participating? Because that's, that's what uh, the major concern that we were seeing in the district. Uh, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna ask uh, Deputy, or I should say Chief Academic Officer Linda Chen to talk about the grading policy. Um, go ahead, Linda. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Council Member Holden. Um, as you know, um, we needed to update Time's the grading expired. Policy, update the grading policy uh, to respond to the circumstance that we're in and every student uh, responds differently. And we wanted to make sure that uh, they were duly engaged and also to make sure that it was fair in consideration of a holistic um, assessment of a student's learning. Um, so for high school, we kept um, the current uh, grading policies and made sure that a student would not fail because of a fail of course because of this, but would have course in progress so that they could finish this. And uh, the expectation is still uh, unchanged that they would need to complete their course, um, knowing that students may need some flexibility in how they demonstrate their learning and what time they have. We also know that some of our students um, are working and taking care of families. Uh, so we want to make sure there's that flexibility for them to be able to demonstrate their learning. And for our middle school students, um, they would uh, also be assessed on whether to what degree they met the standards where they needed uh, improvement, or if they also have a course in progress that needs to be finished. And for our elementary students, um, whether they met the standards or they needed uh, improvement. And those marks would help us also identify to many of your colleagues' questions around the lack of access and opportunity. We want to make sure that also helps us determine what our young people need for the summer. And so for summer school, we do have um, additional opportunities for learning to for young people to complete their course or to um, be better prepared and ready for school in the following year. Uh, can I ask one second, uh, Chair, one, one other follow up to that? Am I muted? We can hear you. Chair, uh, yes, you have a follow up question, Councilman. Yeah, on, on the, because uh, the Chancellor did tell me that um, you, you were reaching out to, on the grading policy, reaching out to several groups. And uh, I asked my CEC, uh, they weren't uh, consulted on the grading policy, nor was any PTA that uh, I've been in contact with. Can you tell me who, um, how, who you reached out to uh, on, the, on the grading policy? Because uh, my district, we had no, um, actually we, we didn't get any information on, on, on the grading policy until it was handed down. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin to to make some additions there. Thank you, Adrian. Sorry, she's on mute. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for the question. So uh, we did engage with parent leaders before the policy was rolled out. We uh, attended a special meeting by the Education Council Consortium, which happened to have representation from all of the CECs across the city. Um, we also had a meeting with CPAC where we talked about the grading policy. Um, every Friday, I have a meeting with um, the executive board of the Education Council Consortium, which again, are all members of CECs across the city um, and with the uh, leadership of CPAC. And so I spoke with them about it. Um, we also had a meeting with Place NYC, which also again has a lot of um, particularly in your district, uh, members, CEC members who are, are representatives of Queens and then parts of Manhattan. Um, so that was the engagement. It was, it was a very uh, sort of rapid engagement because we wanted to make sure that the policy was implemented in a time frame that would be helpful for our principals and our schools and our parents. Um, I will say we do have another engagement that's ongoing uh, on admissions and we are doing a broader engagement for that. And actually we are kicking off a uh, this, the admissions policy engagement today, and we're doing a public meeting in all of the boroughs. Thank you, Chair, for the extra time. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Miller, followed by Council Members Drom, Rose, Amphrey Samuel, and Levin. Council Member Miller. Council Member, your time will start now. Thank you very much, and thank you so much to Traeger for your leadership and this. And and important here, and obviously, um, uh, my community and, and members of the Black. Community. Uh, 
are very concerned about the equity issues in the DOE that have manifested itself into this, uh, the disparities that we're seeing. So my line of question is, um, coming out of COVID and what next year looks like, what have we learned and what will we be doing differently? What support are we going to have, including, um, I, I, I know that the uh, Deputy Chancellor mentioned that uh, each school had access to social workers and psychologists. What precisely does that mean when we have schools that share uh, one social worker and psychologist between three and four schools? What does access mean when, when it comes to um, equi equitability? And then in terms of also, um, we talked about professional development. Is there a, a consistency and continuity in professional development where uh, schools are teaching and teaching the method of teaching and the uh, what they're teaching uh, may be different? And so, um, it, which it also, um, in my mind, perpetuates those type of inequities. Uh, what are we doing in terms of the continuity of professional development and support for um, all of uh, our school community as we move forward into 2020, 2021. And I want to end by just thanking uh, the entire body of our school community from CSA, UFT, and DC 37, and, and, and uh, 32BJ, and everybody else who's in the building. I want to thank them for getting us through this, for continuing to support our most vulnerable, and look forward to uh, your answers. Thank you so much, Council Member Miller. Um, to your, I, I heard two major points, and and I will, if, if I've missed any, um, I apologize, and you can correct me. In terms of lessons learned, I think that uh, obviously we are learning every single day as this, uh, as you know, remote learning continues on. Um, and one of the major lessons learned, I should say, from from my vantage point, uh, was making sure that uh, to to earlier points that we really have access to technology for all of our students. And so making sure in the fall that we are set up to, for success for all of our kids um, in the case that we would continue in the remote learning setting. Um, I would also uh, recommend that, you know, in terms of lessons learned, um, how earlier on we can engage families to make sure um, that they feel supported uh, throughout the remote learning process. Um, to, to your question around uh, PD, I'm going to hand it over to uh, CAO Linda Chen to talk about um, what uh, what the kind of continuity of professional development looks like. Thank you uh, for the question as well. Uh, it's an important one, and we are working closely with our labor partners that you've also identified uh, to make sure that uh, we expired. are working together to, to move towards a shared goal of all of our workforce being um, uh, ready and, and able to support our students, especially during this time. So there are a number of kinds of professional development that would occur anyway, things around uh, learning their, their content, learning things about students and how to teach. In the specific uh, circumstance that we're in with COVID, we wanna make sure that more than ever, the social and emotional learning aspects are incredibly important to be able to connect with students and to get to know them and to be able to know what are those standards that they need to learn grade by grade. And so as we are getting ready for closing up the school year, we are also working with our teachers to think about what are those priority standards of all the things that we need to learn and be um, to gain mastery in. What are those things that are hugely important? Those are some of the professional learning topics that we'll provide in the summer. And lastly, the third part I would say, in addition to social emotional learning and being very efficient about the content and the most important standards to learn is the piece around how to deliver uh, instruction. So as many of your colleagues have asked uh, earlier, the, the importance of being able to be comfortable with technology and the options that it can provide to be able to virtually put students in group or to be able to connect personally, those are all aspects and tools of the trade that we are now um, ramping up as well as we move into the fall, knowing that um, these skills will be helpful in whatever uh, scenario in which we return. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Next, we will hear from Council Member Drom, followed by Council Members Rose, Amphrey Samuel, and Levin. Council Member Drom. Council Member Drom, we'll start now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Good to see you all. Thank you for uh, attending the hearing. I have some good news for you. 
I just got off the um, off of a Zoom conference while we were still in this conference. I'm learning how to do that now. Um, <laughs> multitasking, right? And you can, uh, you can provide PD to our teachers. Yes. No. 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 That I can't do. So if I was still teaching, I don't know what I would have done. But anyway, um, and they said that uh, all of their computers have arrived. They arrived on time. That you've been there with the go and uh, the grab and go meals and. They were very pleased with the department's response. You know, that's um, a very large shelter. 800 uh, people live in that shelter. So I, I appreciate that effort on your behalf. At the beginning of the testimony, I heard uh, reference to the LGBT programs. And I was just wondering if you can give me some more details on that um, and also about payments to them. Uh, can you give me an update on what's happening with that? Um, I'm going to defer to uh, Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson um, on the substance of kind of what's happening there. In terms of payments, um, I will work with my team to see, uh, you know, what the status update is to make sure that they get paid. Um, we were prioritizing COVID response payments um, first and foremost, um, and I will see if, uh, if they've gotten their, or if, if there is a check on its way. I will confirm. Yeah. And Ms. Ramirez, before we go to um, Ms. Robinson. Yep. Um, the, uh, um, the, the payments, what I'm really just concerned about is the transition to um, remote learning. I uh, see, so okay. That qualifies. Okay. These programs that were mentioned in the testimony would obviously then qualify for the most yeah. part. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will get back to you on that one, uh, 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 Council Member Drum. Um, LaShawn, do you wanna talk about uh, our work with LGBTQ students? Absolutely, um, and thank you so much, Council Member Drum for your continued support for our, our LGBTQ students. We have indeed continued this and very important work um, for our students and school communities. We've continued our partnership with the Yankees for the um, Stonewall Scholarship as an example. We continue to review um, an interview um, for, you know, to really be able to determine um, who the recipients will be. We continue with support for our GSAs. Um, and I would like to just give a shout out to the Office of Safety and Youth Development and Eric for his leadership. We continue to work with the LGBTQ Center on virtual meetups um, for students. Um, we are looking forward to Pride Month and we have some exciting activities um, scheduled, including um, Mindful Mondays. So. We can absolutely continue to prioritize and support this body of work. We are Time's expired. working with the Stonewall Inn for virtual tours. We have some scheduled on um, this month and next month. So we are creative. We're listening to um, our students and our GSAs, and we are responding um, with supports, resources, um, and activities. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Rose, followed by Councilmembers Amphrey Samuel and Levin. Councilmember Rose. Councilmember, your Thank time you. will start now. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm concerned about the RECs and what criteria was used to determine the placement and location of them. The only REC on the North Shore in Staten Island was closed Feb Friday, March 27th, after being open only four days. It was, and on the same day that it was announced that the criteria for eligibility was being um, <coughs> widened, parents were asked to relocate with less than a week's time and um, at, with less than a week's time burdening them and their hectic schedules. Can you tell me currently how many parents are utilizing RECs on Staten Island and how many are from the North Shore? And do you consider this equitable distribution and, um, and serves the needs of the most vulnerable? And my next question is, what is the status of the implicit bias and cultural competency trainings and contracts that have been uh, going on pre-COVID-19? Uh, has the DOE explored remote trainings and how have professional development trainings continued in general? And I, and I want to thank Joshua for his articulation of the realities of students um, learning um, remotely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Rose. Um, so when we opened up our regional enrichment centers, 
uh, it was based on a handful of, of factors, uh, access to trains, making sure that we had uh, them in, in every single district, um, looking at um, the, the kitchen in terms of how the in, and accessibility to make sure that we have an accessible location for our students with disabilities. So those are all kind of key factors in making those decisions. Um, when we decided to close uh, the enrichment centers, as you mentioned, a few days, you know, I would say like a, less than a week before we launched them, it was really based on uh, what we were seeing in terms of the demand. Um, we had sent out uh, a lot of, you know, I should say, we, should, we sent out enrollment to a lot of students and we didn't get a lot of attendance. And in the site that you were uh, discussing, we only had, and I would say it was, probably, I think it was less than 10 students um, who had showed yeah. up that week. No. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. it was okay. It wasn't. Um, I could be incorrect. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, and I no no. I just I and I and I apologize if the number is wrong. I want to make sure that I I get the right numbers and and that um, that I get the breakdown for Staten Island for you. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, so I I mean it's it, these are tough decisions for us in terms of how we make decisions on when we're going to close the enrichment center. Did you think that this was an equitable distribution of of the services and that it served the most vulnerable population? That it served the most vulnerable population in one yes. sense. In fact, in terms of essential workers that Time's had to expired. Work. So I I mean I think that we were making a, a judgment based on both the enrollment and the usage and the location uh, to make decisions um, on which, which enrichment centers we were going to close. And to your point, it was really important to us that you know, our workers are essential workers as well, our food staff, the enrichment center staff. And I wanted to make sure that when we were sending staff there that, that we, were, we were doing it in a way that made sense um, and that there were students there for them to serve. So we had to think about all of those things to make sure that we were not putting our staff at risk unnecessarily when we had a location that was um, in closer proximity. Um, and I, I understand your concerns, uh, Council Member Rose, um, around the closure of that site. Um, and you know, it's, I will say that the closure of all the sites has not been an easy one for us. Um, we're still seeing that there, there's, we still have capacity in all of uh, uh, the enrichment centers and would like to work with you to make sure that the families that need it have access to uh, the lo other locations on Staten Island. Um, to your question around implicit bias training, I wanna hand it over to my colleague, LaShawn Robinson, to talk uh, in more detail about uh, the work that we're doing on IB training for our staff. Thank you so much, um, Ursulina, and thank you so much for um, that question, uh, council member. Um, we are excited to share that we have continued the important work of implicit bias um, sessions and cultural responsiveness, um, professional learning opportunities, um, we launched or relaunched, I should say, last week um, on a virtual um, platform. We had over 2,000 um, staff members who signed up, teachers eager um, to get back and, you know, get involved. Um, the site that we launched, it has um, modules where some of the modules, educators have an opportunity to progress at their own pace, and then some of the modules um, the final module um, is facilitated by um, one of the implicit bias staff members. We brought a lot of that um, training in-house. Um, it's facilitated by uh, DOE employees. And I really want to thank council. Um, when we had the initial launch almost two years ago now, I believe, um, council uh, certainly supported um, with providing fiscal resources um, for implementation. So certainly I'd like to thank council for that um, continued support. My time's up. Next. My time's up. <laughs> Next, we will hear from council member Amphrey Samuel followed by council member Levin. Council member, your time will start now. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is well. Um, my question is really related to, of course, um, the, the transfer students, as well as the overaged junior high school students. Um, many of our vulnerable students were, everyone knows, at a disadvantage prior to the pandemic. And we already talked about, even during this hearing, um, the challenges that so many of our students faced during the pandemic. So I'm not really talking about the students that were already on track academically. I'm just talking about the, the really vulnerable students who are 
in communities like the ones I serve where they've already been facing many challenges and trauma. And so I'm just trying to get a sense of um, what, what else are you doing as far as engagement with the specific students that were hard to um, assist and help last year? You know, the ones that um, were barely showing up to school and are really struggling, um, but now, you know, I know that the attendance teachers are not, you know, are, are calling and there's a whole engagement effort, but can you just kind of talk us through like what's really happening and what's the feasibility of continuing with remote learning um, for those individual students who are already struggling? And, you know, again, I mentioned the transfer students, the transfer high school students, but also that overaged junior high school student, that 15 year old student that's in the seventh grade going into the eighth grade. So can you speak to what you're doing, what DOE is doing with those particular students and their families? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman. Um, I'm gonna have LaShawn Robinson talk uh, about what we're doing with in terms of engagement. I'm also gonna ask uh, our first deputy chancellor, Cheryl Watson Harris to talk about uh, what our transfer school students, or I should say our transfer school staff are doing to support those students who are overage and undercredited. Uh, uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson. Yes, um, the uh, transfer school model um, and those school communities are uh, certainly near and dear to my heart. And I really appreciate um, your question, council member, um, because these are the students that you certainly have to go um, the extra mile for. Um, many of these schools are um, set up with support, um, the support of a CBO partner, um, they have additional resources um, on hand. Um, I like to say they were some of our uh, very first um, community school models. And we leverage all of those resources and supports, understanding that many of our um, older young people, especially our young people in transfer schools, may be shouldering additional um, home responsibilities um, during this time. Um, when I was a transfer Time's school um, principal, many of my um, young people, in addition to um, their schoolwork, they also had jobs and, you know, um, I had moms who were um, a part of my school. So um, just additional responsibilities from that lens. We have our counselors and our teachers um, checking in for engagement um, through wellness checks. Many of those schools have um, advocates who are part of the CBOs or part of the school staff who serve as the one point person um, for young people, ensuring that they meet um, their progress goals towards graduation. Um, the young person who spoke earlier, um, Joshua, uh, who shared his story with us, which I really appreciate, that school, Liberation Diploma Plus, has one of the Thrive School Response Clinicians, um, a high need social worker placed there to support their needs. So we have a plethora of resources and supports that are available. Um, I know that um, our Deputy Chancellor, uh, First Deputy Chancellor Watson Harris, um, you know, can share a little bit more. Yes, thank you so much, uh, DC Robinson, uh, for giving that huge overview. And, and thank you so much for the question. Um, as DC Robinson uh, shared, our students at our transfer schools are near and dear to our hearts and definitely um, a priority. Um, I could just share uh, another specific example um, at Brooklyn Democracy, which is a school in, in District uh, 23. Um, and some of the things that they've done quite successfully uh, at, over this time of remote learning, they've actually increased their attendance by 33%. Um, and they've done that by the use of uh, success mentors uh, who have been partnered with individual students, the very students that you highlighted um, in your question. Um, and the success mentors have done this work uh, by uh, actions such as parent check-ins, conversation templates uh, for families, uh, wellness checks, needs assessments, and conferences, uh, parent-teacher conferences uh, throughout this time um, of remote learning. Um, this school has also created a re-engagement team that 
that's looking and tracking uh, our, our highest needs students um, and reaching out to them uh, and, and developing ongoing mentoring relationships. Um, on, on a systemic level, we, we also are thinking about how we're going to use a summer school uh, and the summer months to re-engage any students who have been off track um, and to make sure that we're providing uh, the necessary resources and services to fill in the gaps uh, to get them back on track. And can you just speak to the um, over age junior high school students? Because that's a real challenge. And um, clearly what we're seeing with a lot of young people um, with the gang activity and, and different challenges in the community overall, um, we find that as a, you know, something specific that I would love to be able to, you know, help and assist with um, in any kind of way. So can you speak to what's happening with the overage junior high school? Yes, and, and thank you for your partnership and invitation to uh, partner to support uh, th that group of students. Um, as you know, we have uh, an access uh, executive Superintendent, Dr. Tim Lasante, um, as well as his BCO supports. Uh, they also are uh, utilizing some of the same strategies that we just spoke about uh, with uh, Brooklyn Democracy to really target those students, to case manage them, um, and to provide additional supports for re-engagement, um, as well as supports for uh, families. But uh, we most certainly can follow up with you uh, to discuss the plans for supporting and re-engaging our overage uh, middle school students uh, and, and would welcome the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Our final line of questioning comes from Council Member Levin. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much. We'll start your, now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, best practices elsewhere. Um, where what other cities um because every you know every city in uh, in america uh is um is dealing with the similar challenges that you all are dealing with um obviously we're the largest school system but that does not necessarily mean that we can't learn from from other jurisdictions what what uh, other cities how how are you communicating with other cities to to find best practices and um uh, and what it, what are you learning? Wh who's doing innovative things? Who's who's shown um, real success and and uh, done things that we'd like to emulate? Uh, thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, so I would say that obviously across the state, we talk to different uh, both uh, school board uh, members and obviously obviously the regents and some superintendents. Uh, and in addition to that, we also have conversations with the Council for Great City Schools to see what, what they're learning throughout this process and, and thinking through their plans for the fall. So we, we're definitely working uh, alongside, I would say, a, lar a lot of the, the larger districts in, in New York State, but also across uh, the nation and learning about what they're doing. I would say that, you know, what I, my, my assessment is, you know, we're learning a lot about what they're thinking about for the fall in terms of right now. I think that our teachers are doing some really remarkable work in comparison to other districts. And I'm not trying to, you know, be too, mm -hmm. too, too boastful of our own staff here, but I think that um, folks are obviously looking to us about what we're doing um, in terms of other lessons, you know, learn from them uh, around kind of device uh, purchases and, you know, what the one-to-one -one ratio looks like in those districts has been really interesting for, for us. Um, I think it's uh, the, the difficult part for us is obviously our size. Um, it, it's hard to, to take a look at those districts when they're significantly smaller in scope and have just a different set of populations that they're serving. But um, Linda, do you have anything to add in terms of other lessons that you think that we're learning from an academic standpoint? Uh, yes, so um, as Ursulina said, we have weekly meetings actually um, with uh, different uh, role alike groups, if you will, with a council of the great city school. So the chief academic officers have one as well as special education and English language learners. And um, so we talk about anywhere from how do we provide related services in better ways for our special uh, needs students. Uh, and I would say that I would echo Ursula's comments. We go to these meetings, we do learn some things, but people are also asking us, what are the things we did? Because we were one of the first school districts to start remote learning. I would say on the instructional standpoint, there's a certain infrastructure that other school districts have, again, partially because of size. 
um, when they have a learning management system that sets Time's up, expired. it provides the ability to get information uh, more rapidly and quickly and more comprehensively to uh, as well as be able to track the kind of engagement that is being used. So that is definitely something we've been learning a lot about from um, other districts, as well as within our own system. Uh, we have schools that have a robust learning management system, and that's also helpful too. So it, I'm just curious, other, um, so cities like say San Francisco, Oakland, um, uh, Berkeley, Los Angeles, um, that are in areas that have, um, you know, where there's a lot of tech, um, uh, innovation happening um, and a, you know and a, a willingness with the industry to, to work with local school districts um, are there is there anything in particular that we're learning from on a, on a technology perspective that's that uh, from those from those districts that, that, that we don't have access to that we'd like access to I think it's more along the lines of what I mentioned uh, so LAUSD, for instance, uses Schoology and they have a learning management system. And so there's a mechanism in which we've been learning how they can push out curriculum content and be able to track um, work. And so what we're doing is because we don't have that system wide across a million students in 1800 schools, we are trying to make our best um, proxies for that in terms of how do we ensure that on the data end, we can build some back sort of infrastructure to do the same things that their systems are doing um, yeah. and also uh, around digital content. So we have been learning a lot around how we can, um, so we set up Teach Hub very quickly. Some of those lessons were lessons learned from other places where they were able to have all of this information at the fingers of teachers. And so we learned some of those kinds of things and we're trying to work with a, non, a number of partners and funding partners that can help us do some of the same things and stand those things up. Um, and so it's really been an incredible opportunity to be able to share best practices in terms of implementation. Thanks so much. I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> actually, we have uh, questions from Council Member Brannon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, really, really. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Really quick. Um, I just wanted to. I don't think anyone else had asked it, but I wanted to just get an idea as far as um, STEM programs and stuff like the Urban Advantage program. With obviously, you know, social distancing and remote learning makes hands-on stuff a little bit difficult. How is how is what, what is DOE doing to support um, the science educators who might not have access to labs and other scientific tools right now. Uh, thank you, council member. Uh, Linda, do you wanna address that? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a great one. And um, we have been trying to learn all different ways to be able to provide um, instruction virtually. And the good thing is there are lots of great resources out there, especially around STEM. So during the week that we would have had a, a spring break, if you will, um, we had a theme a day, if you will, and, and uh, CS, uh, uh, computer science, was one of those days. And we had uh, our team worked really hard to make sure that we could take simple items that can be more commonly found in homes and in apartments to be able to do some of the hands-on types of things. You're absolutely right. It's very hard to completely... Um, you know, reproduce a lab experience. Uh, there are ways to do it with, if you have some other tools, but that we're, we're limited to what we have uh, across the system. We've been able to partner with um, organizations like Discovery that have a lot of digital content, a vast amount of digital content. So some of the things that we're able to do are also virtual field trips. And it's been great to hear from our teachers because some of our young people have now been virtually to some places that they hadn't been before. So we are constantly scouring more information and resources to be able to provide to our teachers, especially around STEM. Um, I think there are in some ways uh, some more opportunities because uh, even around math, if you will, there are lots of programs. We also partner with the Khan Academy where we're able to more um, precisely understand where a student's needs are and put them into a learning pathway that is best suited for what their needs are. And especially in mathematics where it's a very sort of um, cumulative set of skills that you need to learn. And part of what we're doing right now is making sure we help teachers understand what certain key concepts are foundational 
to uh, the next set of concepts that the students would need to learn. And technology allows us the opportunity to be able to make that uh, more readily available. Okay, thank you. Before concluding the administration testimony, I will turn it back to Chair Traeger for closing words. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I just, uh, just as I was uh, listening to my colleagues was asking questions, um, I, I have some folks shared with me the survey that the DOE uh, gave out for folks to fill out uh, on their experiences with remote learning. And I was just taking some notes on questions that I did not see asked. I'm going to list off some questions that I think could have and should have been asked, but were not. And if anyone can from DOE reply to me or, or respond, why weren't such questions asked? And I will go through uh, my list. Uh, do students have other uh, or other home responsibilities? Have their parents uh, lost or has a parent lost their job during the pandemic? Have financial circumstances changed since the start of the pandemic? How often do they speak with their friends? Do they have a quiet space where they live so they can learn and do work quietly? Uh, do they share a device with others where they live? Have they experienced any loss uh, in their immediate family? Uh, are they working now as essential workers? And are their parents essential workers? And to, for them to do some self-reflection about their state of physical and mental health and trauma. These were items that were not asked and not mentioned in the survey that was given out to students and families to fill out. Can anyone from DOE respond why? So I will, I'll start and then I'll have Linda add in. So I think some of your questions, and I totally understand kind of the rationale to ask them. Um, I, I, what I would fear if I saw a question around kind of my financial status and about you know my, my work or my family's work is that that's really sensitive for a lot of families. And I'm nervous that that would be a deterrent for some families to fill it out. And while I totally 100% the intent um, I think that, you know, to have maximum participation, we want to make sure that people feel comfortable with asking the questions. That being said, you did ask some ad additional questions that I think um, are interesting and, uh, you know, we should kind of think through what, uh, you know, in terms of how we can get that kind of information from our families. Uh, Chief Academic Officer Linda Chen, do you want to add anything there? Sure. Um, so, I, Chair Traeger, I really appreciate the questions that you posed. Um, I think those are important questions. It was our, uh, we had planned to do more surveys and we may consider doing that. This survey is still open, but I think those are critically important questions. Some of them, as Ursula said, may be a bit too sensitive. We asked questions more of technical nature of access to technology, communication, school support and student learning. And I think that if we have the opportunity to reissue another survey, there are a number of questions here that um, we're just very thoughtful that you raised as a, a next tier of um, supports that would really help us uh, have better considerations for, for how we plan uh, for a return as well as a strong finish. So I do appreciate those questions and we will certainly keep you updated through our routine check-ins um, in terms of if we are able to provide another survey. Um, certainly the ones that you've posed are incredibly important pieces of information to know. So the reason why I raise the issue of the financial circumstances in the home, and I'm mindful of the sensitivities there, is that there was a recent daily news story that highlighted a student in my district who is an essential worker and is working to support her family at home in a, in a grocery store, but is being marked absent every day uh, you know, because she's not logging on to the tablet. And so I do believe that there is some relevance on how finances are impacting uh, our students' uh, learning and, and, uh, and outcomes. You know, we have, mil we have a, 
I think 20 over 20 million or 30 million Americans unemployed in New York City, the, the numbers are rising by the day. I do believe that there is an impact uh, that's taking place on our students and some students in the high school uh, universe are now being asked to work to support their families at home. Uh, they are essential workers. Some students, as we've heard from many parents and from other school communities, require the help and support of a parent or someone adult uh, in the home. But if the parents themselves are essential workers, if mom is a nurse, uh, if, if, if mom or dad's a bus driver uh, helping to, 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 for the city to function, I do think there is some relevance. And I think that that's the balance we should strike in asking these types of questions and whether they experience loss yep. because trauma is real. And I mm -hmm. think we have a better scope of, of the full impacts that our kids are experiencing. Would you all agree? I, I mean, I 100% agree with that statement. And I think, you know, it might be best for us to engage students on how they want to be asked uh, these questions. Um, because I do think that you're raising a fair point around the traumas that our students are facing in terms of in terms of working and supporting their families, I think that people are, or students are doing now. Now, and I also think that they were doing that when we were in um, our normal instruction. Um, and how do we accommodate those students who are really trying to just make ends meet for their families? So I agree with that statement, um, and definitely want to work with you to to see how we can address that um, moving forward. Um, can I just make one other point, Chair Traeger, because I I want to just correct the record, and I apologize. This is what happens when you're trying to answer you and, and read your text messages at the same time. So I was incorrect in my statement statement around 2,800 social workers. That is actually how many for the summer. That's how many people we expect to apply for the role. Um, that that is not the number in which we plan on hiring. Um, the hiring number is roughly 170 social workers. So I do want to come back to you and work with you um, around your question around the ratio because I think that that is a fair point and making sure that our students are being supported throughout the summer um, because as you noted. You know, it's a really difficult time uh, for all of our families, in particular these students who obviously need improvement and have to go to summer school. So I'll circle back with you to work with you on, on the ratio question. Well, I would say that 2,800 is much better than 170, even though we yes. need a lot, a lot more. And what I would just note is that, and I understand yep. that we're, we're in a fiscal crisis, but I think that these are the decisions that are more magnified now. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that is gonna be correct, that 170 social workers for 170,000 or so kids, that's like a one to 1,000 ratio. And you know that is kind of where things are at now and normal is not gonna cut it. We can't go back to that mentality. It's not gonna cut it. These are kids that if we don't double down and add more support, we're, we're gonna lose them and we're not gonna get them back. And, and, I, and, I, and I am the optimist and, and I always want to be positive about all these items. We're going to lose these kids. And so I will do whatever I can from the council's end and work with the, we, we need to get these kids more social workers and support staff. We cannot, this, this pain could quickly become generational. And that is where we have to draw, draw a line. So I would really like to work with you in the admin on adding more support for these kids. Thank you so much. Uh, final question. Uh, in light of the fact that the June Regents exam, uh, were, exams were canceled due to COVID-19, the state education department is issuing exemptions for students who would normally have had to pass Regents exams for graduation. Exemptions are supposed to be available for any student who have earned credit in a course that, that culminates in a Regents exam. However, I have, I have heard that DOE is interpreting this exemption as only applying to those who have taken and passed a specific series of courses. Why is DOE interpreting it this way when clearly this list will prevent many students from graduating? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Linda Chen, do you wanna take uh, a shot at that answer? Sure, um, I appreciate the question and it is uh, hugely important to ensure that our young people um, are able to uh, be able to meet the graduation requirements and especially under the special considerations and guidance the New York State Education Department has provided around Regents waivers. Um, as far as we are understanding, we are working very closely with them and have interpreted uh, the guidelines as written. And um, we can circle back to them again 
but that is our interpretation. We certainly are not looking to um, create obstacles for students, but we want to make sure that we are not putting them at risk if we are not following the guidelines um, closely. So I will certainly um, reassess that situation and, and ask again um, to make sure that we are indeed in alignment. But as far as we understand, we are in alignment with what the guidelines have been provided. So I'd like to follow up with you, Dr. Chen, about some of the cases that we're hearing about where, where, where there, there is some contention around this issue. Um, and uh, with that, I, I think uh, the panel has a lot more work to do, a lot more information that the DOE has to report back to the council. We appreciate it in a, in a timely manner. Um, and uh, we thank you all for, for your service and uh, we'll call uh, the public now to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, sir. We have now concluded administration testimony and will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I would like to remind everyone that I will be calling individuals one by one to testify in panels. Council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after the whole panel has completed its testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And I will do my best with pronouncing everyone's names, but if I do mess it up, I apologize in advance. On the first panel, we will have Michael Mulgrew, William Deep, Shadavia Burnett, Babu Gay, and Donald Nesbitt. And we will first hear from Michael Mulgrew. Time starts now. Uh, Chair Traeger, so much for having this uh, hearing. Sunday, March 15th uh, at 5 p.m. was a culmination of two of the most hectic weeks in my entire career. And it ended with us officially, with the mayor announcing official closure of the schools. And that was just the beginning of one of the toughest challenges that the New York City public school system has ever been through, as well as New York City itself. And from that point on, every teacher and every school community administrative staff in New York City had to learn how to go to remote learning. There was no plan in place. There was no support system in place. There was no training in place. And every school had to figure it out on their own. Thankfully, as always, um, everybody started reaching out to each other, sharing resources, sharing knowledge, sharing different ideas and strategies with each other and making things work. And I am very, very proud at this point to say that New York City's remote learning, even despite all of its challenges, has been an overall success. We still always have more to do, but it has definitely been an overall success. And it's been a success because we have teachers like a Bronx High School teacher who has turned his apartment into a green room because he was doing film projects with his students at this point. Or the pre-K teacher in, uh, uh, in Staten Island who, because her students were getting, uh, were so anxious, started setting up all the virtual play dates for all the students inside of a class for every Friday. And they would talk about that throughout the week when they were doing live learning with her. Or the alternative high school, Manhattan uh, Night and Day Comprehensive High School, who worked to make sure that their students who face many challenges and were difficult to engage in the first place, that they set up a school-wide project called the History of Me, where they, start, they started each student taking their own, uh, telling their own story about what they're facing as they go through this pandemic. This is how we get our work done, and this is how our school system is going to continue to work. However, we know moving forward that the challenge that we face because we want to open again in September and that's going to take a great amount of coordination and time. So many of the programs that this council has supported all worked and switched themselves very quickly to continue to do the work that we promise you we would do in a virtual atmosphere. Our positive learning collaborative has been invaluable for so many students dealing with anxiety. Our community learning schools coordinating food distributions throughout the different communities in New York City as well as our Brave Hotline, which has really been quite uh, busy at this point, but it's not to deal with bullying, it's really a deal with fear and anxiety as, and also 
our dialer teacher, who thank God, because of your support, moved quickly to uh, set up a virtual online platform and is now being called, we think, more by parents than actual children, uh, students. Uh, but it's really about how we're going to move forward. And I think I would tell everyone, because I'm testifying later today at the, governor, uh, at the governor's co uh, committee, that you need to listen to what the teachers and parents have found out. There is no playbook that works everywhere. It depends on the grade level, the subject area, what uh, the parents' capability, what does family face? Uh, can the child be self-directed? What are their, uh, their diagnosed difficulties if there is child with special needs? Uh, our English uh, new language students um, need a whole different style and a different uh, strategy in terms of how we're approaching them. Those answers now lie amongst the teachers and staffs in the New York City public school system. I was listening to your questions before. What have we learned from others? It's more that what are they learning from us? Uh, many, many of the school systems thought that if they had a learning management system or they were trying to recreate the school day, and it really has not worked out well for the school systems who have tried that. We, because of our size, our size actually turned out to be part of our strength when it came to this because our teacher center quickly started coordinating and organizing folks once we found out certain areas of the city or certain teachers were saying they were having a problem with the technology or a learning strategy, whether it be synchronous learning or asynchronous learning, we would quickly put them in touch with another group of teachers who were doing really, really well with it. And it was just that sharing of ideas. But now it's about pulling these things together because come September, we can't say we didn't have the time to plan. And this is part of my frustration at this moment. We are way behind in our planning process. And we're trying to plan for school year like no other school year. And that is really what we are now faced as a school system. So I'm proud of what we've done. We still have more challenges to overcome. And I would like to also thank the Department of Ed because their ability to get those all of the devices out. We all, you know, there are still certain students who were not able to get them, but the idea that over 250,000 or close to 250,000 devices were delivered to students at the height of this pandemic is something they should be proud of. But when it comes to the instruction and reaching the students and helping the parents, that's where the teachers, the guidance counselors, all of the clinicians and the ther therapists, that's where they stood up and said, nothing is gonna get in our way, we're gonna figure this out. And that is what has happened here in New York City. And thank you again to Chairman Tra uh, Chair Traeger for all that you have done and you're very, very loud and advocate uh, for, on behalf of the children of New York City. Well, uh, President Mulgrew, I wanna thank you and begin by just saying that I consider uh, educators family, where this is mm -hmm. a family and uh, begin by just acknowledging the fact that we lost family members uh, yeah. to this pandemic. Um, and so when a lot of folks are asking about remote learning and how you mentioned how it's different, you know, depending upon school grade and experience, I just, I remind folks that educators are also human beings. Um, they have experienced loss of colleagues, they have experienced loss in their families. Uh, they are in many cases, the primary caretakers for families at home. And when people say schools are closed, I remind them that the work continues now in this, in this new setting. And I told people that when I was a new teacher, it would take me the entire summer to plan for the school year ahead. Teachers had a couple of days with, with no playbook, no guidebook. There was no Brooklyn College course for this, President Mulgrew, that I no took to, to prepare me, us for something like this. So. I absolutely applaud educators. They have always been essential workers. They are the great equalizers in our society. Question I have for you, for those educators, and I, everyone's been impacted, some more than others. How, how can we better support those educators who are experiencing trauma as well? We hear about kids and we know kids experience trauma. It's a real issue. But if you're a teacher, a guidance counselor, a power, someone, that has ex experienced loss in your school community and still working every day, but going through that trauma, how can we better support them uh, to make them stronger during this crisis, President Milberg? Thank you, and thank you so much for recognizing the stress and the anxiety and the loss that we have all faced here in terms of our UFT family. Um, it has been very, very difficult for us because of so many that we have lost. 
Um, our member assistance program is now uh, beyond anything we have ever thought it would need it to be. Uh, thank God we have so many clinicians who are volunteered. We now do law, uh, well, uh, the appropriate, we do group, uh, group therapy sessions now constantly, almost every day of the week. And we have over hundreds of volunteers as clinicians now helping us through this because it's not, it's the teachers now are working 10, 12, 14, 16 hour days, depending on the student's needs. Um, you know, we have a teacher who's doing off hour classes and she likes doing it because more than half of her students can't get on during the regular school day. So she's holding nighttime lessons with her with parents and students. And, you know, those there's thousands of those stories all across the city and the anxiety. And, and we see people are just driving themselves because of they need to try to figure out how, how to reach every student uh, that we're going to have to set up a system a more. It, it, it can't just be the union supplying all of this. Uh, we are thankful that the Office of Labor Relations just recently expanded their member assistance program for city workers, but we need to coordinate that better. But, you know, we're going into September and first and foremost, we think about what we need to do in terms of the challenges, social emotional challenges we're gonna face with our students. But we also know that that's part of what we're facing also. Uh, the strange phenomena is that when we actually go into a school building, we actually feel better. Uh, there is some uh, solace in seeing, you know, seeing your students and seeing each other. But I'm not sure exactly how we're going to face all of this at this moment. We're working on some bills in Albany to help certain families. But in the end, it's really going to take a long, uh, a long focused uh, therapy program to really help people uh, for all that they've dealt with. And thank you, President Munger. And, and before we let you go, I just want to note as someone that, again, was in the classroom, uh, I heard a lot from my colleagues and from advocates and from mm -hmm. about the, the need for teachers to get more support to adapt to this new setting that's going to be here for the time being. Um, some of my colleagues uh, refer to questions about what kind of PD is available to staff. What I want to, and this is where I'm going to put my my New York High School teacher hat on for a moment, yeah. uh, and I, I want the whole public social media world to hear me on this. The most effective professional development that I've ever received in my career was one that was led by teachers, mm -hmm. by teachers and for teachers through our teacher center at New York High School. Because when I was sent to professional developments in Manhattan, you know, many of the coffee and muffins were great, but the PDs were inadequate. When I learned from my colleagues and my teacher center, we were able to debrief, unpack, and speak amongst colleagues. And so the importance of teacher center, the importance of having a, a school-based support for educators to adapt to this, I cannot stress how more vital it is now more than ever. Would you agree, President Moker? I, 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 you have nailed that point because all of the different educational platforms, the different companies we use for meeting places, because they're not educational platforms. Some are, some are not. Uh, they're looking at us right now and trying to figure out what we have learned. So the idea, I mean, the idea, we don't want to see a consultant coming near us right now <laughs> because we know more we know more about this than they do. They might have designed a platform, but they've never actually utilized it in a remote setting like the way we are doing it right now. And teachers have designed things and come up with new applications that we are constantly being questioned about by these different companies. And the idea, and, and, and I tell my staff this, and I, I, you know, I tell the Department of Ed this, Yesterday, I did a two-hour focus group with teachers from different grade levels about what have we learned and where do we want to take this. Phenomenal ideas. How do you flip a classroom? How do you make sure that when you're dealing with English uh, as a new language students that you're setting up different times with different translation pieces already loaded into your system? I mean, the stuff was off the chart, which they would teach. How are you going to teach us about something you have never done? And, and, and this is my constant frustration. It's the theme I'm always talking about, but now more than ever, what we have done here in New York City, no one has ever done this. So 
you can't come teach us. You can help us organize in terms of, all right, this can work. How do we get this word out here? But in the end, your greatest resource are the folks that are doing this work because anyone who's not in our shoes has not done this work. So what would what relevance could they bring to us in terms of and they might be able to tell us about their technology, but they won't tell they can't tell us on how to actually use it to reach each and every student because they're all so different. So I completely agree with you. And thank God we had the teacher center, especially in this mess, because without them, we wouldn't be at a level with uh, our attendance and everything being so hard. And and President Ogre, I leads me to my final point and final observation with you that. You know, we hear a lot about Bill Gates and a lot about all these reimagining things. Uh, I, I want to tell you, technology can only supplement instruction. It can never, ever, ever replace instruction. These are tools. We have a tool belt as, as educators. It is never the educator. We are the teachers. We are the licensed professionals. As I told to my colleagues, if you have a cold, you go to a doctor. You don't go to Bill Gates to tell you is a Microsoft app. So. Uh, I, I wanna just end by asking you this question. Would you agree with me that there is no full reopening of New York without a safe reopening of schools? There are 50,000 50, task forces being created, but education is, can no longer be seen as, as a silo. It, it, this is where kids are getting food. This is where kids are getting education, getting health healthcare needs met, health clinics, social workers, social support, Every school should be a community school, and there is no reopening of New York without a safe plan to reopen the school system. Would you agree, President Mobley? Absolutely. I wrote an op-ed a couple of weeks ago saying specifically we have to be able to open the schools because it's, a, it's the centerpiece of each uh, community, each neighborhood. But at the same time, we now have to open them in a safe manner. Teachers, have to, teachers are reinventing their profession now on a weekly basis. Uh, they have to drive that conversation. That can't come from anywhere else. Uh, but we know that what just has happened over the last nine or 10 weeks, parents and teachers working together, really heavy duty, nasty stuff. Uh, so many people, which so many families faced. And if you were able to hear the different conversations I've had with parents and teachers and talking about how they were each other's support system. That is something that has happened in every single neighborhood in New York City all throughout this pandemic. So it is clear we need our schools open, but we have to make sure it's done safe and they can no longer be thought about as a political, uh, a political decision. It has to be the right decision. Well, President Mulgrew, I want to thank you for your courage because you speak up uh, for, not just for the members. You, you speak up for kids, their families, and you always taught me uh, when I was a teacher, it's about the kids. Just yeah. the kids are always the most important thing. And thank you for your courage speaking up. I know that at times, you know, we make waves in this in this business, but you always never forget we're fighting for the kids in our communities. So thank you and the entire UFT for your sacrifice, for your work, and for your courage throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Remaining on panel one, we'll next hear from William D. Time starts now. Thank you, City Council. Good afternoon. My name is William Deep, and I'm a member of Team Take Charge and a student at one of the city's specialized high schools. I'm so grateful for the resources I've been given to succeed. I'm so thankful for the opportunities that my teachers have given me to expand my education and continue doing what I love. But my story is different from the students that go to, go, that go to the school two floors above mine. My story is different from the students that go to school two blocks away from my school. My story is different from students from all over the city. This is because high school admission screens are built to divide us. I understand that the SHSAT is a state law, but I am frustrated and confused as to why Mayor de Blasio and the Department of Education continue to support racist and classist screens used at hundreds of other middle and high schools that are within the city's direct control. I, as a student who sees the harm firsthand of current admission screens, and begging for you all to help put an end to these discriminatory screens that quote unquote, sort us like socks. At the end of the day, screens should be used to block out bugs from a home, not students from the education we all deserve. So unless you want to consider students quote unquote bugs, then we ask you city council to join teens take charge in dozens of other social justice organizations 
in demanding that the DOE and end the use of these discriminatory screens once and for all. I know that I know this is technically not a Q&A, but I ask the council members on the call to please indicate with a thumbs up or thumbs down. Will you support the elimination of admission screens to create a more equitable school system? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Shadavia Burnett. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Well, afternoon now. I hope these past couple of months have treated you okay as you are all trying to cope, cope with COVID-19. My name is Day. I'm 16. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm representing the New York City Blue New York Civil Liberties Union Teen Activist Project TAP alongside the next panelist by group. I just want to take the time out to thank you for listening to my testimony as well as everybody else's. COVID-19 has rocked the boat. Many could agree with me. It has changed routines, canceled opportunities, and for some has changed lives for the worst. For me, it has been hard, but fortunately I've been getting by. However, I do have my hardships as well. The transition was sudden and unexpected. Now learning math is harder and the quantity of work is overwhelming. I'm a visual person. If you want me to pick, on, pick, pick up on lessons fast, I need something I can use, something I can see, touch, and use to be in front of me. Otherwise, as teachers usually say they don't, you're talking for your own health. My status at high school is tricky. I'm technically a sophomore, but I'm classified as a junior because I'm graduating next year meaning I have to cram regents, SAT, credits, extra, extracurricular, extracurricular activities all in three years. Now, because of this pandemic, question upon question overcomes me and fear accompanies me. Questions like, will this affect my early graduation? Will I be prepared enough for the SAT? All of my credits will be calculated correctly. All of these things come into my mind when I have many other things to worry about. You may be thinking, you'll be all right you'll still have another year to graduate. But for me, it's different. My parents are ready to move to Georgia, meaning once I graduate and go to college, they can live their life. My dad is 65 and working two jobs and my mom is working. At this age, they should live where they want and do what they want. COVID impacts me and has great implications on my family's future. So please keep in mind, families are struggling and it may not, may not be the way you think. Thank you again for the city council for taking this time out to hear my testimony. I meant. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ooh. Babu Gay. Time Thank starts you. now. Good morning, every good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Day. Um, my name is Babu, and I'm here as the leader in the New York Civil Liberties Union's Teen Activist Project. I'm a senior at the Bronx High School of Science, which gives me a privilege I unfortunately do not share with the vast majority of youth in my community, as my school gives me a unique sense of safety and security at school. For most students, however, that look like me and come from neighborhoods like me, this is not the case. There's a rightful fear of the school to prison pipeline, which comes in the form of suspensions, police and metal detectors, and dominates the learning environment for them. The transition into remote learning has affected these students the most. During this pandemic, students have lost access to a trusted adult in their schools, which may put them at higher risk for dangerous interactions with police in a time where the NYPD has been unfairly authorized to enforce social distancing, not to mention the event of a potential return to even more heavily police schools this fall. And while I'm on the subject, I didn't write this, but I think it'd be ignorant to acknowledge the targeting of minorities um, without saying rest in peace to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other victims of such targeting in our communities. Anyways, my journey leading to Bronx Science, what some might call an escape attempt from the school to prison pipeline, begins with a trip to the social work at my struggling underfunded middle school, not three blocks from where I lived in the Bronx. Being able to sit down with her and connect fostered a connection that brought light to the unfair barriers uh, to a quality education and what steps I would need to take to push past these barriers. The next September, I found myself in a specialized high school with 2% of my class looking like me. I say all this to say the students that need to be able to connect with educators most and have the most untapped potential are the most under-resourced. You all have a chance to help dismantle the school to prison pipeline by making sure we hold on to what little resources we do have and allow for us to expand on them now that it's been shown. Schools can afford to give their students laptops and tablets, and companies can afford to offer students that need Wi-Fi. All these social services we were told impossible have been proven otherwise, so what better time to shape the future now so that my neighbor's son can end up with a seat at one of these meetings and not be in and out of the precinct? The DOE must bridge the gap so ev evidently present in our education system and acknowledge- fired. Okay, sorry. You can finish your thought. You could finish your final yeah, thought, please. Thank you. Um, um, make sure access to these resources is not only expanded, but here to stay. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you. And the final panelist on panel number one will be Donald Nesbitt. Time starts now. Good afternoon, um, Councilman Traeger. Uh, thank you to Speaker Johnson. Um, I saw the public advocate was on earlier. Thank you for being an advocate and thank you for your kind comments towards the local 372 members who are on the front lines at this time. So during this time, school food um, workers, school crossing guards are on the front lines. Um, during this time, the unions had to fight for, the union has had to fight uh, for these workers to receive proper PPE from the beginning. Um, it took us weeks um, in order to get the proper PPE. We've even purchased some PPE on our own to make sure that these workers were safe. We thank the various members of the city council who did donate um, masks and different things for the workers during that time. But these workers, after anxiety and fear, have rise to the occasion um, and are serving and protecting by crossing families and maintaining safety. They're also serving uh, to date up to almost 30 million meals have been served to families um, across the city during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what they uh, demand of the city administration at this time, and I say the workers, uh, because we don't demand, we've gotten a phone calls from workers who demand that they get receive recognition and respect for the work that they're doing at this time, um, not to take away from any other worker, but they feel like they're not equal with everyone else, especially in the press conferences and things that are happening. You don't hear the school food worker and the school crossing guard who are actually maintaining the safety and serving um, our families. But policy changes have uh, during this time um, at the DOE also put workers at risk. There were 700 uh, workers who didn't receive a paycheck for multiple pay periods um, on the school food side and, and throughout the DOE. Time and has expired. Uh, you can, you can uh, finish, please. Okay. And, and that has caused a challenge because those same families are part of the vulnerable families in society um, who we are trying to protect. Our parent coordinators make sure that the necessary equipment gets to the parents, but that has been challenging, um, especially um, when they're trying to locate students during this time who may have lost a family member, and that is their reason for not um, logging on. I saw that you asked that Councilman Traeger earlier. So I called a few parent coordinators and they said they do have uh, families who for whatever reason are not logging on. Either they don't understand, they're not tech savvy. The parents also have special needs and they're not able to assist the kids. So those parent coordinators are taking hours um, to train those families. In some cases it works. In other cases, they're sending packages to families. The school aides, the family workers are also contacting families during this time. I mean, connecting with them, even volunteering to be in the rec centers um, if they can. Uh, we have 270 sappers for 1.1 million kids. Um, that's about 5,000 per one sappers. Uh, sappers are definitely going to be needed at this time as they are um, presenting to students virtually right now to help them uh, and prevent them from going on drugs or substance abuse or anything of that nature. But going into the future, and I'll wrap up with this, going into the future, um, what we see in opening schools, we need safe PPE, we need temperatures to be taken, we need wrapped up cleaning protocols um, and public no notifications so the public feels safe entering the buildings. We need um, policies that maintain social distancing. We need to provide mental health monitoring for staff and students, including um, enough sappers to go around. As mentioned, there's not enough. And um, those are some of the things that we need moving forward. And I thank you and President um, Sean D. Francois. He thanks you. He sends his greetings and his love to the members of the council. Thank you. Thank you for everything uh, for actually being able to be heard before you today. I, I, I want to say thank you uh, to you and your entire brave, courageous me members who have experienced loss, who are experienced pain, and who continue to put their lives on the line. I mean, I, I shared earlier that I saw many pictures on social media on Memorial Day of people waking up in the morning, you know, preparing their, their grills and their barbecue when your members were working on Memorial Day at sites across the city to make sure that no child, no family 
goes hungry. And they do this every day with great pride and service, knowing that they're putting their lives on the line. And they were always essential workers. And I visited uh, one of the schools recently, and I told the workers there that politicians, including myself, it is not enough for us to just to say thank you to them. We have to say thank you when it comes to the budget. We have to say thank you when it comes to pay and benefits and protection and PPE. That's the least we can do for keeping our, our, our city and our society functioning and because this is the safety net. It's interesting that schools right now are the lifeline uh, serving communities that would otherwise have very di great difficulties getting these types of food and masks and, and other items which are, are available at the school food sites. So I just wanna say thank you for just literally being the life and death safety net for, for communities in my district and across the entire city of New York. And it is not enough to say thank you. We, we and I, I mentioned before President Mulgrew that a safe reopening of the school system that includes your members, that includes making sure that we have adequate staffing uh, to continue to serve our communities. Um, and so I, I, just, I just point out to my colleagues that if schools don't fully reopen and if parents don't have confidence in schools fully reopening, there is no reopening of New York. And so we have to get this right. And that includes Local 372, that includes DC 37 and the extraordinary members and the counselors, the SAPIS counselors, who provide also life and debt support for those kids who need help the most. So God bless you, thank you for your service. And we, we have to have your back. I mean, this is, to me, when it comes to schools, this is hands off. That's the, the, that's the, that's the message to, 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 to the leader. So thank you again, Mr. Nesbitt, thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any council members that have any questions, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Seeing none, that concludes panel one. Thank you. We will now turn to panel two. To remind all council members, we will hear an entire panel's testimony first. If you have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand feature and you will be called on at the conclusion of the panel's testimony. Panel number two will be Issa Grumbach-Bloom, Marlon Mendiata-Cameron, Ann Cook, and Ellen McHugh. We will start with Issa. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Issa Grumbach-Bloom, and I'm a sophomore at Millennium Brooklyn High School, as well as a policy member at Teams Took Charge. I'm here to ask you to fight education budget cuts and to fight for the elimination of discriminatory admission screens next year. The proposed budget for 2021 cut hundreds of millions of dollars from the New York City public school system and 169 million from the Department of Youth and Community Development. In this pandemic, 16% of students are not participating in remote learning. That's 176,000 students, larger than the entire Philadelphia school district. In our segregated and inequitable school system, these cuts would take even more funding from students that need it the most. I don't know how many times we students need to say this. We need more counselors and more social workers in our schools, now more than ever. It's a simple equation. Get rid of NYPD and metal detectors. Add counselors and social workers. I want to talk about one more issue that doesn't cost any money but is absolutely critical right now. The Teens Take Charge Education on Screen campaign calls for the elimination of discriminatory admission screens, which systematically segregate students. During this time especially, these academic screens will only measure students' access to resources, not their potential. Plus, eliminating screens is a cost-free way to more equitably distribute resources across schools, with more academic, socioeconomic, and racial diversity that would come from the elimination of discriminatory admission screens. There will be less disparities between schools and more consistency in things like PTA funding. It is so important that we make funding our public education system a priority and that we eliminate screens this year. Otherwise, the existing inequities and segregation in our schools will only grow. Thank you. Thank you, and next we will hear from Marlon. Time starts now. Good afternoon and hello. My name is Marlon Mendieta Camargo, and I am a junior at Midwood High School and a member of the policy team at Teen Safe Charge. 
My school, Midwood High School, is filled with about 4,000 students, and it saddens me to hear that the next year there will only be one class of AP, Envir I, sorry, AP Environmental Science, one class of AP Physics, and who knows how many less in other departments. Although I may not know what is going on inside your offices, I know what is going on inside my school's hallways. I know that there are crowded hallways that make it difficult to get to class on time. I know that there are ambitious students who are driven for higher education. I know that students complain about not getting individual attention because of the class sizes of 30 or more. I know a lot of students who want to take AP classes and want to go to school despite the fact that we may complain about it. I, I, I'm asking you that you place more funding in students now, now in a time where students need extra help now in a time where students are becoming more worried about family financial problems than test scores. Now in a time where you and I can see the disparities uh, between communities becoming much more evident. The DOE has been trying and we see it. The distribution of iPads was something. And as a member of a low income community, I am so grateful. But are you going to stop there? Students are going to need even more investments the next school year. So it's time to get our priorities straight. Stop investing in the police and security and send that money to classrooms where it belongs. Thank you. And next we will hear from Ann Cook. Time starts now. I wanna thank Chairman Traeger for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Ann Cook, the Executive Director of the New York Performance Standards Consortium. Why is it that the DOE has projected that more than 180,000 New York City students will need summer school this year, a more than 400% increase over last year's number of children? Why did so many children fail to succeed in online learning? It's not only because of equipment shortage or the lack of access to a stable internet connection, though both could use serious attention as we've heard. What we know now after eight weeks of online instruction is that remote learning is simply no substitute for person-to-person -person teaching. Yes, yes, in the crisis caused by COVID-19, it might have been better than nothing, but it utterly failed thousands of children and only partially served those who had managed to show up enough to be counted. Given this, isn't it fair to ask at a time when the mayor has proposed a future of fiscal austerity, why are we repeating what just failed? In a centrally managed online summer school undertaken without the benefit of social workers, guidance counselors, and teachers that are familiar with the children that they're going to serve, using the same instructional scenario that apparently failed, isn't this a good time, is this a really good use of GOE funds? Couldn't the dollars allocated for a trial run of a centrally controlled system to slide into remote learning in September be better used to pay, in, to pay per session to teachers to plan curriculum and figure out how to support children as they return to real time school under, under, new, those, under new conditions and social workers and counselors as well. As exhausted homeschooling parents will tell anyone prepared to listen, what their kids miss most are the interactions with teachers and friends, the social fabric of schools, the learning that comes from being with peers in real time, with whom to exchange ideas and thoughts and with grownups who can challenge, support, tease and respond to them as human beings. Observers have called attention to the disturbing consequences of social isolation and pressures brought on by online expectations. Experts at NYU's Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry tell us that our children face an unprecedented wave of stress and anxiety, unlike anything New Yorkers have ever seen before. So while we may give well-deserved kudos to teachers like the, those in the consortium, who against all odds explored new ways to reach and teach their students, what we're told over and over is that most success stories were built on pre-existing conditions. That is strong, powerful relations between students and their teachers and healthy communities where students could relate to and learn from one another. As Joshua emphasized, children depend on these in-school experiences and real life relationships to become healthy human beings. So I urge the city council, do not assume that the road to fiscal solvency resides in turning over the education of our children to remote learning. Technology certainly has its place, but it must never replace schools as essential learning communities. Downgrading person-to-person -person contact will have serious consequences for our democracy. Thank you. I appreciate you, Dr. Cook, and I could not agree more. Thank you for your, for your spot-on uh, words, and uh, I know that you speak with great 
respect and admiration for true education. And so thank you for your leadership and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Time starts um, now. Next we'll hear from Ellen McHugh. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ellen McHugh and I am the co-chair of the Citywide Council on Special Education and a member of the steering committee of the Education Council Consortium. But today I'm speaking for myself as we haven't finalized our presentation. We are parents of students currently receiving a vast range of online remote learning services. Some have been given devices immediately, others have had to wait for weeks and deal with paperwork packets. Our goal during the normal school year is to bring research-based strategies to our students to enable them to have a meaningful education. In this abnormal year, we are wondering what's next, synchronous or non-synchronous education? It is a mystery to most families. Will the proposed 177,000 students include students with special needs who do not have extended school year on their IEPs? Will there be appropriate staff available during the summer program, during the summer program to provide adapted research-based methodologies that can have a positive effect on a student? In some cases, remote learning can be a positive for some children who are visual learners. It is not always the case. The real impact of learning comes from the relationship between a student, his or her cohorts, and the teacher who brings education to them. We, right now, as parents, are the primary educators in this situation and have little or no supports on a consistent and helpful basis. We are only consulted after the fact when we are presented with an already created program of service. Time expired. We'd appreciate your assistance in being included actually and factually in the development of any summer program or any opening in September. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Sue, we'll turn to council member questions, starting with the chair. Uh, thank you. I just I had one quick uh, follow-up. I, I don't know if Dr. Cook left or if anyone from the consortium is still there about how their assessments hand out uh, for this school year in lieu of the regents of the consortiums use what's called the performance-based assessment tests. Can anyone speak about that? I'm not sure if Dr. Cook already left. Uh, if, if not, I, we could follow up with Dr. Cook uh, off, offline. Um, and uh, I do not have any further questions at this time. Okay, thank you, panel two. We will now turn to panel three. Leticia Reyes, Veronica Flores, and Jose Rivera. We will start with Leticia Reyes. Time starts now. Hi. This is Leticia Reyes. I am parent from PIS IS 157, District 14. So, as you know, we have a lot of things happening in the schools, but um, I was PTA uh, president for four years, um, SLT member, um, Title I vice president. So I would like to know if we can do something like as uh, SLT members, uh, if we can do something for the parents to help the parents or or do you know planning to do something with the SLT members or any other organization from the school? Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Veronica Flores. Time starts now. Hi, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to voice our opinions on this forum. My name is Veronica Flores and I am a parent of a fifth grader, member of the SLT of PS15, which was a former Title I school, a product of the public school system in District 4 East Harlem, and a member of Place NYC. Although I appreciate the strides made in school to roll out remote learning for our students, I must agree that the social emotional aspect that live instruction provides is lacking from school to school. 
I believe engagement of students is important when learning new material, which is not optimal with stagnant worksheets and pre-recorded videos. I understand that there are challenges with tools and availability of some students, but there will be no adjustment if there's no consistency. Especially with almost everything being unknown, I think it's time to give consistency to our students as we do in physical schools in this new remote setting. I am also concerned with the conversations I have experienced regarding the new grading policies for grades K through eight. As much as I understand that there are students who are unable to participate in remote learning through no fault of their own, I believe the complete abolishment of grades is demotivating for those students who go above and beyond to those challenges to complete the work assigned on a daily basis. Those students who handwrite essays and post a picture to offset a lack of keyboards, or those who wake up a bit earlier than their families to get some assignments done before their chaos begins. We have all been affected by this pandemic in one way or another, but I fear that without a better establishment of accountability and expectations, students cannot be adequately ensured that they are prepared for the next step of their learning journey. It's also troubling to continually, continuously hear black and brown communities portrayed as more as incapable than the fact that even before this pandemic, there are no opportunities for those students to excel above their bare minimum in their communities. Therefore, we lose them to charters, private and parochial institutions, and only those who can take advantage of those options. For, more, for many of these students in these communities, educational successes and merit acceptance to highly rigorous schools are the only method of getting out and improving their social economic situations. And we should not forget them when making decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And we will finally hear from Jose Rivera. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jose Rivera. I am a community school director with Good Shepherd Services at Junior High School 292 in East New York for the past three years. My testimony will focus on how community schools are supporting communities in the Bronx and Brooklyn during this pandemic. Good Shepherd is a community school provider at six community schools in the Bronx and Brooklyn, serving over 2,000 students. Good Shepherd, good Shepherd has as recent as last week in my school, 292 has distributed 65 computers to special ed students and refugee and immigrant students from Bangladesh, Yemen, Central and South America. These populations have historically been hard to reach by the DOE, whether because of the language barrier or the fear of sharing personal information with the authorities. As the CSD, it is my role to connect students, families and school administration to resources in East New York, our school has been collaborating with Good Shepherd Services in the stop to connect parents to emergency food stamps, unemployment benefits, access to food pantries, housing attorneys, among other social services. At Boys and Girls High School, my colleague leads the social emotional support with Wellness Wednesday. Since April 7, our community school director at PS297 in Bedside and his team has given 900 food packages resulting in over 3,000 people served. At Bushwick Leaders High School, my colleague has been providing college prep sessions and virtual college tours. My team and I call students to check on how they are doing with remote learning at, and home life. In the last two months, of, the last two weeks of March, we made 250 phone calls of, um, of the last week. Um, we have made 2,000 calls to our students and parents since the remote learning began. Our work strives in the fact that we have been able to build trusting and lasting relationship with our students and families. We, at our school, I conducted a survey of 150 parents and we found that 43% of them are food insecurity or they can, afford, they can afford the rent. Another 30% of the participants have shared that they have experienced anxiety, depression, or emotional distress. The other, um, the three top um, services that they need are emergency food stamps, cash assistance, and employment and career development. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Good Shepherd remains committed to support and, and ensure that students' need, needs are met and they have a conducive learning environment and that we provide the support families need to ease the pain they suffered before, before the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up question to Mr. Rivera, and I appreciate your service. Uh, in, in, in your great organization. Um, I, 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 if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that you conducted, your group con did its own survey to students and there were some questions on the survey that related to the trauma and to the financial situation or burdens that students are facing. Is that correct? Yes, that is, that's correct. 
And did you receive any feedback from parents or from students that uh, any of these questions they felt were were insensitive in, in any way? No, I, I have not. Uh, in fact, I have done outreach. I have um, delivered computers and gift cards myself in East New York. And we have always been welcomed. I we have a strong relationship with my parents. Well, I appreciate that because I, I, I noticed at the DOE that their survey questions uh, lacked certain uh, you know, topics that I think we need to have a better understanding of, of course, in very sensitive and delicate ways. But I do think, for example, it's okay to ask a student if they have now been forced to work to support their family during this pandemic if someone lost their job. Uh, and because that is the case in, across many communities, in some cases, the parent is an essential worker that cannot provide that one-on-one -on -one support for the child at home. So I think, and there are kids who have lost uh, loved ones and family. And so these are questions that give us a better detailed picture of the trauma and the hardships that our kids are facing. So I thank you and your organization for really addressing the whole needs of the child not just the academic piece. So I, I thank you so much for, for your work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel three. Uh, we will move to panel four. Before I do, I just wanna remind everyone that for panelists, you will notice a letter and a number next to your name. This will let you know what panel you are on and you will be able to see where you are in the queue throughout the hearing. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. If any council members have a question at any point for any individual panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You will be called uh, in the order with which you raised your hands at the conclusion of a panel uh, in testifying in full. For panel four, we have Randy Levine, Lori Podvesker, Andrew Gerst, and Maggie Maroff. Ms. Maroff, if you are having issues with audio, we can circle back to you. So we will start with Randy Levine. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Randy Levine and I'm the Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. We recognize the immense challenge of quickly transitioning a school system of 1.1 million students to remote learning and appreciate the diligent work of DOE staff and educators. Yet like the pandemic itself, School closures have had a disproportionate impact on historically more marginalized communities and have magnified existing inequities. While schools have been closed, AFC has helped hundreds of families. We're concerned about students who face technology barriers, students with disabilities who are struggling without the supports they typically receive at school, students who are not engaged in remote learning due to mental health needs going unaddressed, students whose parents speak a language other than English and are having difficulty helping their children access and complete assignments in English, students living in shelters who lack a quiet spot to study, students in juvenile detention who have not had access to live instruction or regular access to computers and related services, and older youth caring for younger siblings or working to help support their families, leaving them little time for schoolwork. While we have many recommendations, I will focus my limited time on just a few. First, since summer school will be entirely remote, the DOE must redouble its outreach efforts and provide individualized support to families of students who are not regularly engaging in remote learning, determining individual barriers and implementing solutions, whether that means helping with a technology fix, providing instruction and assignments in the family's home language, connecting older students to an SYEP stipend so they can earn money and course credit, connecting students with mental health providers offering telehealth services, or offering a seat at the Regional Enrichment Center. Second, the DOE should begin implementing creative solutions this summer to help address gaps. For example, as students are no longer limited to the staff at their schools, we urge the DOE to offer one-on-one -on -one or small group evidence-based literacy instruction to students using the universal literacy coaches and IEP teachers whom the DOE has already trained. I'm inspired. Finally, the DOE must plan to get students who have fallen behind back on track when school buildings reopen. To that end, we are counting on the city council to reject proposed cuts to school budgets and work with federal, state, and city officials to ensure our schools have the resources they need so that the current crisis does not have lifelong consequences for a generation of children. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Randy. Next, we'll hear from Lori. Hi, my name is Lori Padvesker, and I lead the policy work at Include NYC. Thank you, Chairman Traeger and the rest of the entire Committee on Education for holding this important hearing. 
Include NYC has worked with hundreds and thousands of families since our founding 37 years ago, helping them navigate the complex special education service and support system. We testify today with deep respect and gratitude to the city, the Department of Education, school administrators, teachers, related service providers, counselors, parent coordinators, and all other school staff on their commitment to ensuring our 1.1 million students including nearly 300,000 students with disabilities continue to learn during the pandemic and related school closures. However, during the last 10 weeks since remote learning began, hundreds of parents of children who have suspected or known disabilities have called our helpline looking for individual help. A thousand more families have attended our online workshops, live stream discussions with experts, webinars, and downloaded related resources on our website. Persistent issues and areas of need include difficulties accessing remote learning. Students and families' most pressing needs right now include health, food, housing, and financial insecurity. Many students do not have internet service or a tablet or laptop to which to access school and class-based learning platforms. Other students do not know how to fix technological problems themselves, and often their parents don't know how to use and troubleshoot them either. At home, some students may not have adequate space or the physical environment needed to support productive learning and they are not benefiting from the social and behavioral support typically available at school. There's been limited or no live instruction. The absence of specialized instruction makes coursework inaccessible for many of our students. Parents are concerned about regression in knowledge and skills and do not understand how their child will make up missed content. Related services are necessary for students with disabilities to meet IEP goals, but many sessions have not been delivered to students. We have many, much more to say, a lot of recommendations, uh, but we'll just say two, which we think is really important, which is that schools should develop plans for compensatory services for students now before school buildings reopen. And the city should offer special education support and services during the summer to all students with 10 month IEPs who are not meeting their IEP goals, which is known as extended school year services. This is different than traditional summer school, and we hope that the Department of Education does a really good job communicating this to families right now. So parents speak with their child's teachers and their school administrators right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Next, we will hear from Andrew Gerst. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Gerst, and I'm a special education attorney and advocate at Mobilization for Justice, a legal services organization for low-income New Yorkers. I would like to briefly provide city council with some data on what we have seen with students with disabilities. These students are supposed to be receiving related services such as counseling or physical therapy via remote learning. If you remember one thing, please remember this, that 42% of families we spoke with reported not receiving at least one IEP service via remote learning at all. After COVID-19 forced schools to close, our office spent weeks reaching out to many clients with IEPs or individualized education programs. We were able to have in-depth conversations with a representative sample of 33 of those clients as a kind of spot check. Of these 33 families, 14 of them reported that at least one IEP mandated service such as counseling was not being provided at all. That is a rate of 42%. Some things have gone relatively well. For instance, only six out of 33 families reported having trouble receiving a working device. That translates to 18%, but many other things did not go well. Of the 14 families not receiving IEP services, in four cases, the school had out-of-date contact information for the family. One school reported that they did not know they had to offer physical therapy as a rem remote learning related service at all. 27 families have students with counseling on the IEP. And tragically, during this time when counseling is particularly necessary, nine of these 27 families reported that counseling was not happening. That is a rate of 33%. We are grateful to the DOE for moving mountains to help educate students with disabilities remotely. However, we want to ensure that counseling and other related services are being provided. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And are we able to get Maggie Moroff? Time starts now.
Okay, we will come back to Maggie. Uh, that concludes this panel. Chair, do you have any questions? Uh, just very quickly, if either Lori or uh, the, the, the attorney, I, I just uh, took some notes about the numbers I heard. Um, are there uh, specific service areas that are uh, a common theme that are not being met uh, during the pandemic? Uh, when we're hearing about certain services not being provided, which service areas are there? Do you have any data on that? Um, so we are hearing a lot from families of kids in uh, preschool who are transitioning to kindergarten and Randy or Maggie can talk more about that. But a lot of evaluations aren't happening, which is holding up placements. And do need to acknowledge that uh, sometimes it is the parent's choice because they don't feel it will be uh, meaningful. And a lot of times it is not. Um, and, and so that is a big problem. Um, and independent related services, it is problematic that kids and families are not uh, receiving help on how to make accommodations to the curriculum so kids can access it. And the Department of Education is doing a, a, a better job than in the past right now, um, sharing information with families, but we have a long way to go on what that looks like. And anecdotally, uh, from what you're hearing, live instruction makes a difference? Yes, no, explain. Um, I think it's a combination and really contingent on the kid and the, and the other things that people brought up in the past in terms of to what extent is the child independent and to what extent can the parents intervene to support their kids. Um, I will say as a parent myself of a, of a 17 year old in District 75 program, there is barely any live instruction and it is really, um, I understand why, but at the same time, the uh, social isolation that is happening as a result of that for, for my child is going to hinder uh, his skills in being independent in the future. And so there's a lot of different aspects of that other than just the social connection right there and then. It's the skills. Excellent observation. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all. Thank you to this panel. Uh, we will now call panel five. Maud Marone, Tasvia Rahman, and Emily Hellstrom. We will first start with Maud. Why? Oh, Times. Uh, Time starts now. Sorry, nor have we heard, um, you know, why they need to have a one size fits all policy. Um, that is not, um, something that I think makes a whole lot of sense for, uh, you know, for a city as large as ours. So um, I don't know, Matthew, if you want to add anything else in. Yeah, sure. Um, we have a very uh, different, closer, I'll say, perspective, um, more specifically from a lot of feedback that you guys received directly. Um, We're going to turn to Tasvir Rahman right now. We will come back to Maud later. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, my name is Tasvir Rahman. I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Thank you so much for holding this very important hearing today, Councilmember Traeger. Um, today, I will actually be testifying on behalf of Erica a youth leader and a current public high school student at CACF's Asian American Student Advocacy Project. Hi, I'm Erica and I'm an Asian Pacific American here to testify for ASA. That's right, I, an Asian, am asked to speak about the Asian perspective, the Asian experience. People wanna hear about how it feels to be that smart kid in the corner, scribbling away at math problems. People wanna hear about how it's like to be the white man's best friend. We're comedic relief in the 90s sitcoms. We make comfort food that hopefully slides down easier than the racial slurs thrown at us. Okay, I'll start over. I'm Erica, an Asian Pacific American, an Asian Pacific American. I'm not here to talk about what it means to be Asian or to have my bloodstained existence tokenized or answer that question of, are Asians really people of color? Because truthfully, the world's confusion is contagious. People seem to think that Asians are only one thing or maybe they only wanna hear one thing. 
speak up, my white teacher eggs me on. And so I do. I speak my mother's trauma. I speak coping with suicidal ideation as my teacher hands back zero after zero. I speak being trapped in a school with white peers and feeling like not even a person compared to their brown hair and blue eyes and interesting lives articulated in perfect English. I speak lies to my friends and parents that the failing grade that DOE is now calling an incomplete was actually just a printing error. The system tells us to focus on the numbers. The numbers will get you far. Our parents who've had to adapt to the system tells us we're only numbers to the people here, so polish them. People say numbers don't lie. Good, smart students get good grades and thereby entitled to the city's bulk of resources. The rest of us are lucky. I'm expired. This is the logic of our school system and the logic of my parents. Not here to take risks. I'd like the people who think that all APAs are thriving in this system to meet my friends who have been condemned to the label of bad Asian. I like them to meet my friends who feel disengaged from academics, especially now, and prefer to play ball, but at the park, not at their underfunded schools. I'd like them to see the glasses shattering in families over a report card on top of frozen pizza dinners and the stress of essential work during this time. See how it feels to be rejected by the city and your community at the same time, by those who ignore factors like language access, poverty, and mental health. COVID-19 has made it clear, made it loud and clear that our school system is full of inequities. More than ever before, students are slipping through the cracks like ghosts. As immigrants, on top of worrying about their schoolwork and dealing with poverty, in a system full of language barriers and devoid of cultural competence, many APA youth are their parents' translators, their siblings' teachers, and more. Yet we are here and committed to working with our fellow students of color, immigrant students, and marginalized students for equitable access to resources and opportunities, because truthfully, we need it too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Emily Helstrom. Time starts now. Thank you so much. It's so difficult to follow that beautiful testimony. Um, my name is Emily Hellstrom, and I sit on the CEC for District 2, and I chair the Students with Disabilities Committee. Uh, we've been meeting monthly since September, and hundreds of parents have joined our sessions to support each other, um, share resources, and basically lament at the fact that um, it is so difficult to have um, a student in the system um, who is suffering with dyslexia, ADHD, anxiety, just to name a few. Um, since remote learning has started, we have had um, two meetings um, with uh, over 100 people in attendance. Um, and we have heard from so many parents that remote learning is literally leaving these students behind. Um, if you cannot read, if you cannot sit still, if you don't have a parent there at all times, the wheels are coming off the bus. Um, teaching um, is delivered in, is the teaching that is delivered is not consistent across classes, across grades, and even across schools. Um, different students respond to different uh, uh, remote learning, um, excuse me, different remote learning supports, but um, very often it, there is just a check-in in the morning and the rest is left up to parents. Um, I would urge the DOE to offer supports over the summer to make them available for all students um, who have IEPs and frankly, any students who want them. Um, we need proven OG supports available. Um, they could be paid for by DOE with, and um, there have been many that have pr been proven to have tremendous success. Um, lastly, in the fall, I urge the DOE to put into place science-based reading and writing programs that are explicit, multi-sensory and systematic to be sure that we don't lose another minute educating these children. Thank you so much. Council member, do you have any questions for this panel? Their testimony was powerful and informative enough and I thank them for their service. Thank you. All right, thank you to this panel. We'll get ready to call the next one. The next panel will be Debbie Mayer, Anthony Tassi, Melinda Lee and Ashley Sawyer. We will start with Debbie Mayer. Time starts now. Thank you for hosting this meeting and inviting our testimony. Today, I'm representing all struggling readers as a Columbia Community Scholar researching poor literacy instruction and its connection to social ills. There is a literacy crisis underlying the COVID-19 health crisis. 
literacy is a widely recognized determinant of health outcomes and associated with many indices of academic, social, vocational, and economic success. But with 73% of New York State eighth graders are not reading proficiently at eighth grade levels. And although we do not have literacy tests for voting, clearly our ballot initiatives and informa information that you need to read to understand them or a candidate's position require literacy skills. Struggling readers are disenfranchised. I have testified in other hearings about the dyslexia to prison pipeline and poor literacy instruction and my son's journey in the public school system from an illiterate fourth grader to a specialized dyslexia school to Bard High School early college. Since there is no connection between dyslexia and intelligence and many are excluded from the private remediation, I see elite school segregation as a symptom of poor literacy instruction as well. Let's see if we can actually solve the crisis systemically rather than continue to poke at it and prolong it. Can we take advantage of remote learning to find our struggling readers in all schools and offer them the best literacy instruction via the internet? During the COVID-19 spring, NESI, an evidence-based reading curriculum usually meant for use with teachers, offered free subscriptions to districts, teachers, and families nationally. The results from online learning with NESI were quite remarkable, with students gaining a grade level worth of skills in six weeks working remotely without a teacher. Dyslexic students using NESI for these six weeks made nine tenths of a year's progress. Can we create policies aimed at improving pre-service education for teachers at CUNY and other teaching colleges that get New York City funds? And on the state level, aimed at the licensing of K-3 teachers and the Time expired. of teaching college and alternative pathways to teaching that would ensure K-3 teachers have a solid background in evidence-based literacy instruction. We would save professional development costs the DOE spends on training teachers in the science of reading developed in the 1940s and save the special ed education costs in schools, remediation costs in high school and CUNY and other colleges. The mental health costs that frustrated readers create would be saved. The human potential would be unleashed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie Mayer. Next, we will hear from Anthony Tassi. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, members of the committee, I really appreciate this opportunity to chat with you today about such an important topic. And let me first by, uh, start by saying what a powerhouse this committee has been um, through the years and especially this year. And I wanna commend um, uh, the chairman for your particularly outspoken leadership in this time. We've heard from many quarters, the usual teacher bashing or the um, excuse making for schools, but I think you have found a particular leadership voice here where your, your aim is to support all participants in the education process and hold the system accountable for results. So I can't tell you as a New Yorker, as a father of a public school daughter, how much I appreciate that personally and professionally from where I sit at Literacy Partners. We're an adult and family literacy program that focuses on low income and immigrant parents. And I wanted to just bring the conversation just for these moments um, to the role of parents. And I know the committee is um, very well of, aware of the central role of parents and as is everybody today, the role of parents in education of children obviously is something many of us are dealing with on an immediate visceral basis all day long as we try to maintain our jobs, but also from a policy perspective, I think it's abundantly clear the important role of parents. In our work in parent education, parent education with Spanish speaking parents, um, we really aim to bolster their capacity to promote early literacy skills. And what we found with our new Zoom workshops that we've implemented in the past um, period of time is that 61% of those participants express more confidence in using their children's remote learning assets. 58% have um, looked up additional resources online for themselves and their children. 57% of participants express more confidence in their own use of online, res online resources. So I, I, I pose the question, um, what does our programming, what does our policy have to look I'm like? I'm expired. To, to have 60% of parents feel more confident and take more actions in support of their children's education. I think that would really complete the piece of all the wonderful things that the department is doing, all of the important priorities that you are um, focusing on for improvement of education that can really complete the piece, this puzzle of having a stronger, more resilient um, framework to support parents in their essential work today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you, Anthony. And next we will hear from Ashley Sawyer. Time starts now. Hi, 
Okay, thank you, Chair Traeger and committee members for dedicating time to this really crucial issue. My name is Ashley Sawyer and I'm the Director of Policy and Government at Girls for Gender Equity and I'm also an attorney um, and I've spent most of my career doing education civil rights work um, at some point doing special education focused on kids who were most marginalized. And I want to testify today to point out the ways in which the issue that we are dealing with is very much an issue that can set precedents for the years to come. And I thank you, Chair Traeger, for mentioning that a number of times today. The decisions that we make in this moment will impact us in next year and could potentially impact us for a generation. It could impact the overall safety of our city if young people are disenfranchised, and it could impact each individual young person's well-being. I want to just note that after Hurricane Katrina, for a very, very brief period of time, I went down in New Orleans um, as a law student to help out some of the students there. And I can speak firsthand about the ways that an interruption to education can have a long-term impact. I was there several years after the hurricane, but young people were at a much greater disadvantage than anything I had ever seen, reading at a much, um, they were reading behind schedule. And we have to recognize that the choices that we've made around um, remote learning are going to have a long-term impact. My recommendation is that when we return, there has to be a commitment to addressing the inequities, commitment to particularly focusing resources on schools where students had to take on a lot of responsibilities, schools and communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, particularly Black and Latinx communities. Those students are carrying a great deal of trauma. My written testimony will include some of the studies and the research because Unfortunately, what we're experiencing, we have examples to look to. We can look to cities and states where they've experienced natural disasters, and we can look to those as examples of how horrible education um, can be when we don't step up in times of crisis. And so my ask for- Time expired. And while I'll briefly conclude, but my ask for this body is that we sincerely prioritize those students who are most marginalized and understand that um, while this isn't a budget hearing, I understand that the, the resources that will be available for those students are going to be determined in the next few weeks. And my ask is that everyone on this committee continue to fight tooth and nail to ensure that there's a budget that allocates resources to the students who are most marginalized. Otherwise, we will pay for it in the years to come. We have to make space for their healing. We have to make space for their recovery. And we have to know that some students had what they need during this time. And there are other students who will be at a great disadvantage. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes panel six. Council member Traeger, do you, uh, Chair Traeger, do you have any questions? I, I think the testimony was powerful and I thank them for their excellent service and excellent observations. Thank you. Thank you, panel six. We will now move to panel seven. On panel seven will be Johanna Miller, Susan Horowitz, Nancy Bedard, and Anna Arkin Gallagher. We will start with Johanna Miller. Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna focus my remarks because so much has been said already that um, I think the NYCLU completely agrees with. Um, but one thing that hasn't been talked about much is digital privacy. And so I'm gonna focus my remarks on that given the time restrictions. Um, so thank you so much for having me. My name is Joanna Miller. I'm the director of the Education Policy Center at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, we are more concerned than ever about threats to students' digital and educational privacy, especially now that their entire school day is taking place online. Students are more exposed than ever. Uh, they may be interacting with half a dozen or more tech companies in pursuit of their daily classwork or homework, software and service providers, website hosts, app developers, and device manufacturers, um, just to give a sense of the breadth. Um, we conducted a survey shortly after school buildings closed. We had more than 500 respondents from across the state, um, representing 80% of New York's population centers. Um, and the most commonly re reported platforms that students and schools are using um, were Google tools. Uh, and I think that that's really important because Google has an incredibly checkered past in terms of protecting young people's privacy, especially. Um, the state of New Mexico is currently suing Google for violating the Child Online Privacy Protection Act for tracking young people via Google Classrooms in violation of federal law. Um, additionally, in 2019, just a year ago, Google paid the state of New York $170 million and admitted to illegally targeting children with ads and content on YouTube. Uh, this February, just a couple weeks before our school buildings closed, 
there was an op-ed in the Dallas Morning News with the title, after data breaches, it's time to kick Google out of public schools before it's too late. So I think there's a lot of information that Google is a troubling software platform, and yet we don't hear um, the DOE throwing its weight around to try to improve things. I'm expired. Um, I'll just say one more sentence, which is the DOE acted really quickly to work with Zoom to make sure that Zoom was meeting security standards that the DOE felt were, were necessary, but we haven't seen them do that with Google. As far as we know, um, Google's just one, and there are you know a multitude of totally inscrutable privacy policies that students and parents are having to accept. Um, and so we really urge the council and the DOE to work together to make sure that students' um, data is being protected. Thanks so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Susan Horwitz. Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much. I am the uh, supervising attorney of the Education Law Project in the Civil Practice of the Legal Aid Society. And the students who we represent are the most vulnerable ones in our system, like some of the other advocacy organizations have, <clears throat> have noted today. I wanna echo a couple of the comments made by others and emphasize four quick points. As several panelists have noted, all students with IEPs must be provided with extended school year services. It's difficult enough for students with disabilities to receive appropriate services during in-person schooling and the current remote system, while acknowledging that this is an unprecedented situation and DOE in, in many ways has really risen to the occasion to meet some needs. But the current remote system for students with disabilities is going to ensure stagnation at the best and regression at the worst. So we urge the um, offering of of um, extended school year services. Number two, students who were the subjects of superintendent suspensions at the time schools closed are currently in limbo as to whether they'll be able to return when schools reopen, which creates additional stress and top trauma on top of uh, everything that's already feeling um, worrisome and anxious about the current situation. We urge the DOE to offer, in essence, amnesty to all students who are in this position and to let them know now to permit them to re-enroll as soon as schools open and um, end the uncertainty that they're feeling about their, their current status. And third, uh, for some of our students, um, this is something that I haven't heard mentioned yet. Um, for some of our students who have great challenges attending school due to trauma-related school refusal issues, and it's a good number um, of the kids who we work with at Legal Aid, remote learning has actually been a boon. We've seen a similar pattern in our um, children who, for whom being in a classroom full of kids can be really distracting and stimulating um, and too much to allow them to focus on learning. And we are seeing kids who really were not attending school at all who are, are getting great grades right now and really engaged in um, the process of learning. So we urge DOE to continue to offer some level I'm expired. of classroom-based remote learning opportunities to students who truly can't attend school for certain periods of time based on these types of challenges, rather than limiting to them to at most a couple of hours of home-based instruction per day when that's even improved, approved. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Nancy Bedard. Time begins now. Hello, this is Nancy Bedard from Brooklyn Legal Services. Brooklyn Legal Services is a part of Legal Services New York City, which provides free legal civil services to low income neighborhoods throughout all the five boroughs. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. Today, I'd like to share uh, uh, information about one of our clients who've contacted us and there is a child with a disability with an IEP who has autism and he is in the third grade and he's at a Brooklyn District 75 school. When I spoke to his mother, she explained to me that she did get a call from the DOE on the 20th of March in order for assistance to order an iPad. She received the iPad on May 10th. Throughout this entire time that she waited, she tried to engage her child with her telephone, which was not working. Um, the child would not engage on the telephone. Unfortunately, the child also receives all types of services, occupational therapy, speech and language, and was to receive two types of counseling, uh, individual counseling and group counseling. And the entire time that the child has been on remote learning, the child has only received one call from a speech and language provider. Um, 
Also, the child is not able to socialize and go to school. Of course, we understand it's a pandemic and it's a very difficult process. And we understand for the safety of all that the schools had to be closed. But she's now dealing with a situation in which her child will not leave the house at all. The routine has been broken and his inability now to socialize is worse than ever and he's regressing. Uh, he also cannot engage on the screen now that she has it because of issues with the lighting that are creating serious problems for him. I really appreciate all the DOE has done, but there are some children, as Susan mentioned, who are thriving in this environment. I'm expired. Many, many more who are not. She has an advocate in Brooklyn Legal Services and Legal Services New York City, but we ask that you assist students who do not have advocates to go and in partial hearings so that they could get remote learning that is um, for their disability. Thank you very much. Finally, we will hear from Anna Arkin Gallagher. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anna Arkin Gallagher. I'm a supervising attorney in the education practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The transition to remote learning has been a monumental effort and we applaud the efforts of the DOE. In its current form, however, the DOE's system of remote learning threatens to exacerbate the many inequities that have long existed within the city's education system. Many of the families we work with lack access to the technology required to access the DOE's remote learning platforms and after waiting sometimes weeks to secure internet connected devices, have continued to struggle with slow internet connections, lack of private space in crowded apartments or shelters, and other logistical challenges. On top of this, many of the families we work with come from the community's hardest hit by COVID-19 and have experienced profound trauma born from job losses, financial insecurities, and of course, the loss of close family members and friends. With all this in mind, we believe it is very important for the DOE to formulate a plan that provides adequate mental health and behavioral support services for these students in particular. We appreciate the work this committee and especially Chair Traeger did to bring the additional social workers on board even before this pandemic. And it's essential for schools to have intensive supports and services in place when students return to school buildings. I wanna highlight one additional respect in which our clients are experiencing a disproportionate impact, which is the involvement of ACS and the NYPD in remote learning. Parents and other caregivers we represent have experienced new ACS involvement because of remote learning delays and challenges. We've confronted instances in which schools have called ACS or the state central register upon noticing students had not logged into the remote learning platform, even when these absences resulted from missing or delayed devices tech difficulties and internet connectivity issues. We also have concerns that absences due to remote learning are inviting other kinds of unnecessary surveillance and intervention into families' lives. It is our that schools have sometimes been encouraged to contact the NYPD to perform wellness checks of students who've struggled to access remote learning services. Visits from the police for this purpose are invasive, unsafe, and unnecessary, especially during this time of social distancing. We hope that the council can consider the impact that ACS and police visits have on poor families and families of color and encourage the DOE to act as a partner with parents and caregivers adjusting to the challenges of this pandemic. Thank you. That concludes panel seven, Chair Traeger. Yes, very briefly, I thank uh, Anna for that powerful testimony. And uh, I mentioned earlier that as a student uh, in my district that was being marked absent uh, because she is working now as, a, as an essential food, a food worker, helping uh, serve the community and helping her support her family at home, but they were still marking her absent and trying to punish her for that. I, I do have a, just a quick question for the panel. Uh, you heard earlier my exchange with the DOE about uh, their survey questions in some areas that uh, you know I, I raised that were not asked. And I wanna just be very clear. Uh, I don't want to ask anything, you know, that is insensitive. I don't want to ask anything that infringes upon privacy or personal issues. Uh, I do, however, believe we need to take better stock of the trauma and uh, of the burdens that many of our kids are experiencing. Because what I'll share with you anecdotally is that I've heard from, uh, from families where it's hard to find a quiet place to learn crowded dwellings with people who are sick. I've heard 
about students, high school kids now having to work to support their family. So can, can the panel, what, uh, what kinds of questions that are appropriate and that are you know, sensitive to, uh, I don't wanna you know, cross any line, but what kind of information do you think is appropriate to ask of our school communities to get to take better stock of the trauma and burdens uh, our families are facing during this pandemic and during this change to, to remote learning? Hi, this is um, Susan here. I think uh, the the way that I think do we can um, take stock is by just the way that they're framing the questions. So instead of specifically saying, dear student, have you had to work to take care of your family? Has anyone died in your family? I think making the questions a little more open-ended, like um, you know, what types of barriers have you found? Are there specific... Um, obstacles to logging in every morning? Are there any challenges you find with your ability to fully um, focus? So to, to sort of work around it, as opposed to saying, do you have to get a job and does that prevent you? And it's, you know, a lot of it is, is really just framing. And we talk about this a lot with, with my team about how to just even ask questions ourselves so that everyone feels comfortable and like we're not being too intrusive. Excellent point. Thank you. Excellent points. I'll just share that 40% um, of the 40% of the respondents in our survey said that their biggest struggle was that they or their child had additional responsibilities now that they didn't have before the pandemic. And those included, we, we sort of left it open ended. We just called it additional responsibilities. Um, and then let people type in. And a lot of it was caring for siblings. And that was something that impacted um, students of all ages, you know, every, basically, if you're nine and you have a five-year-old sibling, you, you may be looking after them during the day. Um, and that it was, it, the result was much higher than we even thought it would be 40%. It was the highest of anything on the survey. So I think it's well worth asking those questions. And I, I agree with um, the way that the questions are framed and maybe just giving people the opportunity to offer as much or as little detail as they want, but having the opportunity to say, I really have more responsibility now. And then maybe someone following up in a more um, human to human way, I think could go really far. Excellent, thank you. Uh, that, that's perfect. That's exactly what I, what I needed to hear because I'm a lifelong learner and I wanna find that right balance of asking, taking stock of it, but being sensitive to, to individual cases. Thank you so much for that excellent suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel seven. We will now move to panel eight. Panel eight will consist of Maud Marin, Nuala Odori Naranjo, Chris Green, and Jessica Caraballo. We will start with Maud. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? No. Yes, yeah. go ahead. Yes, okay. Thank you for returning to me. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger. Uh, my name is Maud Marin, and I'm the president of Community Education Council for District 2. I'm the mom of four, and my three eldest are New York City public school students in fourth, sixth, and eighth grade. I have some prepared remarks about remote learning, but I'd like to just um, remark on something I heard earlier when Councilmember Holden asked Deputy Chancellor Austin about the stakeholder outreach and parent outreach around the grading policy. Um, I was troubled because in truth, there really wasn't outreach of any meaningful kind around the grading policy. Uh, the ECC that Deputy Chancellor Austin referenced is a private organization that does not allow parents to attend their meeting or have public sessions where parents or students can share their perspectives. So talking to the ECC is not a substitute for reaching out to CECs and PTAs uh, regarding the grading policy. Uh, DC Austin also mentioned PLACE, which I am a member of, but PLACE was only consulted after the grading policy was finalized and presented to elected officials. So that's not really the kind of meaningful outreach and consultation that parents are looking for. And I certainly hope the DOE can and do better around developing an admissions policy. Um, I will say that with regard to remote learning, my children have had a very successful transition and they're very lucky. They were using Google Classroom prior to the transition in District 2. Our uh, teachers have had a 96% contact rate with the students across our district. Um, I'm really grateful to and enormously impressed by all of the work that I've seen from teachers in our schools. Um, and all my kids have had some access to, to a degree of live instruction. I know that not all families have had such an easy transition. It took many weeks to distribute devices to students. 
and the health concerns and job losses and other trauma brought on by this pandemic have not been borne equally by all communities. Pre-existing inequities have worsened. And the fact that students are currently experiencing school or experiencing remote learning so differently means that when they walk through the doors of school buildings, when they reopen, they're gonna walk through with different needs and different levels of trauma and different educational strengths and weaknesses. So I think we have to acknowledge that we need nuanced plans for the educational success of the students in our system and that a one size fits all solution is not going to work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Nuala. Time starts now. Time starts now. Okay, we have some more panels to go, so we will swing back to Nuala. Next, we'll hear from Chris Green. Time starts now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Traeger and all city council members. Uh, my name is Chris Green, and I'm a program director at Good Shepherd Services over uh, both a Compass and Sonic DYCD-funded after-school program at Brooklyn Scholars Charter School. And I would like to express the seemingly insurmountable obstacles our program families will potentially face this summer. This testimony provides input from Mrs. Roxanne Thomas, the school principal. We've learned that families in our school community are experiencing food shortages and increase in technological needs for laptops to meet the requirement for remote learning and anxiety related to meeting the Center for Disease Control's guidelines with limited access to personal protective equipment. As a result, we have connected families to food pantries ac across New York City, distributed laptops to families uh, who can borrow them until work is back in session, and referrals uh, were made to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, resources around mental health, including NYC Well, as well as we did also distribute resource maps and contact information to resources provided by city agencies. Lastly, as it relates to remote learning supports, we are supporting our families during this hard time through regular communication between program staff and families. These calls are currently happening on a weekly basis via calls, text messages, emails, and voice messages, uh, wherein we share resources that make necessary referrals that families need during this difficult time. Our Compass and Sonic staff provide live activities via Google Classroom on a daily basis, including stretches and basic uh, beginner dance steps to keep our youth active and moving and improving their reflexes. Uh, activities to reinforce space awareness, discussions on decision-making and making choices, sports discussions about idolized athletes, how their style of play affected the way they see themselves as sports practitioners, research on said athletes, as well as studying the history of, of sports. Class offerings are also available for art, drama, dance, puzzle solving, and expression through music. Uh, staff have also provided uh, DIY or do-it-yourself activities for families to try at home that encourage family engagement. All these activities have helped our families keep students engaged, better use the excess time at home to remain in good health and continue to be mentally stimulated. Parents and guardians have shared their appreciation for services such as these uh, that have alleviated the pressure unfairly placed on them at a time when the expectation is for them to be part-time educators. These activities support closing, closing the widening gap being experienced by our young people, especially during the summer season when services will be non-existent. We are committed to serving the needs of our community and understand this is a difficult time. We can, we can assist in ensuring that families have what they need this summer to support the growth of youth. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jessica Caraballo. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. And thank you for hosting this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jessica Caraballo and I am a program director at Good Shepherd Services at MS363 a middle school Sonic program that's located in the Bronx. Since the pandemic, we have moved our programming and supports remotely. Our staff has been working with families and leveraging our strong relationships to encourage students to remain engaged with their schoolwork. 
We have created a series of remote activities that students could do from home, including salsa, lyrical, visual arts, and cooking classes. Nonprofits across the city have stepped up to support families with remote learning, distributing laptops, assisting with Google Classrooms, and updating contact information, phone numbers. No one is going to be. Yeah, how do I know when? So they can be reached by their teachers. Students are dealing with complex trauma, and now more than ever, we are helping them process the feeling of loss, of being away from family and friends, the outdoors, and the absence of activities they enjoy while navigating remote learning. Our work is critical to the recovery of our young people. At MS363 in the Bronx, it is important to name that our community has been plagued with gun violence, poverty, and health and economic disparities that had only been magnified by the, by the COVID-19 virus. This on top of youth navigating remote learning and staying indoors. Our programs help children be children and ensure that they have safe haven where they can escape community violence, drug, gang activity, and other abuses that, abuses that they are experiencing. We are able to do this work because of the trust we have built with family and youth. As the weather is getting warmer and the announcement of summer programming being canceled was made, our youth and families are feeling abandoned. While we continue to create remote activities to keep them engaged and off the streets, we know that our communities need assurances of what's gonna be happening this summer soon. Time expired. We know that if they're engaged at home, this keeps them off the street and safe. And this is when we know that we have gotten the job done. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we're gonna swing back to Neil O'Doherty Naranjo. Are you on? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear? No, yes, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Sorry. My name is Nulo Dari Naranjo. I'm five and grandmother of two. So I've attended will attending our great local public school. Um, but I live here in Jackson Heights, uh, Queens, where we've really been hit hard by COVID. Um, we are kind of the epicenter of the epicenter. And that's why I think it's so important that we really look at how this has affected our families, not only educationally, but as a whole person. They've really suffered in so many different ways. Um, at IS230, we've had families who've lost nine different um, direct family members in their household in just one school. So I think when we put it in that context of how jarring this is, I think we have to make sure when we talk about education, we talk about it as a whole person and specifically about how hard it can be to go through a normal education day. And that's why it's so, so important that we have a sense of normalcy and a sense of humor interaction. Um, normalcy, I mean just a regular schedule, a schedule so people know what they can expect the next day. When life has been turned so topsy-turvy, it's so important that kids know what to expect. And secondly, that they can actually meet their teacher and meet their fellow students. And that's why it's so important to have time every day where they see their teacher and students in real time, one-on-one, -on -one, so they can actually participate in classes, not only for the sense of normalcy, but just for the social interaction. So many of these kids have been locked into small cramped apartments with many, many relatives for so long. They really need that social emotional time. And I really implore the Department of Education to really focus on that social emotional needs to make sure kids can interact with their teachers and with other students, because we need to make sure we educate the entire child and that we really consider uh, those needs in these traumatic times. These kids have suffered and they deserve everything we can give them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes panel eight. Chair Traeger, any questions? We're good, thank you. Thank you everyone on panel eight. We will now move to panel nine. On panel nine, we have Maggie Moroff, Denora Getachew, Anna Fridman, and Kimberly Watkins. We will start with Maggie. Time starts now. Um, my name is Maggie Moore. My name is Maggie Moroff, and I coordinate the Arise Coalition. Arise members have been on the front lines as remote learning has rolled out, and I'd like to share some of what we've seen and what we hope will come next. This period of remote learning has been difficult for students and their families. 
We know that Central DOE staff and many educators have been working incredibly hard to make remote learning and services possible, but we've seen so many challenges and we continue to hear of far too many students with disabilities who have only minimal services in place at this point. We worry that these represent systemic challenges that remain months into remote learning. I'd like to offer a few examples. Some youth whose special education needs mean they function well below their chronological grade are being given work meant for students at their age level, work impossible for those students. Some have had no live instruction or meaningful teacher interaction despite their need for support from a special education teacher. Others are still receiving all of their men or are still not receiving all of their mandated related services. Staff at some schools continue to tell parents that evaluations cannot be done until the buildings reopen, leaving students without needed services, and families of students with a range of disabilities, from dyslexia to autism to behavioral challenges to hearing impairments, worry that their students' specific needs aren't being met. Students with disabilities are at particular risk of falling behind during this time. Their needs are greater, and they're more likely to rely on in-person adult supervision, uh, support, making their parents' role especially important. They will need instruction and services going forward to make up those they've missed, and we look forward to working with the DOE and with the City Council to ensure that they get that support that they need and to get, to get them back on track. Thank you, and thank you again to your staff for getting me back on. Thank you, Maggie. Next, we will hear from Denora. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony on behalf of Generation Citizen. My name is Denora Gattaccio. I'm the New York Executive Director at Generation Citizen. Generation Citizen is a 10-year-old national nonprofit dedicated to demystifying democracy for young people by bringing civics education back into the classroom through Action Civics. During the last few election cycles, our nation has been powerfully reminded of the potential of youth political participation. While the trend we see in favor of civics education is encouraging, it underlines the necessi necessity of reinvigorating civics education in schools, particularly through programs like the ones that the council funds through Generation Citizen, where we bring project-based learning and real-world opportunities to engage demo in democracy. At this critical juncture in our, in our nation's history, we need systems that will create sustained youth participation. Our program equips youth with the knowledge and skills they need to participate. And as we've seen from the data, under-resourced communities are, those the, are the ones most likely to be disproportionately impacted by this pandemic and the very communities that now more than ever need to understand how democracy works. As this pandemic began to disrupt education in New York and nationwide, we shifted to offering our curriculum and programming to school partners in a free way through grab-and-go lessons that they can use to access um, in the classrooms through asynchronous learning. We've been able to support teachers with things like how to lobby a legislator, how to talk about the census, how to get your city to respond, how do you write an op-ed. We recommend the city consider using more project-based learning as an educational resource in this disrupted educational environment. Project-based learning, as we've heard others talk about, is effective because it maximizes learning in a way that is efficient, especially at a time with reduced instructional hours. It can easily be adapted to asynchronous learning environments and it develops the skills that promote 21st century college and career readiness, including critical thinking, problem solving, et cetera. We know that we need to motivate young people to believe in themselves and their power to affect change locally and to explore issues as they do so. We believe that project-based learning, especially during this moment, can allow educators to connect and engage students with and ensure that learning does not feel so isolated, difficult, and disconnected. It is now more than, it's a now more important tool than ever as students and teachers engage with each other to take meaningful action. We have heard firsthand from educators that their students want to use their voice and their experiences to impact their communities, especially during this disrupted time, including teachers like Cynthia Muldrew in Councilmember Eugene's district, who recently remarked that remote learning has allowed for successful small group facilitation and students to own more of the work. She has been able to divide her students up to work independently in small groups and join small group sessions to watch them effectively collaborate without much facilitation on her part. In conclusion, young people are the present and future of our democracy. And if we can actually give them the knowledge and skills they need to participate, they will make their voices heard, especially in this moment when young people are feeling so disrupted and uncertain and in a crucial election year, they need to make their voices heard. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Anna. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. My name is Anna Friedman and I'm a parent of three special needs kids. 
My twin boy, boys are five years old and my oldest is six. As for the Department of Education, we started remote learning in March. According to the Department of Education, the remote learning is working great. However, this is far from the truth for us and many of our friends that have special needs children. All three of my kids have regressed tremendously due to lack of appropriate services and none of the IEP goals are being met. The regression is evident in their behavior and it's more and more severe on a daily basis. We have daily meltdowns, we have lose, uh, we lost social skills, uh, we lost communication skills. Uh, my twins have very severe developmental delays and cannot sit for more than a few seconds. They have zero understanding of how to use a computer or how to use an iPad. Uh, the related services such as speech, occupational therapy, ABA therapy, and PT are expected to be implemented by me. Um, I'm a single parent and cannot be a teacher, occupational therapist, speech therapist to three children. Remote learning does not work for us at all. I address that I send many letters to the school as well as the Department of Education uh, with really they doing their best. That's the response that I got. Um, you know, address it to the school. Uh, they're doing the best that they can. Therapy must be done in person with proper safety procedures. Summer school and fall classes should be done in person. Their IEPs are being violated and they're not getting free appropriate education as required by law. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And finally, on panel nine, we will hear from Kimberly Watkins. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for hosting this uh, this hearing, Council Member Traeger. I really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank our hardworking teachers, our principals, uh, and our staff members for doing the best they can in this difficult period of, of time in our lives. Um, my name is Kim Watkins. I'm a Harlem parent. Um, uh, mother of a fifth grader, and I'm an elected leader in school district three. And I have, um, I want to speak today and my prepared remarks about my two big concerns, which have to do with remote learning kind of as an end unto itself. Um, and, and then also what the future is going to look like um, and, and my concerns about that. But I just want to say uh, regarding um, my co-panelist, Anna was just saying that I think it's time for us to really start thinking about how our most vulnerable are uh, are being affected by this and, and use that the what we know about what is happening in our, our families that are most affected by COVID-19 to to change the school system as a whole. Um, I, I feel just awful listening to to her experience. Um, knowing that in my own my own life, um, you know, homeschooling or remote learning is extremely difficult. Um, but uh, you know, I don't have a child with with a disability, and I feel just incredibly lucky that I don't have to. Um, I, I'm not in that position. Um, but I did want to today speak a little bit about um, about remote learning as an end unto itself, because the the thing that I think the DOE is focused on. Um, is that the, you know, remote learning is a standalone environment. And what I think we need to accept is that education isn't about sitting in front of a computer screen um, or any screen. Um, it's a useful tool as part of an array of experiences that help young people grow and develop the skills that they need in their, in their lives, whatever they're going to do. But we don't want to raise a whole generation of techno addicts which I think could easily happen if we don't adjust the way that we're talking about this period of time. Um, and of course, what would be happening in, in the future? Um, New Yorkers have suffered immeasurably because our DOE, our government did not heed warnings about the pandemic to close schools early enough. Um, and they did not have a plan in place that would sustain learning for our kids over a prolonged period of time of shuttered school operations. Uh, this entire saga has been made worse by the fact that the sh that rather than shut the school down for a period of time and allow teachers and hardworking principals and staff to sprout online learning plans in earnest, um, the DOE spent taxpayer dollars on a huge collection of, of high-tech learning programs uh, and, and one of the most expensive outlays of Apple products that probably took place in history. Rather than take the time to work with school communities and districts about what they needed in each of their, their districts and communities. Um, iPads aren't even that user friendly in terms of typing, which has really led to frustration in many homes, including mine. Um, 
the, the patchwork of online programs has further frustrated parents because in the first weeks of homeschooling, as we've, we've many people have talked about already today, um, you know, we cobbled together our own individualized plans, some by class, some by school, some by grade, some by school. Um, and then the worst manifestation of, of, of centralized bureaucratic control happened when, you know, the mothership, the DOE said, no, you cannot use this one program, you have to use this other approved program. Um, and then a few weeks later, the, the ground and the rules shifted again. Um, and now here we are in June. Um, now teachers and parents and students may have stopped scratching our heads with, with these varieties of programs. We're burned out. Uh, many students haven't returned to the learning potential that they, that they had even when we began the shutdown in March. Um, live instruction um, also is, it varies a great deal. And I'm so, uh, you know, I'm so pleased that it was brought up a couple of times today, but this is one area that parents cons consistently agree on that the synchronous, the live instruction is having, has the most positive impact on our student motivation and our progress um, during this period. So, you know, just like in a physical classroom, a good teacher, you know, the good, the room that makes the difference. Um, and, um, and I think the DOE is doing a good job getting there, but I am concerned that we don't have a standard of instructional delivery in terms of, of live teaching. Um, I think a long-term remote plan turning to that part isn't going to mean much if students don't have an understanding and parents and families don't have an understanding of what, um, what that standard of, of synchronous or live instruction is supposed to be. Um, remote learning, therefore, still has a long way to go to, to be a part of our overall public school system. Um, the lack of a plan for this fall is, is also very troubling. I'd argue that despite our hopeful desire to reopen our schools, we may still need to face the reality that uh, parents won't feel safe sending our schools and reopening school buildings in, in the fall. Uh, Full-time school nurses are still not being hired. Uh, we all know that our budgets are being slashed and communities all around the city are wondering how we're going to transition our kids to new grades, to new schools, um, and then deal with the public health realities that we know we're going to have to, um, the sort of conformity to new public health uh, rules that we're gonna have to conform to in September. Uh, so those are my remarks. Thank you again for, for hosting us. And uh, I, uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, Chair Traeger. So just very briefly, uh, I, I would just agree with Kim and who has been a fantastic advocate for, for kids in school communities across the city that if, uh, if parents and, and school communities do not feel safe to return to school in the fall, uh, the plan's just not gonna work. And that's why we need a, uh, a clear and funded uh, and safe school reopening plan because otherwise there is no reopening of New York. And uh, I was on a panel yesterday where I made that point clear with the, the Chancellor of the State, of State Education, New York, and uh, my other colleagues that we can no longer speak about education in siloed terms. Uh, they can create 50,000 task forces on different issues, but everything comes down to our school system, our economy, our healthcare system, our safety net, and so if there is not a plan, a funded plan to safely reopen schools, it's just not gonna work. And, and this is not just, a, this is not a budget wish list. This is simply a fact that everything is connected to the school system. So Kimberly, uh, thank you for your advocacy. Uh, nurses are definitely a part of that conversation. Um, and so I thank you for that. And for Anna Friedman, I would like if someone from the, uh, if, uh, from the staff can get Anna's contact information. I'd like to follow up with the DOE on how we can better support uh, Anna's situation with her children because that story was very, very painful. And, and we asked questions about that, about which IEP services are now uh, not being met um, and uh, children who are not getting back lost time of instruction in these services. So if we can get Anna's information, I'd like to follow up with her uh, following this hearing. And I, I thank the panel. Thank you, panel nine. Before we move on to panel 10, I just wanna remind everyone 
uh, for council members that are still logged into the hearing, there are a number of you. If you do have a question for a particular panelist, please use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after the panel has completed its testimony in its entirety. For panelists, you will notice the letter P and a number next to your name. This will let you know what panel you are on and you will be able to see where you are in the queue throughout the hearing. Please wait to start your testimony until the Sergeant at Arms gives you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. When time is called, we please ask all panelists to wrap up their testimony. Again, I will do my best with pronouncing everyone's name. So if I do mess it up, I do apologize um, in advance and continue to apologize. Now we will move to panel 10. Panel 10 will be Derwin Green, Ted Leather, and Amanda Blair. Derwin Green. Time starts now. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just wanna say thank you for allowing me to be here. My name is Darren Green, as uh, previously stated. I am from the Kingsbridge Heights Community Center um, where I'm a college success counselor. I just wanted to speak on behalf of my organization and other community-based organizations um, in regards to the upcoming city budget where de Blasio is planning to cut summer funding um, to SYEP and to summer camps through programs like Sonic and um, Cornerstones and Beacon. And so, I just wanna say that um, if these cuts were to happen, it would definitely create another sense of loss in a time where um, students have already lost so much. Um, through community-based organizations are capable of providing some um, you know, enriching um, resources and training and valuable employment opportunities to the youth. Um, through our organization, we have CARA, right? Which is the College Access and Research Action Center where we help to train youth through the summertime um, to go into schools and implement the college access model where they're training, um, they're, you know, they're assisting their peers through, through the college process, you know, helping them with um, FAFSA applications, providing them with training around CUNYs and SUNYs, um, and as well as, you know, advisement, you know, um, for, as well as through life, as well through these one-on-one -on -one interactions. When these budget cuts take place, this will allow not only allow, you know, this will take away opportunities for these students to gain valuable employment, but also skills that will help them, you know, in their goals going forward in life. And also too, just knowing that if summer funding does not exist, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And knowing that, you know, um, in marginalized communities that they will not more than likely stay inside and that they will come out and that will lead to other, you know, other issues and problem problems that will take place. And so we're just asking that these cuts do not take place besides the fact that many of these nonprofit organizations will not be able to come back and be able to sustain themselves, which only will add to, you know, other negative numbers that will affect the city and reopening. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Derwin. Next, we will hear from Ted Leather. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Ted Leather. I am a Manhattan member of the Citywide Council on High Schools I wanna focus on one word. The word is lack. I see a lack of consistency in live instruction. Some students do not have any or not enough. Some teachers pile on homework. I see a lack of a plan for students' mental health, their emotional health, their physical health. And it isn't just students who are suffering, it's, it's all of us, parents, staff, teachers, it's the whole planet. I can attest to helping parents in both English and Uzbek who are frustrated and trying to figure out the iPad. So remote learning leaves a lot to be desired. And this lack of a vision, be it citywide, schoolwide, districtwide, is evident. So the question is what will be enacted in the next few weeks so that the fall is not lacking? September is four months away. And the way that we have constructed remote learning, it is not viable as a long-term solution. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Amanda Blair. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for hosting this hearing. My name is Amanda Blair. I am a college access counselor for Good Shepherd Services. I'm also a mother of three children, one in elementary, one in middle school, and one in high school. Um, Brooklyn Frontiers High School is a partnership between the DOE and Good Shepherd Services. It, um, we serve 
first time ninth graders who have been held back at least twice in elementary and or middle school. We also serve students who have attended high school for at least one year and are looking for a fresh start and a new opportunity to complete their high school diploma. We know that all students, regardless of their past experience in school, can be successful. Our school is designed to help students get back on track and to graduate ready for college and career. We, um, Good Shepherd, operate four partnerships with um, the Department of Education across the city, Brooklyn Frontiers, South Brooklyn Community High School, West Brooklyn High School, and Research and Services. Combined, we um, serve a total of a thousand students throughout Brooklyn. As a result of COVID-19, all our support courts went remote in March. It became immediately clear that students needed access to equipment and broadband at home. Our GSTS team quickly assessed this, what students needed across our community-based programs. We provided over 500 laptops to students in need. While our teachers worked to create a new way of doing high school instruction within 24 hours, our GSS team focused on teaching students and their families how to connect with the classwork. Our staff have been critical in linking students to the classroom and maintaining that human relationship that is fundamental in our school. Beyond immediate um, time to expired. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Our team, as always, is focused on emotionally supporting our students. We help youth to restore faith in themselves. Um, if, if you could just wrap up final uh, comments and okay. we'll, we'll take we'll, we'll take your, your email testimony if possible. Okay, what we are doing right now is being the glue that holds our, all our schools together, that one-on-one -on -one attention, keeping the dialogue going, even when someone hasn't been able to log, log on or is afraid or just needs time to talk with the team. Our students are facing the summer without any of the normal fabric of our city. No, no SYE team speakers or remote sum school for makeup work. We know that our connection to our students means they are that they will be more successful in school and that their families will be able to get the support and the information they need. This summer is going to be unlike any we've ever seen, but we are committed to support our youth and the community. Thank you. Thank you. That is all for panel 10, Chair Trader. That's thank you very much. Thank you everybody from panel 10. Next, we will call up panel 11, Rachel Watts, Chiang Kwok, and Yatin Chu. We will start with Rachel Watts. Time starts now. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm just trying to find my um, document. Um, uh, my name is Rachel Watts, and I come to you today as a board member of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable, and as someone who has worked with schools in New York City for over 20 years. I'm here to highlight the importance of immediately investing in arts education, and the ability and, and our, uh, the arts education community and our ability to support schools and positively engage young people remotely. The New York City Arts and Education Roundtable is a member organization whose main purpose is to support the arts education community's work in New York City public schools. We represent over 200 organizations that provide more than 1,200 schools with vital arts programming. The member organizations fill the gaps in arts education in a long-standing partnership with the Department of Education to help see that every child has access to quality arts learning. The creative thinkers from these organizations quickly pivoted at a pace far faster than many schools to designing engaging remote arts learning curriculum. The arts learning opportunities have given students space to process their current reality and build important life skills that will help them move beyond the pandemic. As New York City schools work to, to, to go through the process of recovery from the COVID-19 crisis over the coming months and years, the arts and culture sector is poised and ready to play a crucial role in the process. The city council must put their faith in the arts and culture sector to help process trauma, restore joy, support physical fitness, and support schools in online learning or when we can back 
but be back in the classroom in person. The chancellor and mayor need to make it clear that arts instruction can and must continue as part of every child's learning. We need you, the council members who understand that the arts are essential to ensure organizations that with arts-based vendor contracts with the DOE are included in the remote learning and transition plan moving forward. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Chen Hua. Time starts now. Yes, hi. My name is Chen Kwok. Thank you very much. I'm a parent of two public school children, a PTA co-president uh, and a member of Place NYC and a graduate of Book and Tech. And my comments are my own. Scarcity, waste, and corruption. In the nation's most costly education system with a $34 billion budget that yet has a profound scarcity of resources for our children, there's unfettered waste and corruption that has robbed all the children of the future. All these have been exposed and worsened by COVID-19. We don't have the same funds anymore, but we need to help our children overcome even greater challenges. The screen school admissions debate is rooted in shortage of programs that support all types of students. Every school needs an academically rigorous program for high performing students, as much as, 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 much as special education for students with disabilities, regardless of race, income level, or other factors. No child should commute long distances to access a sound and appropriate education. At the PP meeting last week, I had the heartbreaking experience of listening to students from different schools co-located in the same building disparage each other simply because there's not enough space. School space is a fundamental right for all students and the most basic job that the chancellor must get right. And we know that DOE has had that $34 billion budget after years of un un uncontrolled growth. It's 31,000 per student, double the second most expensive school system. Yet we're told there's still not enough money. The PP rubber stamp contract approval process in media reports informs us about the waste and corruption in DOE. And just yesterday, reports surfaced that confirms that what we have long suspected. The chancellor secretly colludes with fellow ideologue, special interest groups, and ignores the views of parents across the city. This is yet another example of the corruption rampant throughout the DOE. The connections are clear. The scarcity our students face and the harm that it does is directly related to the waste and corruption of the DOE. This has been ongoing for years, and now made worse by the COVID crisis. Chair Traeger and all city council members, please do your duty. Hold the mayor and chancellor accountable. Time Thank expired. You. Thank you for your testimony. And next we'll hear from Yatin Chu. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and city council members. Um, my name is Yatin Chu. I am a CC1 member, SLT member, and co-president of Place NYC. I am here speaking for myself today. I wanna to talk about my school, PS 184 on the Lower East Side. It is the only dual language Mandarin school in the city. We are a Title I school with a 70% Asian student body and mostly from new immigrant, non-English speaking homes. I am thankful to our teachers who started live instruction in the first week of remote learning. With the exception of the Zoom ban hiccup, my child has been receiving daily live instruction. Her Chinese teacher can enunciate new vocabulary words and hear each student try to do the same. Our teachers have worked tirelessly to make remote learning as productive as possible, and I am grateful. As an education activist, I have been busy speaking out on the unfair K-8 grading policy that the DOE decided without first engaging with parents or place NYC, even with many challenges that they faced before, during, and after the pandemic. Families in my school count on their child's report card as feedback on how their child is doing. There is a sense of accomplishment and pride when they see their child progress and excel despite their circumstances. In the midst of this pandemic, the DOE wants to implement a top-down citywide change to, to screen school admissions. My school, the only non-GNT recognition school in District 1, sends two-thirds of our eighth graders to academic screen high schools. Our students have prepared for and set their sights on the selective high-performing high schools to further their academic growth and a path for socioeconomic mobility. It is unconscionable for the mayor, chancellor, and the anti-education activists to seize this crisis to eliminate this education opportunity for the families at my school. Lastly, I've been helping a student in my school that requested a device on March 16th and still has not received it as of last week. Yes, it's been over two months. She is not black or brown. She is an Asian fifth grader who has been managing remote learning on her mom's cell phone. 
In September, she will start middle school at Nest Plus M, a citywide academic screen school. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Traeger. I, I thank the panel uh, for uh, their, their testimony and I think there needs to be a whole lot more outreach and a whole lot more conversations uh, about many of the pressing issues that, that have been raised. And it's even challenging now to have effective conversations in these remote settings, but make no mistake, every community, every district must be heard. And, and, and the DOE has a lot more work to do on that front. And I thank you all for your time and for your testimony today. Thank you from the, for the panelists for panel 11. We will now move to panel 12. Panel 12 will be Adriana Aviles, Mariana Fitzgerald, and Wai Ching Chang. We will start with Adriana Aviles. Thank you to City Council for allowing parents and families this space to listen to how remote learning is going for all of us. I am not here to speak badly against any group, so my statement should not be held against any school district, any specific school, the UFT, CSA, or even the DOE. I am here on behalf of my children. I am not, not speaking on behalf of any school community group. I'm here as a parent to three children within the New York City public school system. So I will tell you what is going on with us now with remote learning. Excuse me for my language, but if I can sum it up in the words of my 10 year old son, remote learning sucks. Sucks because kids can't physically be with their friends. Sucks because they are home all day with this new principal who has three different devices on three different floors trying to go back and forth to help in any way I can, maybe even teach once in a while and still try to manage a household. We are truly blessed while so many are struggling with just life's essential needs. But it sucks for my kids when this new principal has absolutely no answers for their questions. When are we going back? Is it going to be forever? How are my friends doing? They miss school and as a parent that sucks. Sucks because it seems families are kept in the dark consistently when it comes to the decision making in regards to our children's schools. Sucks because so many are making decisions for our families, yet they have no children within the New York City DOE school system. Remote learning we know will be the new norm, yet the lack of consistency across classrooms, schools, districts, and the city itself reflects on the poor levels of engagement with all the parties that have a vested interest. This city is incredibly diverse and has so many different school communities. Once again, DOE needs to take into account the needs of each school district, each school, and each family community. One size does not fit all. Only then can we make a plan to set in place so that remote learning just isn't another failure or disaster we can look back on. Fired. Thank you so much. You, you, no, you could, you could uh, if you had to wrap up, uh, Adriana, you've been very patient and I, if you want to have a, a, a final thought there, please. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Well, I just have two paragraphs left. <laughs> so um, going back to the city is incredibly diverse and has so many school communities. Once again, deal we need to take into account the needs of each school district, each school and each family community. One size does not fit all. We have to look back at this and say, this was a time for everyone to engage. All parties need to sit down and listen to each other, but most importantly, families need to be heard. Our children need to be heard. Can we sit down and agree on making our children's education for the new year an open conversation for all? I don't wanna agree with my son that remote learning sucks, but it has for all. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you so much for everyone. And thank you to principal and teacher and great parents, Adriana as well. Thank you for your service. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Mariana Fitzgerald. Time starts now. Hi, um, thank you to the council and Chair Traeger for this opportunity to be heard. My name is Mar Fitzgerald. I am the parent of a beautiful, brilliant fourth grader who attended a New York City public school. I'm a member of Community Board 2 School and Education Committee, chair of the VID Education Committee. I sit on the Democratic County Committee in the 66th AD and served on the executive board of my daughter's PTA for years. I speak today only as a District 2 public parent in support of the DOE's grading policy in response to COVID-19 and to encourage the removal of the discriminatory admission screens that keep our schools segregated and have failed to include black, brown, and low-income New, New York City students for decades. 
I don't need to repeat what so many others have already testified to regarding the inequities in our schools. It's no secret that screens are not a measure of a student's ability, but rather their access to resources and parents' income. But let me just say that a 2013 audit of high school admissions conducted by then controller, now Senator John Liu, found that the screening process was fraught with questionable student rankings and extremely susceptible to fraud, favoritism, and manipulation. To impose these biased and defective admissions requirements only furthers the barriers, burdens, and burdens that our most vulnerable students and families suffer every day and have been exacerbated by this crisis. In 1954, the Supreme Court decreed that schools be desegregated with all deliberate speed and that the separate but equal doctrine violated the Constitution. New York City has been in violation of that Supreme Court ruling every day for the past 66 years. I want also to address the current educational climate in District 2. As parents, we expect those tasked with serving our students to do so in an honest and unbiased manner. Unfortunately, affluent and politically connected New Yorkers have strategically placed themselves in PTAs, SLTs, and community education councils as the overseers of education policy. Our CEC allows anti-integration special interest groups like PLACE to dominate meetings and pro promote a carefully script agenda, rife with dog whistles and coded language. These meetings feel increasingly more like clan rallies than a safe place in which to participate in discussions about the educational well-being and opportunities for our children. Additionally, the President's Council recently issued a restricted poll on grading and admissions, similar to the ones created by the group PLACE sent only to PTA presidents and designed to exclude regular families and students by depriving them the opportunity to be heard. I ask that you help to address the disparities that exist within New York City's education system by supporting the end of exclusionary admission screens in the middle and high school level, and to support our chancellor's courageous work towards equity in our public schools, which is needed now more than ever. This country was built on the foundation of racism, and until we address these deeply rooted systematic issues, nothing will change. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Wai Ching Chang. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear? Yes, go ahead. My name is Debbie Chen. I have a 17 years old son with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. He has attended special class in the kindergarten. I'm also a member of our Alliance for Families with the Memento List of over 500 members. Many of our parents' members are monolingual Chinese with limited education and no income. Remote learning has significantly interrupted the special education service that our children request. Consequently, our children have showed different levels of regression in terms of physical, sensory, emotional, behavior, academic, and daily functioning. Our concerns include, number one, need of face-to-face -face interaction and stimulation from familiar teacher, therapists, peers, and classroom environment. Particular children with autism and are vulnerable. Number two, due to short attention span, special class students do not pay attention to virtual class. They exhibit behavior problems due to poor instruction online. For example, my son was easily melting down and got frustrated as he was not able to achieve what he usually did in the school. Number three, non-English speaking parents have problems handling high level technology used in learning. They are exhausted and overwhelmed with remote learning, virtually therapists as well as the child's emotion and difficult behavior. They are not able to communicate with school teachers and school counselors for help immediately. We request that state and city government should not cut the budget on education, particular particularly a special education service that 200,000 New York City school children with specialists are receiving. Teachers and school professionals should take a proactive role to contact and support non-English speaking parents dealing with more hearing, with more learning, sorry, when students return to school in September. DOE should re-evaluate all aspect of students functioning and renew their IEP for appropriate services to address the concerns 
of regressions. Thank you. Thank you. And the final panelist that just joined us is Dong Hui Zhang. Time starts now. My name is Dong Hui Zhang, and uh, I'm a Queen's parent. Uh, so I strongly, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I think by converting the by, by converting the the grading into a binary grid was already a mi was already a big mistake made by DOE without consulting the CEC without consulting the parents. So that will greatly discourage the teaching and the learning process. Having made that mistake, I hope the DOE not making another another mistake by changing the screen the school admission. So we have uh, we we have 195 high school and 125 middle schools, and uh, the screened program make them strong and robust. So and uh, they they stimulate the kids to learn. So we we sincerely we sincerely hope that that there will be no drastic change because of the COVID nineteen. So even in the time of the war, the learning hasn't stopped. So in this crisis, we shouldn't we shouldn't discourage any learning, but encourage people encourage the students to learn. So that's how we make our country and make our city competitive. So don't say that we don't have any great grades anymore. So we do, we have the three marking periods grades and please just use them. No, I mean the first and the second marking period grades actually was not touched, was not impacted by this crisis. So there is no reason that why don't we use them. And also for the state test, I strongly suggest that in September or in October or whenever the school restart, please make up one. Thank you. That concludes this panel. Chair Traeger. I thank the, I thank the panel for the testimony. Thank you everyone from panel 12. We will now move to panel 13. On panel 13 will be Nicole Cohen, Jennifer Rodriguez, Rocky Bonanno, Janine Kiley, and Patricia Lararia, and we will start with Nicole Cohen. I'm Thank, now. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm the parent of a nearly seven-year-old boy who goes to PS 154 in Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn in District 15. I wanna commend the leadership of our school, especially Jason Foreman, our principal, and our first grade teachers, Ms. Hammond and Ms. Toomey. Their leadership has been incredible and helped us as a family immensely during this trying time. I'm here to say the technology is not the answer to the question, how do we educate our elementary students next fall? Emergency remote learning, as I read it described in an article, has been useful as a workaround during this unthinkable situation. Our teachers have done a great job at parsing out the modules into daily and weekly assignments and giving my son the opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one with them. Despite having access to this and the opportunity to self-pace, his interest has waned and our fights have increased. It turns out part of what my son loves about learning is sharing what he's learned with other kids. He, like me, does not like video conferencing. In the past few months, my precocious, curious kid went from being zealous about school to having frequent meltdowns and yelling, I wanna quit school forever, and us crying together on the floor. I don't blame video conferencing alone. This is an exceptionally lonely time for a child, but it assures me that teaching a child in isolation through a computer is not the answer and placing the burden on parents is equally difficult. For us, a well-resourced family, it has been difficult for a number, number of reasons that remind us each day why in-person instruction, reduced teacher, re, reduced teacher student ratios, increased emotional curricul curriculum, PE, recess, art and music are essential to children's educational development. Also, if you ask any parent in the neighborhood how they're doing, they will remark in the first few minutes they're failing at, at homeschooling. 
and feel terrible about it, letting themselves down and their kids down. It's discouraging. We're all feeling discouraged. We need a safe solution, but screens are not the answer. Bringing kids and teachers safely back to the classroom will take work, no doubt. Ingenuity, creativity, compassion, patience, and extra hands, even grief counselors, I imagine. But I believe that the same resolve that we, as rugged, proud New Yorkers, brought to flattening the curve can bring to solving this problem of opening the schools for our kids this fall. <laughs> schools around the world are opening up to allow kids the opportunity to learn. We should hold ourselves accountable to our children, safely, obviously, because we've suffered so much loss already and plan for the same outcome if we can. Trust is the bedrock of community. Responding to this pandemic with further isolation and relying on technology to teach our children sends the message that we are not resilient enough to face our fears and find a way to reconnect. Above all, I want to raise a resilient and community-minded person. For that, he needs to be at school with other children, not in front of a screen. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jennifer Rodriguez. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the City Council Committees. My name is Jennifer Rodriguez and I'm the Inclusive Education Specialist at the Collaborative for Inclusive Education within the New York City Charter School Center. Thanks for this opportunity to present today. The Charter Center and the Collaborative work to support charter schools to ensure they can effectively serve students inclusively and equitably. Over the past five years, charter schools have expanded their continuum of special education services, and enrollment of students with disabilities has grown by 35%, only a one percentage point difference between charter and district schools. With schools transitioning to remote learning, we here at the Charter Center have moved our programming from in-person to online and have emphasized the need to prioritize our most vulnerable students as schools move forward. Just recently, we had over 100 educators and leaders participate in a four-part online series on educational equity and were impressed with the commitment participants showed in reflecting on how their practices could cause othering of students and what they could do to change that. Throughout my tenure as a special educator for over a decade, as both a teacher and leader in both district and charter settings, I remain deeply committed to the idea that access is a right and not a privilege. Especially during this time of remote learning, we have emphasized the need for student-centered instruction and multiple entry points through universal design for learning, as well as trauma-informed practices that support student social emotional development. We have seen continued commitments from our member schools to engage in developing both mindsets and skill sets. While charter schools are autonomous in many aspects, the DOE is the LEA for special education in New York City charter schools. This means all decisions about the provision of special education services for charter school students are made by the DOE's Committee on Special Education. For years, we at the Charter Center have advocated for teletherapy and praised the DOE for its instruction of remote delivery of speech, PT, OT, and counseling during remote learning. However, we know that students are not receiving all their services to which they are entitled during school closures, and the need for compensatory services will be huge when we get back into school buildings. This is particularly true of charter school students who are mandated to receive support from a paraprofessional. While students with disabilities in district schools have been receiving supports from paraprofessionals throughout this time, charter school students have not at all, denying access of this service mandated on IEPs for our most vulnerable students. This disparity between students under the same LEA is clearly inequitable, and we advocate for the immediate institution of paraprofessional support for students with disabilities attending charter schools. Additionally, we would like to remind all that charter students are public school students, and we respectfully request that the same data that is available on district school special education services be made available to parents and the community about the provision of special education services for charter school students. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Rocky Bonanno. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody. Since schools closed in March, the DOE has failed in several aspects of addressing remote education, particularly grading and admissions policies. Led by Chancellor Carranza, who in my estimation has been a poor leader, the DOE continuously harps 
on what has changed and what has been exposed by the pandemic, rather than seek normalcy by reminding students, parents, and teachers that New York City public schools are still in session and always have been. Every proposal of the last two months paints all students with a broad brush that is supportive of those who lack resources or who are not dedicated to learning and harmful to those students who are continuing to do great work and advance their education in a meaningful manner during this global crisis. I'm disheartened by every pandering action from the DOE to help only the students it previously neglected before COVID-19 arrived. How that neglect is now further magnified and how students who are academically unprepared for the next grade are advanced without the necessary knowledge to succeed the following year. It is not a surprise in a city of 8 million people, we have financial and social divides that go far beyond the scope of what the DOE can accomplish. Yet they try and try, and we are here, we hear this at every meeting and we, and we always come back to the same issue. Actual education ultimately becomes a secondary issue. The DOE only needs to put the educational opportunity in front of the student. Then they can demand the parents to partner with them and get the learning done and let's stop making excuses. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Janine Kiley. Time starts now. Just bear with us one moment. Okay, so we will come back to you, Janine. We're trying to figure out why we can't unmute you. So we'll go to Patricia right now, and then we'll go back to Janine. Patricia? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Patricia Laria. I am a CB2 member and vice chair of schools and eds committee, BID and community and county committee member in the 66th AD. I'm speaking today as a district two public school parent who fully supports the elimination of the current admission screenings. COVID-19 has exposed the raw and ugly truth of what's been wrong with the NYC education system, which is discriminatory and unresponsive to two thirds of the students in the city school system. The groups being affected are students of color, immigrants, those from low income households, ELL, students with disabilities. These are the groups who are unable to engage in remote learning. Any admissions requirements imposed during this time will become and continue to be obstacles that prevent our kids from moving out of this bubble. The screening process has many issues that make it meaningless as a factor to assess and select children. There has been incomplete data, no consistent published rubrics, and it's caused undue stress and emotional harm to students and families navigating the system. 66 years after Brown versus Board of Ed, we are still struggling with the idea of separate but equal. DLA and mass assessments of many problems associated with them, such as unequal access to tutoring, inherent bias in standardized tests, and no constant scaling system for course grades across the district. I'm troubled to learn that a group of parents called PLACE is asking to maintain a system that clearly discriminates against Black and Latino students. It seems to me that the deck is already stacked against these students. These inequities have been fully revived by the epidemic, which has only exacerbated the divide. At a time when we should be working together to improve the outcomes for all students, it saddens me that there are some who would use this opportunity to pit one group against the other. Now is not the time to maintain the status quo to protect the rights of the privileged few. Now is the time to develop an education system that is fair and equitable to our entire student body. Please urge DOE to continue their efforts to develop a system that is inclusive and balanced. District 15 sets an example we should follow. If we want better for our children and keep equity at the forefront, we need to push for more culturally responsive teaching in the school and curriculum, equitable admissions process, and more relatable teachers and better, accommod and better accommodates our students. Please end the use of discriminatory, discriminatory screens. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go back to Janine. Time starts now. Um, good afternoon. My name is Janine Kiley and I chair the Schools and Education Committee for Manhattan CB2. This month, 242 parents and educators attended a joint Manhattan CB1 and 2 meeting on remote learning and they submitted 200 questions to our panel of six principals and senior DOE staff. With this feedback, we unanimously 
passed two resolutions with three broad recommendations. One, we urge the DOE to incorporate a hybrid model for fall 2020 that permits both remote and in-person learning and provides clear policy for more live or synchronous instruction in pre-recorded classes, more small group instruction and increased feedback between students and teachers. Training technology in time to increase uniformity of instruction within schools, within grades and across schools, guidelines for academic intervention and remediation and delivery of content beyond written material, best practices for teaching reading and writing that are science-based, systematic, explicit, and multi-sensory, in-school resources for social, emotional, and trauma support, resources to implement social distancing and other safety measures, and much, much bolder strat strategies to reduce the digital divide. So every student has access to a device and broadband, including laptops with keyboards for middle and high school students and partnering with the private sector to make this happen. Number two, we insist that the DOE communicate its fall plans or range of plans publicly as soon as possible and that each school communicate more frequently with parents and students, even if they simply say they don't know the answer. Parents appreciate this. Finally, we implore our city's leaders to aggressively seek additional funding for our public schools, not cut fair student funding, limit in-school budget cuts, and instead cut non-essential contracts and central DOE spending. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Traeger? I, th I thank the panel. Thank you very much for testimony. Thank you everybody from panel 13. We will now move to panel 14 on panel 14 will be Tamara Geyer, Arthur Samuels, Lisa Schwartzwald, and Naomi goldberg Haas. We'll start with Tamara. That time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak, um, both to the chair, Traeger, and to the committee. Um, I'm a fourth grade parent and the president of our parent association. I'm also a member of our SLT. And it's really because of these commitments to public education that I and so many other parents have felt the need to come to all of these forums and really let you guys know what's going on at home. So first of all, I wanna add my voice in support of the many eloquent testimonies on how this pandemic has exposed and exacerbated inequities in our education system. You know, the DOE has invested in a remote learning model which requires the series of assignments to meet the notion of standards and assessments. And this is how we wound up with a system with so much discussion of devices and connections and nearly no discussion of the human connections with teachers, with fellow classmates, with staff, and the relationships on which true education is predicated. So somewhere along the line, we've lost the focus of teaching our children to be critically imaginative learners. Um, and we've exchanged it for some kind of much emptier notion of grades and technology. And you know, my son wakes up every morning with a progressively resounding no, why are we doing this? So after 10 weeks of isolation have only borne mounting frustration and intransience and the deep emotional support through life, mostly on platitudes that I have to tell you don't hold much weight with a fourth grader whenever he hears one of the things that are recommended. You know, we're, on, we're in the middle of a crisis on a global scale. And I think it is unrealistic to think that our children aren't aware of it. And I don't understand why we aren't engaging them. This is a time where we could both revamp our educational system and impart really necessary skills that are necessary to every student, including mutual aid and mutual care, including collaboration, which is one of the number one 21st century job skills. And certainly, of course, um, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Arthur Samuels. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone's loved ones are healthy and safe in this difficult time. My name is Arthur Samuels. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Mesa Charter High School in Bushwick. We are a community-based school in our seventh year. Uh, we currently serve 480 students in grades 9 through 12. The challenges to our community boggle the mind. While we have loaned out over 160 laptops, many of our students still lack the technology or internet access necessary to regularly complete assignments. A large portion of our families either have lost income or are essential workers who risk their lives every day to continue to put food on the table. Most tragically, seven Mesa students or alumni have lost their parents to COVID. The scape of the devastation is hard to fathom. 
Based on our experience trying to navigate this challenge, I want to share what I believe we will need if we are going to continue educating our students. First, as much in-person instruction as we can safely provide. We know that everyone, parents, students, teachers, administrators are working as hard as they can to support the switch to remote instruction. But as many others have said, it is no substitute for being in the building. Even leaving aside for a moment the myriad technology and access issues, it is simply not like being in the classroom with your teacher and your peers. Our students are social creatures and they thrive on that interaction. Whatever success we've been able to have with online instruction this year only works because it's built on a foundation of relationships that were forged in person. This will not work at all if we go into the fall and needs to teach students online we've never laid physical eyes on. Second, in 2020, internet needs to be a basic utility. If we are going to have to move to remote instruction at some point in the 2021 school year, everyone needs to have access. It needs to be the same as electricity and running water. This is not a luxury. It's necessary for communication. Three, educators must know that no matter what is going on, we are still teaching. I'm inspired. The last thing I just want to say, I'll, I'll leave most of it, but the last thing I want to say is I know that the council is considering a resolution opposing the reissuance of the so-called zombie charters. Mesa is a community-based charter school that would be blocked from opening if the legislature were to follow the recommendations of that resolution. The structural inequalities that still exist in the city have been laid bare by the pandemic. While the neighborhood's hardest hit have been those home to lower income people of color, the most affluent New Yorkers have fled the city. At a time when our citizens who have the least have suffered the most, I ask the council and the legislature not to deny them further the right to choose the school that they consider for their children. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Lisa Schwartzwald. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is Liza Schwartzwald, actually, from the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The NYIC has worked with our partners to identify major inequities in the DOE's current approach and outline recommendations for immigrant families. Families with limited reading and digital literacy skills have faced the most severe disconnect from their schools and are disproportionately facing trauma, sickness, food insecurity, and financial hardships as a result of this crisis. Immigrant students without devices have suffered significant loss of instruction time. Families report a continued lack of troubleshooting tech support in their languages, as well as difficulty accessing mental health support at a time when the need is growing. Many immigrant families worry that their children won't be promoted or will fail to graduate. Um, to address these issues, we have four recommendations at the NYC. First, the City Council should demand that the DOE collect and make publicly available system-wide data on the impact of the pandemic for all student subgroups to effectively target supports to youth who have not been engaging during the pandemic. Second, the City Council should demand the DOE do an additional sample survey by phone of at least 500 New York City limited English proficient families and ELs by the end of the year. Targeting a small but significant number of LEP and L students through direct one-on-one -on -one calls would better identify the academic and basic needs of immigrants and Ls. Third, the City Council should support a three-year transfer school pilot to increase newly arrived high school-aged immigrants' access to programs that meet their needs to address the over 4,000 immigrant youth who were already out of school before um, the COVID crisis because of a lack of programs that met their needs. And finally, we ask that the council restore the $12 million for DYCD funded adult literacy services. A lack of digital literacy knowledge and access has meant some students of immigrant parents have lost weeks to months of valuable education time and support because their parents did not themselves have the access and knowledge to connect. And these gaps are only going to grow larger if the city does not for adult literacy funding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liza. Sorry about messing up your name. And next, we will go to Naomi Goldberg Haas. Time hey. starts now. Am I on? Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony in, in support of arts education, the education for the arts. My name is Naomi Goldberg Haas, and I'm founder and artistic director of Dances for a Variable Population in Harlem. The mission of Dances for a Variable Population is to bring strong creative movement to older adults and also families that support wellness and happiness and health. Dances for a Variable Population serves over 5,000 older adults and families throughout four boroughs of New York City with weekly classes and large scale performances. We are advocating for critical funding to be sustained for the arts and so that we and many other organizations who provide 
these programs for people of all ages is especially critical at this time. The older adults we serve are primarily alone and are highly vulnerable to COVID-19 and lack other outlets for physical health, for exercise and social connections similar to their school aged children. Even before this pandemic pushed aside into social isolation, loneliness was at epidemic levels, affecting 60 to 80% of the population. Recognizing that loneliness is associated with decreased lifespan and illness increased in terms of obesity and lack of physical exercise and air pollution, arts programs that mitigate this life-threatening condition are essential at this time. This spring, we moved very rapidly to provide ro ro remote programming. We offered over 350 seniors through a week, this through a week, through Zoom classes and on telephone classes that were widely popular for adults that don't have access, which goes also to children who don't have access over the internet. Our free access videos have had nearly 4,000 views. At this critical time, programs like ours are um, in maintaining the physical and mental health of New York City's most vulnerable populations. We rely on discretionary funding from the New York City Council through the Department of Aging and the Department of Cultural Affairs to sustain these programs. As, as we work in low-working communities, we can't afford to pay for them. The loss of the New York City funding would have a devastating effect on our communities we serve. Thank you. They promote this sense of safety and sense of possibility, which is so important. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes uh, panel 14. Thank you, everybody. We will now move to panel 15. On panel 15, we will have Christina Uccioli, Maya Fortuna, Tyler Rude, and Kashik Das. So we will start with Christina. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to give, uh, to thank you for today's um, opportunity to give testimony. My name is Christina Mutually and I am the Vice President of Education for AHRC NYC, the largest nonprofit in the United States that supports approximately 6,000 individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. AHRC NYC is also approved to operate schools citywide for students with disabilities commonly known as chapter 853 or 4410 programs by the New York State Education Department. Additionally, we are a New York City Department of Education vendor contracted to educate approximately 1000 students between the ages of three and 21. Our students are public school students. They reside in New York City and their parents are taxpayers and constituents. However, due to the nature, severity, behavioral, and challenging issues related to their disabilities, their needs cannot be met in a public school setting. Most of our students have a diagnosis of autism. As a consequence, the students are placed by the New York City DOE's Committee on Special Education in AHRC NYC schools. AHRC schools must follow all of the regulations as set forth by the New York State Education Department, as well as the requirements outlined in our contract with the New York City DOE. Our teachers, therefore, must hold the appropriate teaching, special education certifications, and follow all the regulations and requirements outlined in our New York City contract. We are required by commissioner's regulations to maintain mandated staff to student ratios and only certified teachers can fully implement a student's IEP. Due to an inability to provide compensatory packages like our public school counterparts, I'm inspired. FRC faces unprecedented vacancies in staffing. When we do successfully identify a prospective candidate, they are required to clear the New York City DOE's personnel eligibility tracking system, affectionately known as PETS. Simply stated, they are required to undergo a background check and must be fingerprinted before they can be hired. We applaud New York City DOE's policies to clear and check all candidates. Unfortunately, we find ourselves in a quagmire. Christina, can you wrap up? And But you could email the testimony so we have it in full in the record, but you could wrap up final thoughts. But okay. Thank you. We need to hire staff, and what we are basically asking is to open up the PETS office. It's currently closed because of pause. And because of that, we are unable to bring on 
highly qualified and credentialed people. And our children, just like public school students, and they are public school residents, deserve qualified and credentialed people. Thank you for the opportunity and your assistance in this manner. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Maya. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Maya Fortuna and I go to Pace High School. As a junior in high school, virtual learning hasn't been the, be hasn't been the best. I, I had trouble finishing my work in the morning as it takes me hours to complete an assignment because I live in a household with five other people, one being a one-year-old baby. This paired with effectively teaching myself made the semester all the more difficult. Applying to college next year, I am concerned that this semester will poorly reflect the kind of scholar I am. I am certain that this semester will not sh show that I did my best to teach myself even while helping to teach my sister, raise my nephew, and without much help from many teachers. Remote learning isn't as easy as people put it. It is effectively virtual learning when we have never had, we had never before had to do that. We were often struggling to do this in this, in environments not built to be formal schools. Virtual learning for me also did not involve much classroom learning. I am taking an AP biology class when, uh, when virtual learning began, I failed the test because I wasn't getting in the information that I was supposed to during class time. Failing that test has caused my grade to drop to a failing grade. I have never seen my grade before, my grade before, a grade like that in my report card. In order to get my grade back up, I had to work ahead, go be above and beyond and teach myself. With everything I did this semester, my, my grade still wasn't as high as it was before. What it, while it's easy to assume that I, my grades dropped because of my difficulty with the subject, the, the reality remains my grades dropped because I, a high school student, taught myself a subject I had not learned before. My teacher did not actually teach students, but AP biology teacher sent us, assign sent us slides and assignments for us to do on our own. We were ex then expected to turn in us th the assignments even though they did not actually teach the material needed to complete the assignments. We were also expected to take the AP exam, which I did last week. Time has this, combination of, this combination of things was unjust and an example of one of the major problems with virtual learning, teacher absence. Lastly, re remote learning takes a toll on our mental health because we are working in the same place that we would normally relax in. There is no such thing as me time while virtual learning. There is no such thing as a school space in my house. Yes, some schools provide counseling or like a day off so that students who are overwhelmed can try to rest or better navigate this. That, however, does not work. We still have to do work in order to get it in, in on time during the day off. We are struggling to navigate this. All that this has done to, to our families, our communities, our and our world. While my school has um, has Wellness Wednesdays, it took a pandemic for people to actually care about our mental health and the care does not go far enough. We deserve more and yet what we do now in school will still be used to determine our post our lives post-graduation, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for sharing your very powerful story as well. I really appreciate you and I wish you uh, everything the very best and we wanna be here to support you in every way we can and, and all, your, all of your peers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tyler. Time starts now. Thank you to the City Council for this opportunity. My name is Tyler Rood, and I'm a program director at the Coalition for Hispanic Family Services Arts and Literacy Program at PS7 in Elmhurst, Queens. Through our arts and literacy program, we have continued to provide our services during this pandemic. Some of these services include homework help, art therapy, and arts-based classes. In the past couple of months, our organization has conducted multiple wellness checks with the families we serve. And through these calls, we have provided step-by-step -step guidance on how to register for DOE remote learning devices, provided information on where families can get food to feed their children. And we have sat and listened to the worries and concerns our families are experiencing. While providing these wellness checks, we still continue to meet with our amazing students through synchronous learning on a daily basis. 
In a matter of two months, we created new lesson plans to best serve our students in a remote learning environment. We recently held a virtual art event that displayed works from all 10 sites we provide services. Students ranging from elementary to middle school showed their responses on being quarantined. This event mainly provided the students a safe outlet to express worries and struggles all while creating art. It was also a call to action to help save funding for summer programs such as our organization provides. Community-based organizations are the bridge between the Department of Education and the families we serve. And my request is to not make budget cuts to the Department of Youth and Community Development as this will compromise the relationships our organizations have built in the communities that we serve, ultimately affecting the social and emotional learning of the youth we serve. To the committee, Chair Traeger, and all who are present, I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat> and next we'll hear from, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing it right, Kashik Das. Time starts now. Uh, Koshik Das, thank you, Chair Traeger and all others. I'm Koshik Das, I'm the SLP co-chair of PS33 and the parent of a fourth grader. I'm also a member of PLACE, but I'm speaking largely on behalf of my school after consultation with my principal, vice principal, and PTA co-presidents. First, I'd like to thank all the teachers, staff, and principals who have rolled out remote learning within a week. They have gone above and beyond learning new technology and have shown tremendous flexibility. However, my praise for the DOE in this regard stops there, especially towards those at the highest administrative levels who like to pat themselves on the back for what a good job they have done, starting with the chancellor himself. The DOE chief academic officer said she values critical feedback from staff on remote learning and other issues. However, to date, there's been little to no communication with school principals and other school leaders, vice principals, PTA, and SLTs, certainly not in my school and certainly not what I'm hearing for others in my district. The deputy chancellor Austin pointed to the ECC, which I would remind is not a DOE entity, but is a private group that is well connected to the chancellor himself. It is not a substitute for more diverse views that the CECs offer, which have passed several resolutions that have all been ignored. The PTAs are habitually ignored, SLTs are ignored, and they're probably closer to curriculum issues, and they include principals and teachers. Principals have routinely been informed about key decisions, not consulted. They are often been informed by parents who happen to see or hear press releases first. This has started with a shift to remote learning and more recently the change in grading policy. This is particularly troubling to me because principals are, should be the DOE's eyes and ears. They're certainly their executors of their policy, whether they are well-intentioned or more typically misbegotten. School leaderships want more uh, in the remote learning policy. They want the one that support more live instruction, not less. Why is this not a mandate? We're aware that there are challenges, but if remote learning continues in some form into September and, and beyond, children will need some form of consistency and support. School leadership say small groups have worked, have worked particularly well, especially when they're grouped by similar ability levels. This points to more differentiated learning, not less. This is why parents clamor for both screening high performance, screened high performance schools, as well as schools that cater to special needs. Any remaining policies should reach kids in, in as many ways as possible. What they really want is a mandate, any mandate. Ted Le Leather earlier said there was a lack of a plan. I, I agree. How will policy support school leadership going forward? PTAs and SLTs are not even allowed to hold elections. Kids graduate and families move out to other parts of, move out of New York City. Yet PTAs are not allowed to vote in new, in new members, nor are SLTs, nor are PTAs allowed to even write checks. It is not surprising to me because in my opinion, this all stems from the chancellor, chancellor himself. Offset a petition of 100,000 parents asking for 100,000 epidemiologists instead. This leads to a delay, which leads to up, in, which are in part responsible for 72, 72 DOE deaths. What is crazy is he, he always points to policies that will be temporary under this COVID crisis. These policies will not be temporary for my fourth grade daughter, who is going to go middle school for the next three years. It is not temporary for a whole class of high schoolers who are going to school for the next four years. And if you may, I would like to also personally address, and this is my personal view, not that of my school, the comments on racism. We always hear about equity and equality. Well, my children are brown, very brown, half Hispanic, half Indian. We, they find, me and my family find neither equity nor excellence in the chancellor's programs or new policies he wants to enact. I, in fact, find his policies racially divisive. Thank you. That concludes testimony for this panel. 
we will now move to panel 16. On panel 16, we have Nicole Hamilton, Ashley Jones, Deborah Sue Lorenzen, and Gregory oh, yeah. And we will start with Nicole Hamilton. Can I go? Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and committee members. My name is Nicole Hamilton and I'm the Director of School-Based Programs and Partnerships for Girls for Gender Equity. For more than 11 years, I've run GGE's after-school programs and school day partnership programs for six Department of Education schools, and I continue to serve as a liaison between school educators and students. I'd like to say that this is more uh, than meets the eye. There is more to everything than we see right now than meets the eye. While physical structures remain intact, we may not see the fallout of the pandemic the way we would from a natural disaster. We cannot downplay the impact of what is happening and how it is affecting students. My colleague Ashley Sawyer testified earlier to the disparaging implications experienced by youth in New Orleans following the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. And I just wanna say that this is, uh, we're in the same, in the same boat. The young people that I work with have been thrust into roles that they may not have been otherwise. Caretakers, homeschoolers for younger siblings, nurses for sick parents and loved ones, administrators and teachers are wearing many hats as well, risking their own safety to travel on trains, to deliver hot spots to, that they've purchased with their own money so that young people can log on for class. Young people have been experiencing loss, hunger, poverty, loneliness, abuse in their homes, despair, and depression. And how can we ensure that uh, there is continuity of learning when there are conditions such as these? Uh, GGE has continued to hold youth programming online. Uh, we've moved all of our programs online and young people have had a safe space to share their experiences with us. And they are dealing with a lot, a lot of trauma and managing to go to school and handle all these responsibilities and log on for after school programming for some safe space at the same time. There are some instances where young people have what they need, where their principals have the capacity to check up on them. Some students have a quiet place to study, a fridge full of food, and other instances, many young people are sharing one device with several siblings, trying to work while sharing space with aunts and uncles and grandparents who are sick. All of these issues perpetuate inspired. equity. There are schools that are um, taking care of having administrations that take care of and really have robust PTAs and have culturally responsive curriculum and have guidance counselors and have all the things. And there are schools that do not. And young people are facing barriers uh, based on their school's pre-COVID standings and their readiness to respond to the pandemic and the demands of their home lives. And that is compound trauma. Finally, I'll just say that when we return to school, we should have a pause on academics and attend to the emotional and mental health needs of young people. And a young person said to, when asked what do they need, they said, we need therapy. Um, and every young person on that call and our, and our program agreed. And when asked why, they said that counselors are good, but they are already tapped and they don't have the capacity. And everybody that is coming back to school is gonna need something, something deeper than what we already have. No disrespect to counselors, but this is deeper. I don't need counseling, I need therapy. And that's the words from a young person themselves. And so now is not the time to cut any programs or any supports or anything that young people will, think will need. They are resilient and full of promise, but they will need us to support every single resource we have at our disposal into the effort of making them whole in the face of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ashley Jones. Time starts now. Thank you to Chair Traeger and the Education Committee for the opportunity to speak today regarding remote learning in CBO youth development programs and remote summer youth development. My name is Ashley Jones and I work for the Coalition of Hispanic Family Services Arts and Literacy Program as a program director at PS92Q in Corona, Queens. For over two decades, CHFS summer programs have served communities throughout Brooklyn and Queens by providing safe, structured, creative programming for over 2,500 youth, many of whom are among our city's most vulnerable. The Arts and Literacy Program was founded to build literacy through the arts during the school year and summer, and during the pandemic has helped children and families remain connected and develop crucial life and social emotional skills throughout the shelter in place order, through live virtual arts classes, tutoring, art therapy, counseling, cooking classes, and more. During any other normal school year, we are a much needed resource for families to acquire social services and have childcare. 
But since COVID-19 has hit our city, we have become a lifeline for so many students and families. We have created a successful and thriving remote after-school learning platform that is serving over 550 students weekly across our elementary and middle school programs, all through live instruction. It's a haven, a way for kids to be able to be in an uncertain time and world, we have given students familiar faces, time to interact with their school friends, consistent classrooms, even if they are small boxes on a lit screen, and avid advocators who have walked with them and their families to get internet, translation instructions for many missed days of assignments when a family was struggling to read the assignment or the ask whether they could read English or if maybe they could not read at all. We have helped families get food from food pantries, but we have been a bridge, but with funding cut from DYCD programs, we will not be able to be there. If we deprive families and students of this bridge, they will not walk into the school year ready to face a change system. They will be left behind and the attempt to regain that footing will prove for many to be insurmountable. Youth programming and development as we have all learned in a very fast crash course over the last two months comes in all shapes and sizes and can be molded to serve families and children and keep them safe and foster a comprehensive state of well-being. So on behalf of myself and CHFSS Youth Development Programs, I implore you to not cut that funding. The young people of our city are the future. They will become the change makers, the pillars of the community, the gears of our economy and the beacons of culture. And we must do all that we can to provide them with the needed services to continue to grow, learn and become. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Deborah Sue Lorenzen. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for your leadership and for valuing the role of community-based organizations in supporting remote learning. And thank you, Ashley, for that wonderful um, commentary. My name is Deborah Sue Lorenzen, and I'm the Director of Youth and Education at St. Nick's Alliance. As the largest youth services provider in North Brooklyn, St. Nick's Alliance has offered critical remote learning services to over 4,000 students ages 2 to 21 since March in Community School District 14 alone. These services are delivered through our extensive network of school partnerships, an early childhood center, after school centers, community centers, transfer schools, and community schools. Our children and families depend on St. Nick's Alliance as an integral part of remote learning, especially for struggling students. Through daily recorded and live lessons, we are shoring up their academic learning through literacy and homework help, keeping alive their creativity through visual arts and performing arts, cultivating their well-being through self-care workshops and cooking classes, reinforcing their emotional strength through mental health counseling and daily check-ins, looking to their futures through career development courses and these essential services are having a profound impact on our students and families, from improved engagement to sheer persistence. St. Nick's Alliance is very well prepared to continue remote learning during summer camp and SYP, yet both were excised as a re result of radical cuts to DYCD. Their elimination will severely compromise children and youth's ability to stay engaged in remote learning, whether part of or independent from DOE summer school. Further, St. Nick's Alliance will be forced to furlough more than 250 staff on July 1st, all of whom would have been supporting remote learning, in addition to our 2,500 SYP interns who would be helping remote learning and would be earning wages. I'm expired. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony. Thank you. And the first, last person on this panel, we'll hear from Gregory Brender. Gregory, are you on the line? I thought it's now. Okay. It looks like he's on, but uh, I don't think he's speaking. Okay, we can move to our next panel and then we will um, put him in uh, the next panel. So thank you everybody uh, who just testified. We will move to panel 17. We will start with Jabal Ahmed, Luis Fuentes, Clara Delgado, Anthony Campanera, and then we will also add Gregory Brender, uh, Brender back on at the conclusion of this. So we'll start with Jamal. Time starts now. 
Thank you for hosting this uh, hearing. My name is Jabal Ahmed and I work for Good Shepherd Services as a program director for Beacon MS45 in the Bronx. At our Beacon, we partner with over 750 community members in District 10, about 600 of those who are under 21. Beacon programs are school-based community centers serving children age six and older and adults. There are currently 91 Beacons located throughout the five bars of New York City, operating in after schools and evenings on weekends and during school holidays and vacation periods, including the summer. Good Shepherd operates two beacons, Beacon at MS45 in the Bronx and Beacon at PS15 in Brooklyn. When DOE shifted to remote learning in March, we at the Beacon shifted to remote programming and to support the whole schools in identifying ways to increase attendance of students in the Google Classrooms. We quickly coordinated a series of outreach efforts to contact families and identify students that will be need additional supports. We we'll provide support with school assignments, one-on-one -on -one supports, have placed close attention to needs of our immigrant families who have language barriers to complete assignments. In the Bronx, one of the, uh, one of the 160 students that are currently enrolled in Beacon, we have actively engaged 110 students to date. The Beacon staff have been regularly calling families to provide social and emotional support. Our ability to be, to be productive and responsible to the needs of our students, families come from the strong bonds and relationship we have with them and the community. There is relationship have been built over time. They trust us and they know we're here to support them. Beacon staff continue to connect families to local resources, including food access. In the Bronx, we have helped our whole schools increase the number of families to complete DOE's laptop survey and we distributed five laptops. Staff at the Beacon have created a series of videos and PowerPoint lesson plans on the topics of art, dance, and fitness. We have shared these in Google Classroom, which we updated weekly. We communicate this content to our participants by personalized phone calls our staff make to family regularly. Beacon staff are prepared to support youth over this summer, but with funding being cut, we fear our families will be alone. But these are the supports we provide daily. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Luis Fuentes. How are you doing? My name is Luis Fuentes and I'm the Senior Program Director at the Monterey Cornerstone Community Center in the Bronx. I have worked for Good Shepherd Services for 12 years and during that time I have been a group leader, team service coordinator and now a director. Good Shepherd Services runs two cornerstone programs, Monterey in the Bronx and the Mickey on Red Hook. Since March 25th, the Mickey has distributed over 2,000 mills and Monterey has distributed another 1,000. On most days, we have also been able to, to distribute additional items, including masks, bags of vegetables, art kits, hot meals, among other items. This has made it possible. This is only made possible by the partnership GSS has in the community. During this crisis, Monterey's paramount concern has been reaching out to over 200 families and getting them much needed resources. We conducted weekly check-ins and established a homework helpline for our families. Today, our 80 elementary participants in grades K through five call staff to get homework help. Since the crisis, all elementary participants have called in at least once for help for homework help and resources. When DOE operates remotely this summer and the mayor successfully eliminates summer programming, there will be a gap in supports for families. GSS wants to fill that gap. We routinely reach out to our 200 families and without supports this summer, they will be left without much needed resources. The chancellor understands the values that nonprofits have been providing to students during this time. The chancellor himself has said that kids need academic and social emotional supports. Please let us do that. Today we are providing that support, not only through our check-ins, but also through our Salsa Congress initiative. As an agency, we have begun producing dance videos for kids to practice at home. Our master dance director, Gary Adams, has led the initiative and provided activities that strengthen children's skills and have allowed us to support children's hobbies in a fun and safe way. These activities have also provided an out youth for youth and have experienced trauma and who have experienced trauma as a result of this pandemic. Salsa Congress allows kids to master complex skills and embrace their cultural heritage. These videos have been posted on our agency website and our YouTube. I'm Studies excited. have shown the importance of the arts on the youth development and our Salsa Congress follows in this vein. This initiative is just one example of what GSS is capable of providing. We hope to continue this initiative as well as others through the summer, but recognize that funding is not available. There's an old mantra that states it takes a village to raise a child. GSS is a member of that village. And if we are not funded, our children and families will suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Clara Delgado. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Mark Traeger and the members. 
My name is Clara Delgado and I'm the program director for Good Shepherd Services at Franklin K. Lane Young Adult Borough Center in Cypress Hill, Brooklyn. I've been with Good Shepherd Services for 15 years. I was an internship coordinator at the Lincoln YABC before becoming a YABC program director four years ago. YABCs are high school programs for young people ages 17 to 21 that support them to complete their graduation requirements while in their fifth to eighth year of high school. Good Shepherd Services runs 10 YABCs in Brooklyn and the Bronx, serving over 2,500 students each year. And I wanna tell you their stories. The first is, is 19 years old and lives with an older sister and her boyfriend since their mother moved out of state last year and the three equally contribute to maintain their household. When we transitioned to remote learning, it was difficult to get in contact with them and they would submit work outside of school hours. I later learned that they were juggling schoolwork with working a 12 to 16 hour shift at a local store. Because they were over 18, they're not subject to the labor protections of underage high school students. This student must choose between completing schoolwork and working to support the family and has selected work. Another is 20 years old. Before remote learning, this student made use of the Life Center for childcare while they attended classes. Now the student is home and the childcare facility is closed and the student is unable to get family to babysit. Because they are home caring for the child, they fall in behind on their remote learning assignments. For the two examples I have shared, I urge the council to consider that there are students in the DOE system that are pulled in multiple directions. On the one hand, employers and childcare providers assume that these young people are home and, and with free time on their hands. School assumes that they have no other responsibilities outside of their schoolwork, but this is wrong. Our kids are pulled in multiple directions. They are essential workers. They are parents, breadwinners, and they need more support. It is the reason the Learning to Work programs were created, to support youth to graduate high school. In the last two years, YABC and LTW programs have been hit Time with devastating fire. cuts and program closures, leaving us all stretched to meet the needs of these students. They have children, they're the breadwinners of their family. They have serious social emotional obstacles to graduation and we must support them to ensure the success. I think that the council needs to understand that more supports are needed for them and other students with nuanced circumstances and the current remote learning structure does, does not work. Thank you once again to council member Traeger and the committee for allowing me to share these young people's stories with you, here with you today. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Anthony Caponera. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, fellow members of the council. My name is Anthony Caponera. I'm a parent advocate for people with disabilities and an invited member to the Citywide Council for District 75's Committee on Outreach. I speak on my own behalf today. Uh, first, I wanna commend the tremendous efforts of the Department of Education for transforming our entire school system uh, over to, uh, to digital platform. It was a tremendous endeavor and um, they have to be congratulated on that. I submitted a document signed by clinicians calling for the resumption of hands-on therapy for students with disabilities. Therapists who are already considered essential workers and also are still operating seeing patients. In our District 75 population, the most vulnerable student population in New York City and all across the nation, we're hearing of significant regression in this population due to the ineffectiveness of remote therapies. Once verbal students are now nonverbal, some have stopped toileting, some have reverted to self-talk and self-stimulating behaviors. One parent reported their child having multiple seizures in one day, some are stimming, they have become incoherent and there's been severe aggression. One student uh, from New Jersey ripped the retina out of his eye and was hospitalized. The New York City Special Education Department and others, they are totally ignoring that remote therapy and learning is not working for this population and instead are painting a rosy picture of its successes. Now, while the U.S. Department of Education refused to issue IDEA waivers, expired. the school lobby continues to challenge this all across our country. Simultaneously, schools refused to issue RSA letters to parents so parents could can elect to resume these medically necessary services. 
This is a blatant conflict of interest and possibly a breach in school's fiduciary obligations under the law. And I'll just conclude that I ask this committee to diligently research this and also request our clinical panelists to give testimony on the subject, on this subject as time is of the essence and the schools have been put on notice regarding the potential irreversible effects of regression. So the Department of Education must issue RSA letters to parents that elect to use them for their disabled children. Equity, which has been stated a number of times, does not exist for these students. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will try to hear from Gregory Brender again. Hi, can you hear me? No. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for the flexibility. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the City Council Education Committee uh, for the opportunity to testify on remote learning. I'm here on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses, a policy and social change organization representing 43 neighborhood settlement houses that reach 70, 765,000 New Yorkers from all walks of life. Community-based organizations, including New York City settlement houses, have been carrying out remote learning activities in Beacon Community Centers, Cornerstone Community Centers, Compass and Sonic programs since COVID-19 began. But the FY2021 budget cuts these DUA City programs will make it impossible for these remote learning activities to continue in July and August. We urgently plead with the City Council for their support in ensuring the City maintains services for youth this summer. DOE does plan to conduct centralized remote learning activities in the summer through the public schools. However, this plan will not address the issues of social isolation and disengagement that youth development organizations often, um, that youth development is, is especially um, keen to address. Centralized programs do not have the hard earned community connections and credibility that CBO youth services providers offer. And without durable social bonds and connections to both their peers and caring adults, it will be even harder to maintain social distance. Community-based organizations are currently offering online tutoring, support, art and recreation programming, as well as behavioral health care and additional supports to youth and families through grab and grow meal provisions and grocery delivery for many households. On May 12th, the Campaign for Children and Campaign for Summer Jobs re released a summer recovery plan, which is detailed in my longer written testimony for school-aged youth. Recognizing that services in the summer would likely be a combination of remote learning programs and socially distant in-person programs for the families of essential workers, the Summer Recovery Plan contains plans for remote and socially distant in-person programs, as well as a plan for remote summer youth employment program. This plan was developed after eight weekly convenings over 100 youth services. Time's providers. expired. Thank you. Thank you, and this concludes this panel. Thank you everyone for your testimony. We will now move on to panel 18. Panel 18, will consist of Jillian Gaeta, Jim Manley, Chris Giordano, and Jason Cantor. And we will start with Jillian. Time will start now. Hi, my name is Jillian Gaeta and I am a teacher in um, East New York. I have served as a New York City public educator for the last 13 years. Um, and I think I'm one of the only teachers that has spoken today since 11 o'clock. Um, I want to thank you for this time and this opportunity to speak. Um, and I want to talk about how this is affecting my students in East New York and Canarsie. Um, as a history teacher, I have built my relationships with my students by dressing up as historical figures, taking them on field trips, engaging in debates, and none of that can happen through remote learning. Um, one of my students cried when he found out school was being canceled for the rest of the year because he was concerned about how he was going to make progress. Um, without his teachers present. So I call him every single day to talk to him about how he's doing, but it still is not enough. Um, one of my students, she does her work at five o'clock PM until nine o'clock because her mom is working and she is watching her four younger siblings and she is not able to share a laptop with, she has to share a laptop with her other sisters who are in middle school. Um, one of my students could, was stressed out because he couldn't stock up on groceries in advance because his family is on food stamps. And my students who took the AP exam, their connections were timed out with their essays because of the technology that they had at home, despite my charter school network giving out laptops to every school and every child that needed one. Um, one of my students was moved to a shelter the night before the AP US exam and she could not take the test and did not know how to access this. So literally my students in East New York and Canarsie are losing money and college credits because of this pandemic. 
we need to make sure that our students in these neighborhoods get the funding that they deserve and our teacher budgets are not cut. We are gonna be asked to do more with even less. This is not the case for students in other neighborhoods. I spoke to a mom who lived in Fort Greene. She sent her students, her children to live in their second home to be homeschooled by her Time's mother. Expired. My students do not have that opportunity. Our white families in this city live in a very different city than low income students of color. And we need to make sure that my students are protected, that all of our children have what they need during this pandemic and that our teachers who love them dearly can support them. Thank you, Jillian, for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can tell you're an educator. I appreciate <laughs> seeing I, I, that. I, I, I appreciate, Thank you. I appreciate you and your stories really hit home. And uh, I know you're fighting for your kids like hell. And uh, we, have, we have a lot of work to do to better support them. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jim Manley. Time will start now. We'll come back to Jim in a moment. Chris Giordano. Time will start now. Hi, I'm Chris Giordano. Hi, I'm Chris Giordano. I'm a PTA co-president at MS54 in Manhattan Valley and executive board member of the District 3 President's Council. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and our experience in District 3. The other city agencies have pandemic plans. The DOE had none. And here's how we learned that. The principal of MS-54 had the presence of mind to call an emergency SLT meeting for Friday, March 13th. We gathered for the meeting and were shocked to learn that DOE had provided no direction for the remote learning that we all knew was imminent. A committee at the school was assembled to develop a plan that would support learning when the schools would be closed, if such a plan would be allowed. Our school wrote and signed on to letters urging the closing of schools and members of our community, youth and adults, joined in solidarity with the UFT and President Mulgrew that the afternoon of the 15th, urging the mayor to do so. The announcement that NYC schools would be closed came later that evening. That the DOE had no emergency plan in place, even after 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy, and was unable to deliver remote learning direction in advance of an inevitable decision to close schools is deeply troubling. And when the mayor and DOE continually use the size of the system as an excuse Perhaps it's an indication that the city council needs to play a larger role advocating for our children and school communities. This last year, District 3 asked Chancellor for guidance on equity issues and received none. In light of that, the conversation would have included the inequitable allocation of resources that this pandemic has exacerbated. That the DOE is considering delivering universal admissions mandates is beyond ironic given our experience. District 3 has unique middle school and high school admissions issues. District 3 is one of the few districts with a middle school diversity initiative. That initiative relies on standardized test scores. District 3 has no zone or priority high schools and priority barriers in surrounding districts cause our students to disappoint rely on specialized high schools. Please confirm expired. provisions are being made for the DOE to administer the Shazat and please ask the DOE to give admissions guidance but confirm that individual schools and districts have the autonomy to establish their own criteria. One size does not fit all. Thank you so much. Uh, we will go back to Jim Manley and try one more time. Jim, are you there? I am, thank you. So sorry to- Time will start now. <laughs> appreciate the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Jim Manley uh, and I'm the superintendent uh, at KIPP NYC Schools. We currently educate and collaborate with uh, over 7,000 students uh, and their families throughout 15 schools in the neighborhoods of the South Bronx, Washington Heights, uh, and Crown Heights, uh, and Harlem. Um, I have been in this work for about 30 years, first as a Department of Education teacher, uh, and now um, as a superintendent at a charter school. Um, and as all of you know, uh, these times are unlike anything we've ever experienced. Um, we know that uh, the challenges ahead of us um, are going to be hard, um, perhaps harder than the ones we have traveled uh, since our buildings closed in March. Um, many of us know people who are sick. Many of our staff members have been sick. We have lost uh, team and family members. Uh, a few of our students have lost parents. 
um, it has been a very challenging time. Uh, and the divisions that separate our country into socioeconomic tiers are being exposed in a way that we all recognize um, what seems to be an even greater relief uh, during this time, uh, as evidenced by even recent events um, outside of our city uh, and within our city uh, that have broken down upon racial lines in the past few days, making this time even more challenging. Um, with respect to our own experience in remote learning, um, we have listened to our families uh, and tried to fill the gaps where we could. Um, we have um, sent out over 3,216 Chromebooks and Wi-Fi devices in order to let uh, our families uh, participate in online learning. We started a community pantry at our high school where families can come and grab a week's worth of food. Uh, when we saw that our families in Harlem needed greater access, our principal stepped in uh, and brought that food down to, to Harlem uh, and to Washington Heights. Um, we also are aware of the mental burden that many of our families have, have experienced. That we've stepped up our coaching, our social workers are providing reg Time's expired. Uh, regular support. Um, and so in all of that, I'd like to ask that we think about three things going forward uh, that the city council can help us with. Uh, one is that uh, we recognize that our schools uh, are an important and integral part of the community they work in. Uh, and that we continue to have support to find families the food and educational needs that, that have arisen during this time, uh, and that charters and DOE schools get that support to, to continue to provide for families. Uh, that we continue to connect online. If there is a way to provide more free access to Wi-Fi and to the internet, uh, it is key for our families, uh, even those who have been remiss on some of their payments to Optimum and other places. Uh, and then finally, uh, that when we come back in person, uh, we have the PPE and the resources we need to keep our kids safe and our teachers safe. And so we ask for all of those considerations as we do this work. We appreciate all that the City Council is doing during this difficult time. And please know that charter schools are with you in this effort uh, to combat all of the challenges we have seen. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Jason Cantor. Time is uh, right now. Hello there, and I just want to thank uh, the councilman as well. Uh, my name is Jason Cantor. I am an assistant principal at Rachel Carson High School. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting the councilman in December at our career night. He spoke there. It was great. It was great to have him there, and he's been a big advocate for us and our community. I appreciate that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, something that Joshua talked about when he started this meeting a couple of days ago. Um, he spoke about um, equity and fairness and being understood, and I want to connect that with the Regents Waiver Policy that the Department of Education and the state um, have come up with. What they're saying is that all of the students, uh, in order to receive that waiver, uh, need to complete all of the courses in their study. So for example, I work in a semester school, so they would have to complete Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, pass those classes um, to get the Algebra waiver. The problem is, is that there are plenty of schools, mostly throughout the state, that are annualized, which means that those students don't have the opportunity to fail in January. And uh, I know uh, Councilman Traeger and there are other people here that are educators have taught for many years, myself included, and have had students fail for a multitude of reasons in the first semester, but pass their second semester and of course pass the Regents exam. It happens all of the time. Um, and uh, Joshua uh, is at a Liberation, which is a trimester school, which means he has to pass three trimesters before he can qualify for a Regents waiver. So my question, and something that I would love to pose with people in the Department of Education, and I can't seem to get an answer is, how is it fair that two students could be failing in January and one student is not qualified to get a Regents waiver, but another school, who, another student who's in an annualized school still has that opportunity, five more months of an opportunity to get a pass and a Regents waiver. Uh, that seems to me the, the, the definition of unfair, um, unequitable, and it goes to Joshua's point. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter is singing Let It Go. I apologize. Um, but um, uh, I feel like this also uh, goes back to another point. You know, the city, most of the city are semester and trimester schools. And there are the majority of the Time annual expired. schools are in the state. And um, that divide um, needs to be addressed. So I thank you every, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilman, and all, the, and all the members here. I appreciate all that you do. And uh, that's it. Thank you. And I thank you, Jason. And uh, I did pose a question earlier to uh, Dr. Chen about that this region's exemption. So I'm going to follow up with her about this case here, Rachel Carson and, and, and others. Thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, from panel 18. We will now move on to panel 19. Panel 19 will consist of Madeline Borelli, Caitlin Delphin, 
Taj Sutton and Carolyn Eames. We will start with Madeline. Time will start now. Madeline, you're unmuted. Okay, we will come back to Madeline. We will switch to Caitlin Delphin. Time will start now. Okay, actually it looks like Madeline. Madeline. Oh, oh. Okay, Caitlin's unmuted. So Caitlin, why don't you go ahead and then we'll come back to Madeline. Okay. Hi, I'm Caitlin Delphin. I'm a teacher at Leaders High School in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Um, thank you for this opportunity. So I am um, a special education teacher and I just want to talk a little bit about what I've seen during this pandemic. We've seen that the role that schools play in our communities, providing food, technology and support for students and their family um, has grown. And we are sometimes now the only non-family connection for our students. We need to invest in supporting our students and their families through more teachers and counselors, and to do this by divesting from the NYPD. Online learning is not equally accessible to all students in the same way. Some of my students are caring for sick family members or have family members who have died. Some of my students are caring for younger siblings and can't focus on schoolwork. Many of my students have had um, to move to new houses or move in with other family members. Some are working to earn money for their families or support the family business. Some are still waiting for technology or have inadequate access to technology or the internet. And a lot of my students have disabilities that make it very difficult to access online learning. This pandemic and the resulting online learning has shown a shined a very bright light on the inequities that exist in the NYC DOE. This could be a wonderful opportunity for us to recalibrate our schools to better support our students and families but instead, it seems like we're per choosing to perpetuate the same inequitable systems that have always existed. We don't know for sure what schools will look like next year, but we do know that our students and their families are going through a range of traumatic experiences. We need to be able to provide the necessary support so that our students can focus on learning, including more counselors to provide emotional supports and more teachers to help students learn. We don't need more NYPD scanners or surveillance in our school to further criminalize students who need care and healing now. Um, these, our students are- it's expired. Okay. Um, so the schools in the areas of the city hit hardest by COVID-19 and its economic impacts are the same schools and communities who have been over-criminalized historically. We need to welcome our students back with open arms and targeted support when we return to schools rather than with more police and surveillance. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for your service and uh, for always speaking up for, for all of our kids. Thank you so much. Thank you for continuing to listen. Okay, now we'll go back to Madeline. Time okay. will start now. Hi, good evening, Chair Traeger and council members. My name is Madeline Borelli, and I'm a mother of two and a teacher at IS228 in Gravesend, Brooklyn. I'm also a member of Teachers Unite, which is an organization of public school teachers working to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. I chose a comment today in regards to the budget as it relates to COVID-19, because I cannot stand by and watch Mayor de Blasio's proposed cuts funnel more children into the prison industrial complex. We cannot provide the youth of the city the free and appropriate public education they are entitled to if we are stripped of our funds and subjected to violent policing and surveillance. If the city passes these plans, it will place a hiring freeze on teachers and social workers at a time when they are needed the most. Students will return to school carrying the grief and trauma of this pandemic only to be welcomed back by metal detectors and more cops instead of new teachers and counselors. To take $641 million from our schools next year alone is indefensible. Yet despite gutting the DOE, the NYPD remains virtually untouched. While the mm -hmm. NYPD represents 3.6% of the entire, I'm sorry, 6.3% of the entire city budget, they will only see 1.2% of the cuts. And in fact, the subcontract from the DOE budget to the NYPD is set to increase by $4 million, despite there being no funds to hire new teachers and social workers for the next five years. Many of our students are already exposed to constant harassment and violent policing in their communities. Recently, one of my seventh graders from Coney Island told me that throughout this outbreak, the police have continued to harass his neighborhood, only now they wear masks. 
What message is de Blasio sending to the youth and families of our city? Why should we place the city's financial crisis on the backs of our students? Let's let the NYPD share the burden. With the trauma and disruption of this pandemic, our schools now more than ever need to be fully funded. And it's time for the city to do the right thing, divest from policing, invest in healing, and fully fund New York City schools. Thank you, city council members, and thank Time's you, expired. Chair Traeger, for your time. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Tosh Sutton. Time will start now. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm Tosh Sutton. I'm a proud member of the Education Council Consortium, president of CEC 14, and founder of my own arts and advocacy org, Young People of Color Incorporated. In addition to that, I'm the mother of two public school students, Title I rep for my son's middle school, and the PTA delegate and arts committee chair at my daughter's school. Aside from those endeavors and the work I've done at the educational structural level for the past year, I have been both Black and woman my entire life. And what that means in the context of schooling is that I've often been painted as controversial when I ask a simple question, asked to be quiet when I wondered where I was in the lesson, assumed to be somehow out of control, but simultaneously inadequate when it came time to make decisions and make my voice heard. I see the same arguments being employed against students, educators, advocates, and parent leaders fighting for equity in the midst of a global pandemic that as many people have mentioned is exacerbating the inequity that already existed. And that is how I know that these arguments are rooted in racism. What I didn't mention earlier is that I'm also a graduate of Brooklyn Technical High School. I've been tracked for honors classes since the third grade. My 12 year old is currently on the honor roll and my seven year old toward a 92% on the gifted and talented test with no prep. But you know what I did? Nothing. I didn't go searching for rigor at the expense of my child's culture, mental health or childhood. I allowed her to stay with her friends at a wonderful public school currently working its way off the CSI list. Why? Because our political choices reflect our personal values. And the position that we need to keep politics out of our educational system is exactly why it is in the state of disarray it currently exists in. When we choose to ignore the historical context of black and brown students living in the most segregated school system, when we choose to ignore the historical context of our immigrant communities and wonder why we have issues with translation and interpretation, when we choose to ignore our disabled students and the intersections that we live at, because many of our students of color also have IEPs, when we choose to allow a select group of schools to have all the resources that all New York City students are entitled to and have our children feel like it's okay and help all for a spot, then what are we really teaching New York City's children to value? When we hook up metal detectors and ensure policing over tutoring and resources and socio-emotional support, what is the message that we are sending? I am asking our city council, our mayor, our governor, and everyone in a position to do better, to do better. And the first step we can take with that is divesting in our policing, which we are seeing as being carried out violently and inequitably and invest in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Carolyn. Time will start now. Thank you, Chair Traeger, for facilitating this meeting. I wanna thank you personally for your advocacy for our public schools. I have seen your investment firsthand since I teach in your city council district. My name is Carolyn Eanes. I'm an English teacher at Rachel Carson High School in Coney Island, Brooklyn. I'm also a member of Teachers Unite, an organization of New York City public school educators working to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. Today, I wanna to speak specifically about the budget cuts the city is proposing for the upcoming school year. Teaching through the pandemic has laid bare the impact of trauma on our young people and communities. Even before this, our schools were under-resourced. Too many of our schools did not have full-time social workers or nurses on staff, even before the pandemic, even before the catastrophic proposed budget cuts. As we come out of this pandemic, our school communities will need even more support, financially, emotionally, instructionally. As our schools move toward reopening, we will need more social workers, more trauma counselors, more support for youth, families, and educators who have been traumatized by this pandemic. This brings me back to what we heard at the beginning of this meeting in the student produced video by Joshua of Liberation High School. We are not robots. Our students don't want robotic online instruction that prioritizes efficiency over humanity. To heal from the trauma of COVID-19, our school communities need a greater investment in the people who can humanize learning. Social workers, trauma counselors, restorative justice practitioners are not extras in our school. They are integral to the health and well being of our communities. As an educator, I'm seeing firsthand the people who will be harmed by the budget cuts proposed by the mayor. 
It is unconscionable that our mayor can propose such significant cuts to our educational system while leaving the NYPD and school security apparatus intact. We need fully funded schools now more than ever. Thank you for your time. That is all for this panel, Chair Traeger. Just wanted to thank the educators for their service because I know they're speaking uh, really on behalf of their kids in their classrooms and they're at the front lines of this. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you everyone from panel 19. Uh, we have two panels left, panel 20 and panel 21. On panel 20, we will have Paolo martinez Boom, Tom Shepard, and Ellie Barron. Uh, and we will start with Paolo. Tom, we'll start now. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Martinez Boone and represented the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest Disability Justice Program. We have been providing free legal services for families of students with disabilities for more than 40 years. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I, I want to focus um, in what the, what the school closures were necessary due to the pandemic. An emergency remote learning plan was put in place. This plan absolutely is affecting students with disabilities, particularly students in low income communities that classify as an emotional disturb. Uh, these students who are classified emotional disturb uh, need a lot of us daily supports from staff in order to make it through the day. Um, it's, these students classified with uh, emotional dis dis as emotional disturb are, are likely, likely to spend a lot of time uh, receiving supports from staff, therefore remote learning have presented a great challenge and disproportionately impacted their education. These students are already facing many barriers uh, to get a quality education. Uh, some of the issues that we have heard from our families are that number one, the failure of the New York City Department of Education to provide with a consistent uh, remote learning experience. Uh, some of the students are receiving paper packets, others are receiving tablets, others are using their family's telephone, others are, are uh, using all computers. Some uh, families are using uh, Zoom, other Google uh, Meets, Microsoft Team, making it extremely difficult for these families to make it through the day. I just want to focus that uh, these students are having extremely difficult time to concentrate. Therefore, uh, accommodations are not in place. They, thank you. They need redirection and often uh, are not provided with that during the remote learning. And this is leading at the student disengagement and loss, loss of interest. In, oh my God. Instru institutional um, time. I have submitted my um, testimony in writing and I hope uh, that you read it and consider also some of the things that we have recommended such as uh, uh, providing more support for these students. Also families are having a great deal of issues with evaluation. So students who are at this time receiving inappropriate programs and services will continue receiving inappropriate programs and services in the fall, which it will put this student for them behind. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for your service, thank you. Thank you, and next we will hear from Tom Shepard. Tom, we'll start now. Hi, how are you? Um, I, I wanna say thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, it's been kind of taxing listening to 80 people um, so everything I had sort of written down, I kind of threw out the window, um, but, you know, and just been taking notes all day, but there's a couple things that I really wanted to touch on. Um, uh, the first is I, I believe in taking things back and putting them in context, right? So the first thing I would ask everybody to consider in all of this is how do you expect children who are hungry, scared, and tired, uh, to master uh, anything, right? Especially uh, ac uh, academics. Um, I know myself personally, if I'm awake for 18 to 24 hours, uh, you know, I, I'm no good to anyone. So I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I do feel that this has all been 
uh, not this hearing, but uh, remote learning in general, uh, a big exercise in, in technical difficulty. Um, when we consider that there are almost 20,000 devices, it's the, I think the number is 19,000 that haven't been uh, received yet. And then you consider that the entire population of District 1 um, that the DOE has spoken about is 10,000, uh, then the number of kids who need these iPads the most uh, actually doubles that of the entire school district of District 1. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, then if you consider that if we, we go from Zoom to Google Hangouts to WebEx to Microsoft Teams back to Zoom, so you have parents uh, trying to figure it out with students trying to figure it out and teachers trying to figure it out and then like rinse repeat. Um, you know, this is all just um, a recipe for disaster. Um, so, okay, I will just wrap this up very quickly and just say that uh, uh, any decisions that the city council makes, um, I would hope that uh, we just take into consideration that we're talking about real people in real circumstances. And uh, this is not strictly just an academic exercise. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Ellie Barron. Time will start now. Hi, um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify. My name is Ellie and I'm a student at Bard High School Early College Queens and I'm in 11th grade. Um, I'm very concerned about the effects of remote learning on students. Many students through no fault of their own have not been able to fully participate in remote learning. In the next school year, we need to invest more money into students, especially the most vulnerable students, to ensure that they are supported in this hard time and are academically caught up from the period of remote learning. However, the mayor's proposed executive budget does the opposite of this. A hundred million dollars have been cut from fair student funding and a hiring tease on freeze on teaching staff has been implemented. Cuts to education will be 2,800% greater than cuts to policing, and we must prioritize educating students over policing them. Teachers have had a profound impact on my learning as a student. Many of my teachers know me not just as a student in the classroom, but also as a person outside of school. If teachers had more students, I know that my relationships with them would be a lot less meaningful. These relationships are critical, especially for students who might not have a stable home life or an adult to talk to, especially in the time of COVID. Teachers are needed more than ever to support students. I'd like to thank the Education Committee for all the work that you have done to push for equitable funding for students um, and to push back against these budget cuts. Chair Traeger, um, I'd especially like to thank you for the advocacy that you're doing, and I'm very grateful um, for you fighting for students like me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and that concludes this panel. Next, we are going to hear from Sheba Simpson, Paulette Ha, and Rosalia Borja, and we will start with Sheba. Time will start now. Sheba, actually, if you can stop one second, you haven't been unmuted yet, sorry. Okay, go ahead and try again. Good afternoon. Go ahead. Time My name now. is... <laughs> My name is Sheba Simpson. I'm a special education teacher, currently teaching remotely and supervising a regional enrichment center in the afternoons. I am also the parent of a middle school student with a disability. This is my son's remote learning plan that, that I created after witnessing my son have a meltdown from being overwhelmed Whelmed, trying to navigate Google Classrooms for the first time without prior instructions. I had to advocate for my son in behalf of all the students in New York City who have disabilities to find a way that best supports his unique learning style. Thankfully, his teachers worked with me as I created the schedule, which includes whole group, small group, and one-on-one -on -one instructional time. I realize that my son's situation is unique, but it shouldn't be. Many families are struggling to provide their children with assistance in completing enormous amount of work 
that their children are being required to complete, especially in households with different age groups and abilities. Most children need human to human instruction to learn. That does not easily happen over a computer or via telephone. I am asking as the conversations about reimagining schools happen, that the unique and special needs of students with disabilities be at the center of the conversations. One possible solution could be creating schedules for groups of special needs students and general ed students with similar learning styles and needs in small group instruction via online instruction and to disrupt the impact of COVID-19 on our city schools and our students with disabilities. Time's expired. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Paulette. Time will start now. Paulette, just hold off one moment, please. Can you just... Okay, go ahead and uh, start again, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, greetings, esteemed council members. My name is Paulette Hahili, and I am a member of the Citywide Council for Special Education. I thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns as a parent and as a member of the special education community. We just heard testimony from my fellow panelists on the effects this has had on her son and the students of District 75 are regressing in an exponential rate in this remote learning environment. Teletherapy has been inconsistent and parents are forced to implement therapy they do not have training for, nor do they have the tools or access to the equipment that would normally be available in these therapy sessions at school or have the expertise to know whether the sessions are even being executed properly. Our children are exhibiting behavior issues such as tantrums, self-harm, seizures, and loss of speech, not to mention the emotional toll the isolation itself has taken during the quarantine. Our students with developmental delays need hands-on face-to-face -face therapy, which has been impossible to execute during the pandemic. And because of that shortfall, our students' progress has been arrested and the backward slide will continue well into the new school year, making the transition back to brick and mortar a more tumultuous task than for their general education counterparts. We are failing our children now in remote learning in, in this remote learning environment and will continue to fail our children it is not an option. Our special education students make up one fifth of the total number of students enrolled in our school systems, yet are almost always an afterthought when it comes to policy decisions that affect our city's children. I urge the council to continue supporting our fight for our city's forgotten children. Lastly, I wanna thank council member Justin Brandon for recognizing the needs of his district and creating a joint committee on special education to find solutions to the deficiencies our families have been forced to endure. I urge the education committee to please reach out to their constituents within their residing districts and allow parents raising children with special needs a seat at the table. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you for this opportunity. Be well and stay safe. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Rosalia. Time will start now. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Rosalia. I'm a hardworking single mother and after school in summer, program have helped me a lot. My son is 11 years old and my daughter is nine. And both of them are in our in literacy after school program at PS 123 in Brooklyn. The after school program is very good for them because it's not only helps them with their homework, but also teaches them other things like art and dance. Since they work very hard during the school day, the art activities helps them to release their stress and do something different that they won't in, they wouldn't get the chance to do otherwise. In my opinion, I really like the summer program because it gives them the opportunity to continue to learn and socialize with other people. Also, since um, I have to work, this gives me the peace of mind that my children are somewhere safe. They love they loved the different activities, especially the trips that they go on. I understand the COVID-19 is not good to go outside and have the same kind of program, but even if it's virtually, it will help, it will keep them busy and not to be bored all day instead of playing video games. They will socialize and have communication with other people during the virtual um, activities. The after school program that my children are in is based on the arts and it helps them forget about school and have fun. They have strong relationship with staff and other students in the program. They they not just think of the after school and summer staff as their teachers, but also as their friends. 
and they, all, they will love to be able to continue with the program during the summer. Thank you for listening to my experience and I hope the city council strongly consider restoring the funding for summer activity. Thank you, for, stay safe. Thank you. Um, if we inadvertently have missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, Chair Traeger, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I, I just wanna close by first of all, acknowledging the incredible work of the Education Committee staff, uh, Malcolm, Jan, Kalima, uh, uh, Chelsea, uh, I mean, the entire council staff, my staff, my chief of staff, Anna Scape, Vanessa, uh, they have all worked incredibly hard. Um, I wanna thank everyone that, that uh, testified today and uh, please make sure that uh, if you do not testify, if you could still email uh, my office, council, your testimony. And I'll just, conclude by going back to Joshua's story uh, at the start. Um, you know, the, the technical glitch in get, hearing his sound speaks to some of the challenges we're facing with remote uh, learning. But his, his words about uh, not being a robot, uh, children are human beings. And even in an era of physical distancing, we need to find ways to deepen connections to our children, particularly our most vulnerable, to better uh, meet their needs. And I said this before and I'll say this again. Uh, I am deeply worried about those children that were shortchanged before the pandemic and have fallen greatly behind during this pandemic and helping them catch up and helping to stabilize their social, emotional, academic, uh, situation. And I also, you know, give enormous kudos to those at school communities that had a seamless transition. And we need to make sure that we do have nuanced approaches to uh, continue enrichment opportunities. Uh, but I just want to be mindful that we don't even know how many kids have not logged on once. We don't even know how many kids have not had a wellness call or check-in call. Um, there are kids who wanna learn, there are kids who wanna do right, but there are kids facing enormous challenges right now at home, fighting battles that we know nothing about. And I just wanna tell them that I see you, I hear you, we will not stop fighting for you uh, just because you haven't logged on once or someone hasn't called you or made a connection. And the budget ahead for our school system will determine if the pain, trauma, and loss that they have faced in their schools will be temporary or generational. And so we have a lot of work to do to truly meet the needs of, of, of all of our kids. And I thank everyone and my colleagues for their work, their offices. I see Councilmember Holden, who has been throughout the entire hearing. I thank, I thank you as well to my all my colleagues for their great work and service and to all the parents and family members and students, te teachers, we truly appreciate you and uh, the sergeant and the entire council staff. And with that, I will adjourn and conclude this hearing. Thank you.